uh, first start with uh, pediatrician prayer dr gobal subramaniam iap tns is a uh, treasurer i welcome gobal uh, ellarkum vanakkam kulandai maruthunin irangidal engalukku mulumiyana kunamalikkum thirnai tharum noyirin thunbam theerkum thiran namakku valangapatta eppadi patta sirapporime endrai panivudan nam unaruvamaga ella kulandigalukkum avargal kudumbathinarukkum avargalin samudaya nilaypadi mattum saadhi mudai sirulai paaramal nalam katral eege anbu ammaidi aagivetra doodurulaga endru mirupomaga நம்மால் முடிந்தவற்றை மாற்றவும் நல்லவற்றை உள்வாங்கவும் மாற்ற முடியாதவற்றை காரணத்துடன் போதுமான வையறிவும் புரிதலும் எங்களுக்கு வழங்குக உங்களது வாழ்த்துக்களையும் அருளையும் கருணையும் எல்லா தொழில்களும் நேரங்களிலும் அனைத்து மக்களிடையே கொடுத்து அருளுங்கள் நன்றி தேங்க்யூ கோபால் நெக்ஸ்ட் வெல்கம் அட்ரஸ் பை மீ ஐ ரெஸ்பெக்டட் டாக்டர் மேஜர் கே நாகராஜி சார் வைஸ் பிரசிடண்ட் சவுத் ஜோன் ஐ வெல்கம் சார் and i welcome our uh, beloved uh, president uh, mohammed uh, ismail uh, iap tnc i welcome dr ismail sir yes sir i welcome our uh, president 2020 dr arun sendil sir i welcome sir and i welcome uh, our uh, gopal subramaniam treasurer and i welcome that uh, convener of management of pediatric emergency model 1 dr sasidharan kandasami i welcome dr sasidharan i welcome dr mullai balaji is uh, uh, another convener i welcome all the faculties uh, i welcome dr tangabel sir he is always uh, ever hindu and uh, he is uh, one of the important person to preparing this module i uh, uh, congratulate and welcome dr tangabel sir and i welcome muttaya periya karupan i welcome dr kalaimaran sadasibam and i welcome srinivasan uh, subramaniam i welcome uh, dr reshma i welcome dr kartik narayanan uh, dr ramesh kumar r dr vasant kumar dr vijay williams dr narayanan dr kumaravel and our uh, uh, emergency uh, uh, person dr indumathi sandhanam <laughs> and on behalf of iap tnc i welcome all the uh, faculties and who are helped to organize this uh, wonderful uh, module we are actually uh, planning to take to this on uh, uh, national level i wish that uh, this uh, program could get success and will take to national level i will on second welcome one and all next i welcome our uh, president dr ismail uh, to deliver a presidential address vice president major dr nagarajju sir state office bearers past president dr sendel conveners mulle balaji and kandaswami faculty and our academic advisor dr tangavel sir and of course all the members delegates on behalf of iap tnsc as the president i welcome you all and a good afternoon to you this is the second cma of this year first we had one for an adolescent and second this is for pediatric <coughs> emergencies and went through the topics it's really good and it is going to serve the purpose and i wish all the success for this program as rajendran said we need to formulate into a module and it it should be taken to the national level with this few words i don't want to stand between you and the program i wish all the success thank you thanks for the opportunity now i request uh, dr arun sethil sir uh, present 2020 to fill state few words agar mudala eluthellam aadi bhagavan mudatri ulagu anaivarkum iniya maale vanakkam respected vice president south zone uh, dr major nagaraju uh, the state president my dear friend dr ismail secretary dr rajendran treasurer dr gopal subramaniam and the convener of this program dr i mean sasidharan kandasamy so and all all the senior pediatricians uh, who are senior pe- faculty dr tangavel sir i mean uh, dr indumadi santanam and it's a uh, nice to see a mixed blend of uh, the youngsters blending with the 
experienced senior faculty and uh, my respects to dr sinivasan also who has come always with us and all the delegates and all the faculty who are going to uh, enlighten us today on pediatric emergencies this module i think uh, the first module let us begin with a january and this year with a good module i hope it will uh, give definitely benefit to all the practicing pediatricians thank you so much thank you sir next i invite uh, dr major nagraj sir uh, vice president also to give a inaugural speech uh, thank you rajendran i'm thankful to you for inviting me to inaugurate this cmu i think uh, uh, first of all i must thank the iap tnc taken two uh, cmes within a month time we have said as soon as it's taken over is mine has done wonderful job by two very good modules i can tell you that is a adolescent i was there and now pediatric module i gone through that thing excellent module i think dr ismail iap president and dr aram sindil uh, past president of iap tnc rajendra secretary gopal srinivasan and tirumurgan uh, joint secretary and dr srinivasan sir senior most professor everybody respects the tangavelu sir and he is the senior coordinator he is the uh, one of the felicitator or whatever the module is very prepared and the conveners of this module sisidharan kandaswami mullai balaji and other people who are involved in that it is a very good module i saw that thing i think it is cm who wants to convert into good module and if you able to prepare it in a good module i will take up this issue to the central iap just like the uh, module what prepared during the time of uh, dr uh, sunil time we did it that has become very famous now smart clinics like this this also we can take up to the central level and we can able to ask the central iap to take up this all over india also that's why it is maybe useful for all of us and i saw them uh, topics are very good faculty is very good i know faculty is are very definitely good mrithi and dr tanvir are very very excellent speakers i know them and with this few words i think this i inaugurate this cm and this cm may be very useful for most of the practitioners and they learn something that happy learning for all of you jai hind jai thank you thank you a request from me sir i think you should take up this as a, to form a module uh, yes, this yes. Definitely. We are requesting you straight away. You, I, I will put up this thing immediately now itself. You do me, send me the uh, uh, one small email, email to me. Same thing, I will recommend it and send to the central agency. Thank you. Over to Rajendra. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nagraj, sir. I think it's a very encouraging for our young team and uh, Kanda Swami, Dr. Mulai and uh, team. They will definitely they are uh, doing very well, and uh, we are expecting also from you. Thank you, sir. Next. Um, uh, Five and a half hours start with uh, uh, 4 p.m. to that's 9:30. That uh, Dr. Sasidharan and Dr. Mulai as a convener they will handle this uh, uh, CME. Now it is uh, over to Dr. Uh, Sasidharan uh, to deliver few words. Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, actually a greatest opportunity, and it's kind of a dream come true scenario for uh, TNSC as well uh, the pediatric critical care team of Tamil Nadu, and we are all extremely happy about this program because of two reasons. Because uh, uh, reason number one is this is a program which has been conceived keeping in mind what is very important in emergency practices for an office practitioner as well the postgraduate student. as well to the private practitioner who have some amount of inpatient practice so keeping this in mind um, with the help of uh, dr tangavelu sir and dr rajendran sir we have conceived the cme and uh, as dr rajendran has already told we have an idea of converting it to a module and propose it further to central iap so with this few words um uh, i i am going to tell about the program for today, for today. this is next to 5 and hour, half hours we are going to have nine lectures as well one panel discussion the panel discussion is going to be of 1 hour 
and the, initially we will start with lectures the lectures each lecture will be delivered for 25 minutes followed by 5 minutes of q and a session so saying saying this i simultaneously say to the listeners request the listeners post their questions in the chat box which can be taken in that 5 minutes time period at the same time i request the speakers to stick on to the given time of 25 minutes this is for most of the lectures and there are two lectures which are confined to 15 minutes and 5 minutes of uh, question and answer session the panel is a quite interesting very well framed panel is going to be conducted by dr tangavelu sir and that is going to be for 1 hour and uh, i i can assure you that this is going to be an academic feast uh, for uh, the practitioners as well post graduates and it will be meaningful for everyone with this few words um i request dr tangavelu sir to initiate the program and introduce our first speaker who is uh, pride for pediatric emergency medicine dr indumathi santana over to dr tangavelu sir good afternoon everyone i thank the uh, iap tmc for the opportunity to given in fact uh, working with the youngsters this is completely organics and executed by the young team we have learned a lot working with them so thanks for the opportunity i'll just introduce uh, the next speaker dr indamadi sandanam she almost symbolizes the great uh, specialty pediatric emergency medicine it's a new specialty created and nurtured by her for the last 3 uh, decades i feel very happy to be and proud to be associated with her only a strong willed person like her can achieve this yet kind and compassionate with sick kids and their poor mothers many a time clothes will be brought from her home to the kids with the soiled dresses and food to the pgs pediatric emergency department was started way back in 1997 first of its kind in institute of child health Uh, almost i think in south india it's the first of its kind even before the private sector thought about the pediatric emergency department another important achievement of her is the period uh, creating pediatric prem unit prem units in all district headquarters hospitals 25 district headquarters hospital pediatric resuscitation emergency unit has been started along with uh, professor v vijay kumar it is a very 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 good move that every district headquarters there are four beds with ventilators oh, and emergency yeah. resuscitation units when you were working in headquarters hospital i have seen children dying of pneumonia empyema and kerosene ingestion all this have been alleviated because of the established prem units these are the two important achievements of dr indumadi sandhanam mm-hmm. apart from that she has presented many papers in both national and international forums she has contributed in various books in pg textbook of pediatrics and textbook of pediatric emergencies text to the american academy of pediatrics very important books book which I, which she has edited as a pediatric emergency medicine course book which is almost a bible for most of the youngsters and the students from ich practicing in the rural areas over to dr indamadi uh, thank you uh, sir dr tangavelu uh, before i start i'd like to thank again uh, he's my mentor and guide thanks so much for inviting me to this prestigious uh, cme i also thank dr mullay and dr sasidharan for organizing this and uh, i uh, thank dr nagaraj and his entire team in the tamil nadu state iap chapter for i think a very important topic to be added to this uh, uh, particular discussion so my talk is setting up uh, the emergency room emergency readiness in office practice the not difficult part i'm uh, talking from the experience of setting up not from the institute of child health but it, uh, at smaller hospitals in the district levels so let me discuss it uh, uh, in terms of what was not difficult and what was difficult the not difficult part was the infrastructure the equipment the consumables and the drugs now the location is most important here is a private clinic uh, this picture was shared by dr uh, balaji from dharmapuri you can see his uh, emergency room is at the entrance of the office sorry sorry uh, uh, sorry for interfering can you project your slide share can the screen share the screen ma'am share the screen i have not shared it okay sorry sorry yeah. one second one second
share the screen. Can you see it now? Yes, iPhone. Can you see it now, sir? No, no. Yes or no? No, no. No, no not yet. How little is it? One second, sir. Sorry. My good morning. I did this part. One second. One second. One second. Go to Zoom. Zoom. Go down. Go down. Go down. Go down. Yeah, go to start share screen. Uh, then put screen here, left top. I don't want to. Uh, uh, you can press the PowerPoint. Yeah. yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah. yeah. Now appearing. Yes. Yeah, it is visible. Yeah. yeah. You can see uh, it now? What is it? That is well visible, ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. And your face oh, is just uh, half visible. Can you just adjust that as well? Your My laptop uh, screen. Can you see me? Yes, it's both. Yes, Madam, uh, proceed. Yeah, we are yes, so, so here is the location of uh, Dr. Balaji from Dharmapuri. He's established a private clinic and he has given a role model on how to set it. You can see the entrance uh, of the nursing home with the uh, uh, emergency room on uh, right next to his consultation uh, room. And you can see the access from his consulting room is also nearby. So the best part of the, the best place to set up an emergency room is right next to your outpatient department or right where you're consulting. That, that is the best location. Now the resuscitation trolley should be set perpendicular to the wall, giving you access all around the, uh, the uh, resuscitation uh, 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 court. The procedures, the airway management can be performed <coughs> only in such a facility. You cannot use uh, uh, courts or uh, uh, low-lying uh, structures. The airway stool is positioned at the head end of the resuscitation trolley. You can see that's the way we have done it. Anybody is more comfortable for the airway maneuvers, the suctioning, etc. if you're seated at the airway end. A chair should be placed. It's, it seems a very small uh, oxymoron, but a chair is where the mother sits. 90% of resuscitation can be performed in the mother's arms. And if the child worsens, you can shift the child quickly to the uh, cot and vice versa. So always uh, make sure that the mother is close to the uh, resuscitation trolley. Now, majority of resuscitation equipment are electricity dependent. And you can see that the bank of uh, plug points at the head end, number of uh, instruments will, will be need to be uh, uh, plugged into this. And you have to get your, uh, this should be positioned about three feet above the ground for uninterrupted operation. Now, this is the layout. The resuscitation trolley, behind it are the plug points and the oxygen and suction and the uh, airway stool. The patients, uh, in case they have any, uh, uh, their uh, records and the point for documentation. Alongside should be the uh, refrigerator, the crash cart and the uh, trolley where you can shift your things around. Uh, this was the layout given for the frame units for their individual resuscitation areas. Now, um, one second, it's gone back earlier. The suction is a very important unit, a very uh, low cost item. It is plugged permanently. It has a young poor suction to suction out uh, large particulate uh, vomitus. And uh, the, you can you note that the tip is covered here. It has to be available. You should not be moving around searching for it. Stock up on other suction catheters, which are age dependent and make sure that it is easily accessible. Now, another important point that is the main part of your resuscitation is your oxygen supply. Ideally, you should have a central oxygen. If you do not have an accessible cylinder, full cylinder is mandatory. Otherwise, you cannot do any resuscitation without having a cylinder uh, available. The airway devices which are useful are the bag valve mask and the Jackson circuit for in case a child is continuously breathing, a CPAP uh, usually helps in their respiratory failure. And if they are not breathing, of course, the bag valve mask. The different size masks are important. 
even if you have one ba bag well mask, you must have all the other different sizes for, uh, to fit the particular child. But in the situation where you have an unresponsive victim, a child who's not breathing, the easiest thing that you can do for the airway is inserting the appropriate laryngeal mask airway. It's as in easy as inserting an orogastric tube. You deflate the cuff, introduce it, inflate and attach to the bag valve mask. Simply this reduces any kind of time frame, uh, time uh, lost in uh, securing the airway and you can handle the rest of the resuscitation if you have an, uh, uh, the uh, age appropriate or weight appropriate laryngeal mask airways. And this can be reused any number of times. Uh, in the era today, now in COVID era, we are using pulse oximeters, but a monitor which gives you other vital parameters is mandatory. These are quite uh, not very expensive, should be mounted at the head end and should be uh, uh, given this electrical connection, uh, uh, dedicated for it. If there is no uh, electricity, it should be working on battery ensure that you get a, a, a unit which is uh, battery sustainable. And you can see here the central suction. Again, the uh, tip of the Vancouver is, uh, Yankouver is, is, uh, is uh, secure. Uh, organize a crash card is not very difficult. Label your uh, drugs, label your items, but this has to be there so that you can rapidly get it across to your resuscitation area uh, in a minimal time. Drugs and IV fluids, store it within reach, label it, check expiry dates, maintain sterility, and replenish. Every shift, it has to be checked. Often you'd find that an adrenaline or a, or a vital drug is, uh, is, is, has an expiry date on it, and uh, it's too late to uh, change it. So ensure that this is done in every shift. Consumables are very, uh, it's, it's emergency medicine is more about organization. These are very basic equipment, Venplon, syringes, nasogastric tubes, or three-way uh, uh, adapters. They should be organized in the simple trays, and but ensure that you have a age-appropriate consumable chart, which helps you to uh, to find out which uh, size fits that particular baby. Don't unnecessarily use the wrong size and get into trouble. The chart is absolutely important to find out because in a state of panic, you might not remember. And epinephrine is important. It is, we do not have pre-filled epinephrine in our setting. What we do is one, one, one ml is diluted in nine ml of normal saline, and it should be available and ready in case you have a vaccine related uh, adverse event or uh, you have a, a cardiac uh, arrest, uh, this becomes very useful. You can keep this pre-filled syringe for a week or so if you have not used it. It's, uh, they find that in Western countries, a, a publication says that you can keep it up uh, as, uh, as long as three months. We don't, you don't need to do it, but definitely you need to keep an epinephrine, uh, diluted epinephrine uh, available uh, at all times. The stock of drugs given here is a very small list, but these are the minimal drugs. You can stock up if you have more, but remember oxygen is a drug, adrenaline and all the other basic drugs can definitely be stocked and replenished. The uh, crystalloid, isotonic crystalloids are compulsory because that's something which you need to have all the time. A BP apparatus with various size cuffs. Remember, pediatrics, the cuffs, the blood pressure monitoring is important. If you have an NIBP, fine. Otherwise, make sure you have your uh, blood pressure apparatus close at hand. It gives you valuable information. A glucometer is mandatory. Uh, CBG has to be monitored for every child who is critically ill. A Broslow tape, not commonly used but it can be laminated, it's a bit expensive, but it's a good investment because when you have an unresponsive child, it's crucial that you use the right uh, a weight for each medication. And uh, the Broso tape gives us a good idea as to what the weight is for a particular child. Organize your drugs inside your refrigerator in the same, same manner as you have done on your crash cart. Make sure it's labeled, make sure it is, uh, the expiry date is noted and uh, this, is a, uh, the, uh, uh, these drugs have to be checked for every shift inside the refrigerator. Your biomedical base, you will be using a lot of
discussed or let's uh, uh, commonly highlighted part of Excuse me, madam. Madam, the voice is not very clear. I think. It's like we have lost connection. Actually, if I can, if I disconnected, probably. Sir, uh, she got some internet connectivity. I think she's joined yeah. back. Yeah, she joined back. Yeah, yeah, she's joined back. She's she joined back. I just heard a word with her. Screen, yes, ma'am. You can start sharing, ma'am. Your video is clear. You can start sharing. Attend the meeting, ma'am. I'm not a man. 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 I'm not நினைக்கிறேன் <laughs> Mm, why, why if it's stable app? Sir, uh, slide set, uh, so... Uh, yeah, I have a slide set, sir. We can share it with uh, Madam. Uh, and, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Hindu on. Hindu on. Are you in the line? Hindu? ஜாயின் பண்ணிங்களா இந்து ஓகே இப்போ நான் இப்போ ஜா ஓகே சோ ஸ்லைட்ஸ் ஆர் देयर இஃப் மேம் இஸ் ஓகே கேன் தென் ஷி இஸ் ஜாயினிங் நவ் ஷி இஸ் ஜாயினிங் நவ் ஐ திங்க் பாலாஜி இஃப் யூ ஹேவ் தி ஸ்லைட் ஷட் யூ கேன் யா கேன் ஷேர் இட் நவ் யா 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 யூ யூ ஸ்டார்ட் தி ஸ்கிரீன் ஷேர் so when madam is getting connected she can go through the like uh, she can is it visible now uh it's coming it's coming yeah yeah, yeah it's coming
அந்த காலத்துல தூர்தர்ஷன்ல தடங்களுக்கு வருந்துகிறோம்னு வரும் அடிக்கடி இந்த மாதிரி ஒரு தடங்கள் திருமுருகன் <laughs> 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 Yeah, I think she's sharing. Yeah, ma'am uh, is sharing. Madam is sharing. Madam is sharing. Yeah, okay, okay. Yes, ma'am, your screens are visible, ma'am. You can... Your video is fine. You can start, ma'am. Yeah, madam, you have to unmute, ma'am. எனக்குலாம் <laughs> and it is checked for its working uh, and this is done every shift so unless you have however small your unit this is essential for running of an emergency section even in a in a clinic setting and remember an important part is documentation your uh, your uh, whatever you do for the child as you as you resuscitate make sure you document because this is going to be your med- medical legal uh, way of protecting yourself now we come to the difficult part of the uh, setting up of the uh, emergency is the training of manpower in resuscitation skills train your team in emergency response teach them whatever uh, how to manage a patient and not to feel panic at the time of of when the patient comes so here these nurses are being shown the ec clamp here is another nurse who's uh, a cpr process is in progress and she's learning how to uh, uh, how to participate in that just before going they should learn how to prepare drugs for different ages it's crucial otherwise they could make uh, life uh, li- uh, uh, life threatening mistakes they have to know how to prepare their drugs and how to prepare infusions for different age groups without uh, compromising the sterility of the process and here you can see a nurse operated team response where uh, you can see the uh, bagging the suctioning the uh, chest compressions i'm not saying that this um, severity of illness will reach you in your clinic but once they are trained they can handle any uh, basic emergency very well and you can see that they are listening very carefully to the doctors they, are, they they tune in to how to follow instructions so why exactly should you uh, i mean there's so much of investment so much of training why is it that i should prepare myself for an emergency is it it's safer to refer these children to higher institutions the sooner you give emergency the the basic emergency care is just about positioning the airway giving a bit of oxygen some fluids some midazolam etc or correcting the hypoglycemia once you do that the amount of uh, the uh, recovery is much quicker when they reach the uh, higher institutions and there's less hypoxic ischemic damage to the growing brain and that's crucial if you take this effort you are definitely going to have a better outcome on top of that you have improved patient satisfaction and a very successful practice so it's like a surgeon who needs an op- to be a good uh, person inside the theater he has to do his surgeries well he cannot sustain himself with an op practice similarly pediatricians who take on acute care are far more successful than ones who avoid uh, and uh, and uh, and refer in which case a major impact is seen you can see the emergency of children's hospital should be empty like this the less the more these patients are managed outside the less uh, um, uh, uh, is a burden on the tertiary level uh, emergency uh, departments so uh, this was renovated by the tamil nadu accidents and emergency initiative and you can see a fabulous emergency but it should be empty if you handle the uh, uh, the uh, resuscitation well in your private sector so i come to the end of this uh, presentation but i want to 
use this opportunity to thank the many extraordinary physicians, postgraduates, nurses who have participated in this journey. And I congratulate this team for their very consistent effort. Thank you, Dr. Sasidharan and Dr. Mulli for, uh, and Dr. Murgan for, uh, you know, uh, uh, waiting and going through this. Um, hats off to your dedication in conducting this program. And uh, I'm sure this program will be a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. And uh, it's actually more than a presentation. It is a journey through pediatric emergency, how we can set it up in a proper way, um, in a private hospital setup, in an office setup, as well in a tertiary care setup. I think it's a, uh, it's a very uh, appropriate overview and um, uh, initiating session to start this pediatric emergency module. Um, over to Tangabelu, sir. Uh, thank you, Andhra. It's, it's a wonderful lecture, giving every aspect, practical aspect, of where the, uh, the stool should be there, where the electrical connections, all this a real learning point for anybody who wants to organize the uh, uh, periodic emergency in their own place. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, if we have uh, one or two questions, we can take it up. Otherwise, we can proceed to the next session. I uh, think the listeners are happy listening and yet to st start posting any uh, questions. So uh, as of now, the chat box is empty. We have not seen any questions. And uh, there was a, yeah, there was a question posted. Uh, yeah. One of the speakers asked, like, how long can diluted adrenaline be used? So I think ma'am had uh, hinted upon that during her presentation, if she can elaborate. And the question was, how long can we store the dilute epinephrine during the office practice? Because obviously, its uh, application will come uh, like once in a while, but it's very crucial. Whether Madam is connected? Madam is left, I think. Madam has left, I think. So okay. basically, um, we can maybe uh, just for the closure of the discussion. So Madam has emphasized that in her own talk. So she told one week, um, it will be kept maybe the routine practice in tertiary care hospital. Uh, she told it's a 1 is to 1000 solution, which is available. 1 ml will be diluted with 9 ml and the 10 ml solution, which is a 1 is to 10,000 solution. Um, uh, she told there are a few uh, documentations saying that in uh, overseas, it can be kept for longer duration also. But she clearly emphasized it can be kept for one week. But what we have to uh, uh, see at this uh, juncture is um, it is a critical incident which can happen in emergency. We all understand that it will be used once in a while or we pray for not using it at all in office practice. But at the same time, keeping it um, diluted for one week and then disposing it off and uh, uh, re, uh, uh, re reconstituting the same uh, concentration and keeping it may be a, a good practice. So, uh, Tangavelu, sir, your comments, please, sir. Tangavelu, sir, your comments, please. Yeah, I just want to emphasize two, three points about adrenaline because it's a medicine with short expiry date. It's very cheaper, maybe hardly two, three rupees. But everyone should uh, procure, keep adrenaline whenever uh, they practice in the clinic. And it gets expired within a short period, three to four months. Now only we get expiry date up to six months. Ensure that it is checked every three months and then should be replaced. And maybe in a place like ICH where there is at least 10 to 15 resuscitation happening every day, maybe can keep it diluted and kept reserved. At least a person, we should keep it separately. I don't want this to be mixed with the distilled water and given along with the vaccine. So what I do is keep it in a separate box labeled as adrenaline. I also tell my nurse that in case of emergency, you have to take this medicine. That all they should also know that this is a very important medicine. Thank you, thank sir. You. sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, that maybe that's the most appropriate practice in office uh, because uh, the uh, mixing up with other medications uh, is also a very uh, uh, threatening complication. So that may be the right practice pattern. With this, we will go to the next session. Uh, the next uh, lecture will be delivered by uh, Dr. Mullai Balaji. Um,
Dr. Mullai Balaji, can you share your slides, please? Yeah. Yeah. So, slideshow, please. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Mullai Balaji is currently a lead consultant pediatric intensivist at uh, Kobe Medical Center, Coimbatore. And he has completed his uh, DM pediatric critical care training from PGA Chandigarh. Prior to that, he has completed his MD from um, ICH EGMO Chennai. And he has received uh, 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 multiple awards. He is a young researcher, ICMR travel grant recipient in 2015. And he is a speaker in uh, many national conferences, CMEs, and uh, workshops. He has a varied field of interest, including fluid and electrolytes, pediatric emergencies, diabetic ketoacidosis, and very important quality improvement in critical care. Over to Dr. Mullai Balaji to deliver a uh, lecture on a recognition of uh, critically sick children. Yeah. Is the audio clear? Audio on the yeah, presentation? It's clear. Yeah. It's okay. clear. Go yeah. Ahead. yeah. Thank you, Sasi, sir, for the kind words. Uh, I also thank uh, the IAP Tamil Nadu State Chapter, Dr. Ismail, sir, Dr. Rajendran, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Chendil sir, Dr. Tirumurgan sir for their uh, dedication and uh, they are doing it like for the past few months, the COVID time during the pandemic time. Okay. Uh, now the next 20-25 minutes, I'll be discussing on uh, how to recognize a critically ill child once they reach us, uh, the uh, OPD or the emergency department. So I'll be uh, discussing on what are the pathways of critical illness in children. Uh, impress upon the initial impression, primary assessment, touch upon the WHO ETAT signs, and then summarizing the entire talk. Uh, most of the uh, points that I will be going to discuss may be uh, very, very basic things, uh, but they are very, very important because they are uh, essential and very crucial for us to identify critical illness. So uh, with this small introduction, let me go on to the topic. Uh, in the majority of critical illnesses, the final common pathway uh, before they deteriorate is cardiorespiratory involvement. Therefore, proper assessment of the uh, respiratory and cardiac status becomes crucial in identifying a sick child or identifying a child who needs uh, a more meticulous monitoring or more meticulous interventions. Yeah. That is because early identification of these uh, subtle signs and prompt initiation of the appropriate interventions. Here, each and every word is important. The identification is important. Prompt initiation is important because uh, the time is gold. I, I, they say like golden hour or platinum hour during the first one hour of uh, emergency or trauma. And the uh, intervention needs to be appropriate for that particular child. So all these three, when they gel together, we can actually save a life. And uh, it is also crucial for us to differentiate between who needs our attention immediately and who doesn't need immediately because the resources have to be appropriately uh, shared amongst them. Okay. So when we see in children, the precipitating condition that leads to a cardiorespiratory involvement can be multifactorial. It can be a simple respiratory infection, which can be a, a, a simple URI in some child, whereas progress to lower respiratory tract, pneumonia, with respiratory distress failure and ARDS in another child. So it's crucial for us to differentiate between uh, a child who is getting better versus a child who is getting worse. So these precipitating conditions uh, can lead on to, yeah. If they involve the respiratory tract can lead on to respiratory distress and then progress to respiratory failure. In some situations, it can directly progress to respiratory failure without this intermediate pathway of distress. Similarly, circulatory involvement, the hemodynamic disturbances can go on to shock, which may be compensated and later hypotensive. And both these, if unrecognized or undetected, lead on to cardiorespiratory failure and ultimately cardiac arrest. A very small minority of children, about 5% or so, have a sudden cardiac event as the primary cause, an arrhythmia or so, which results in cardiac arrest. So why we need to understand this is because survival differs. As we could see, when we identify a child in a, uh, in a state of respiratory arrest and we are able to revive the child, the survival is quite good, about 75 to 80 percentage. Thus, when we allow the child to progress to a cardiopulmonary arrest or a cardiac arrest, the survival uh, drops down drastically to just about 5 percentage or even less. And again, associated with the neurodisability despite survival. So it is crucial for us to identify 
respiratory distress or respiratory failure because hypoxemia or hypoxemia is the predominant cause of cardiac arrest in children and it is this crucial thing that we want to identify at the earliest so how to identify this can be done through a simple initial impression which is the well known uh, pediatric assessment triangle that we are all familiar with so this initial impression is nothing but the few seconds that the child walks into the emergency or walks into our opd just as they walk in through the doors the first few seconds we uh, get an impression on the child's appearance work of breathing as well as color or circulation helps us to determine whether the child is sick and has a life threatening problem or is a, a non life threatening scenario where we can wait ask for history and get a detailed uh, history and examination and counsel them regarding what needs to be done so this uh, uh, first quick look and first few seconds that we uh, look at the child is very crucial and that is what we are going to discuss in detail in the next slides so this pediatric assessment triangle consists of appearance work of breathing and circulation or color in appearance this is the mnemonic that is used to remember it's known by tickles so we specifically look at the consciousness of the child and ability of the child to interact it is important for us to analyze all these in the developmentally appropriate context so uh, a baby who is uh, 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 developmentally subnormal or so we need to uh, understand the underlying uh, 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 underlying premorbid illness and then uh, analyze these uh, variables so we look at the tone of the child how the child is interacting consolability look or gaze and cry of the child and uh, it is also important for us to keep the child as calm as possible possibly the uh, uh, mother or caregiver can carry the child because many of these parameters tend to get affected by the presence or absence of the uh, primary caregiver or when they enter into a new place and at this point of time when the child just walks into the uh, carried into the er or carried into the op if we find that the child is not responding properly then it's important for us to call for help so that we have a team to manage and then we have to go for assessing the breathing and pulse of the child looking at the breathing of the child in the first few seconds we just evaluate the work of breathing we look at the uh, breathing pattern as well as listen to the sounds the normal is nothing but regular breathing with no increased retractions no work of breathing at no abnormal sounds this is normal that we all know so any use of accessory muscles any deviation from the normal and presence of some noise during uh, breathing means that there is something that is abnormal similarly coming to circulation or color skin color is very important because it tells us how well the child is perfused how the circulation to the uh, various tissues are there and also we can look have a look at if the child has some bleeding uh, external bleeding that is been there so a child with a normal color with no evidence of bleeding means that the child is having no life threatening issues and it's normal we can wait and any paler any mottling or cyanosis bleeding points petechiae purpurea all this point towards that the child may have a serious problem or life threatening problem and we need to go for quick assessment so at the end of initial impression these all these takes just few seconds so we need to know whether the child is responding properly we need to know whether some immediate intervention is needed if the answer is yes the child is not responding properly or any intervention is needed we need to call for help and the pathway is slightly different we will not be touching upon those now if the child is responding well and no immediate intervention is needed then we need to have a quick look at the a b c d e we will again talk in uh, detail in the later slides if needed the support need to be provided for a b c d e we need to provide the appropriate support and go for again further detailed primary assessment and if airway breathing and perfusion are normal we go for a detailed primary assessment so when we talk about primary assessment and further assessing the child this sequence of us evaluating identifying and intervening will be coming into place so it is very crucial for us to know what each of these mean by evaluate mean we mean that we good, do a good primary assessment we do a secondary assessment with the history or other examination findings and a few simple lab investigations which are point of care investigations if needed and once we evaluate the child based upon our assessment we can identify two things if the child has some problem what type of problem it is and how severe is the problem and once we identify the problem we can uh, uh, chip in with the appropriate or necessary interventions and it's also important for us to know that this is a ongoing and repeated sequence so at any point of time uh, if the child has some problem we have to again go back to our primary assessment identifying the severity of illness and intervening appropriately
so that is what is important so going to the uh, assessment of airway here we uh, we we remember this by this mnemonic of look listen and feel so we actually look for the movement of chest and abdomen we listen for the air movements listen for the breath sounds any abnormal sounds that are clearly audible and we can feel for the movement of air at the level of nostrils so at the end of this assessment we can clearly say whether the airway is clear means it is open not obstructed there is good movement means the airway is clear and we don't have any concern with respect to the airway if the airway needs some simple measures now what are those simple measures just like positioning of the child a child with upper respiratory infection may be progressing towards bronchiolitis may have thick uh, mucoid secretions blocking the uh, nostrils so simple suctioning of the nostrils is just sufficient to relieve the child of its distress so these are called as simple measures a child who is just had a seizure and is in a post ictal state may need to be put in a recovery position maybe need to put in a, a lateral position or mild head tilt and chin lift these are all simple measures and if the airway can be maintained by these simple measures then we say it is maintainable but certain circumstances may be not so common but we may be needing advanced techniques like maybe provision of uh, placing an advanced airway like intubation or provision of some positive airway support these are all advanced measures and if these measures are needed then we say that airway is not maintainable and it needs some advanced measures so the first assessment of airway is very very crucial because once we miss this and go to the next thing then uh, we have like uh, uh, missed an important part of the first initial assessment that is the assessment of airway now moving on to the assessment of breathing once the airway is clear we assess the rate of uh, respiratory rate again uh, emphasis of counting it for full 60 seconds Uh, when the child is quiet and calm, respiratory rate and pattern, effort, any uh, use of accessory muscles are there or not? How is the chest wall expanding? How is the air movement? Any added sounds that are audible? Air entry and of course the pulse oximetry is now integrated into a physical examination. So what is the saturation level? Uh, either with support or without support, that is again important for us to know. Assessing these uh, various respiratory uh, parameters will help us to identify whether the child is having normal breathing. or has a problem if a problem whether distress or respiratory failure so presence of mild tachypnea mild increase in work of breathing mild tachycardia a child who is anxious uh, with a normal color may point towards that the child is having respiratory distress whereas if it's marked tachypnea again if the child has uh, gone into respiratory fatigue and going into bradypnea or apneic breathing then it means it's respiratory failure significant increase in work of breathing or due to fatigue the child may have inadequate efforts extreme tachycardia or in the late stages of bradycardia a child who is comatose or not responding all these mean that the child is in advanced stage of uh, respiratory involvement which is nothing but respiratory failure and again visible cyanosis is present indicates that the child is in respiratory failure it is also important not only to assess the severity of uh, the respiratory problem but also knowing the anatomical involvement because then we know what what is the group of conditions that we are dealing with and then our interventions can be appropriate so it can be an upper airway involvement where the child can have suprasternal retractions presence of audible strider there can be associated history like there's a change in voice there's a drooling sound or a gurgling sound or it can be a lower airway involvement where again tachypnea will be there with retractions but the major uh, uh, the uh, salient finding or characteristic finding will be prolonged expiration presence of wheeze and cough that is very typical so a lower airway involvement uh, the cough will be the predominant symptom when the lung tissue is involved this is very important for us to know because the grunting will appear so whenever there's a grunting in a child it means that there's a lung parenchyma involvement alveoli or lung interstitium that is involved and it also indicates a more serious in illness or an advanced respiratory failure and again presence of crackles and presence of hypoxemia which is very very early occurs during lung tissue involvement and disordered control that is uh, any trauma or any poisoning or any sedation any seizures or any neuromuscular involvement will result in inadequate efforts shallow breathing or central apnea so it is important for us to categorize which type of respiratory involvement is there along with the severity of respiratory involvement as well. i'll just share a few videos one or two videos for us to just impress upon yeah so this is the child where a strider is clearly audible you are able to see the suprasternal retractions and some amount of central sternal retractions and we know that this is involvement of upper airway in this child here we are able to yeah here we are able to clearly see the presence of subcostal retractions which again can occur in lower airway or even lung parenchyma involvement
so this is another video where the typical silent finding that i uh, want you to all impress upon is that the chest wall is not at all moving so this is a child who had neuromuscular involvement uh, this was just prior to intubating the child and we are clearly able to see that uh, though the child is breathing fast to compensate for the low, uh, loss in tidal volume the child is having increased respiratory rate but the chest expansion is actually not happening at all it is hardly moving and this child may in fact have a normal saturation if you put him on oxygen so it is important for us to know that the efforts are not adequate in this particular child yeah this is another last video where i just want to impress upon that this child has a deep breathing and as well as fast breathing it's not uh, a respiratory problem it's actually acidosis so not always that tachypnea or fast breathing means a respiratory problem if the breathing is really rapid and then uh, uh, deeper it can also mean that there is a metabolic condition that is underlying and the child has acidotic breathing it's important for us to know so few uh, points to summarize in respiratory assessment respiratory failure can occur without prior distress especially neuromuscular involvement or disordered control of breathing uh, remember the third video that i showed and again it's very very important for us to know that normal oxygen saturation doesn't mean that there is uh, no respiratory failure it's important that respiration means both oxygenation as well as ventilation so the efforts are inadequate the air ex the chest expansion is inadequate we may be dealing with ventilatory failure which is also important for us to recognize so with this we'll move now move on to assessing the circulation which are the points that we need to look at so we look at the heart rate and rhythm central and peripheral pulses capillary refill time skin color temperature how are the peripheries and core temperature what is the blood pressure and it's also important that how is the uh, end organ perfusion adequate or not so we specifically uh, concentrate on two organs one is kidneys and brain so urine output is an important marker which will tell us that the renal perfusion is adequate brain whether the consciousness is good will indicate that the brain perfusion is adequate or not so these are the various parameters that we will have a quick look at when we assess the circulatory parameters because we want to identify shock so when we talk talk about shock we have a again letter panel discussion i'll just touch upon the few uh, basic points it basically means that there is an imbalance between supply and the demand so the supply is not matching to the demand of the tissues that is when we call it as shock it could be due to volume loss it could be due to uh, inappropriate distribution distributive shock as in septic shock it could be due to primary cardiac involvement as in cardiogenic shock or it could be due to any obstruction like a tension pneumothorax or a cardiac tamponade again just like respiratory involvement we need to know the severity whether it's a compensated shock by me by which we mean that the blood pressure is normal with compensatory mechanisms or the blood pressure is low which means that it is a hypotensive shock so both the type of shock and the severity of shock needs to be assessed by us yeah this is just as one slide on the physiology because we are uh, uh, mainly worried about oxygen delivery to the tissues we need to know that cardiac output and the oxygen content will determine and again it's the preload is the contractility and afterload all these three will determine the stroke volume which along with heart rate will determine the cardiac output and this along with the oxygen content will determine, determine the oxygen delivery so once everything is right and the uh, demand of the tissue is also appropriate then there is no shock or no circulatory impairment it is also important for us to know what are the compensatory mechanisms as the cardiac output comes down the systemic vascular resistance as you see in the first part of the slide it increases so what it does is it maintains the blood pressure in the normal within the normal range during the initial stage but once the uh, uh, once a particular point is reached the increase in svr cannot compensate for the low cardiac output and that is when our blood pressure falls and that is when your hypotensive shock ensues so it is important for us to know that hypotension is a late sign of shock so these compensatory mechanisms help us to identify shock the increased heart rate can uh, reflect as tachycardia which is inappropriate for the age sex and the for age and the temperature of the uh, child if she has the increased vascular resistance can be manifest as cold skin pale and mottled skin delayed capillary refill time weak pulses narrow pulse pressure and due to redistribution of the blood apart from uh, the uh, splanctic circulation you can have some ileus can have some vomiting can have oliguria and when brain perfusion is also affected in certain ways you can have some al alteration consciousness like confusion anxiety disorientation the child is agitated fighting the mass etc all this can indicate that the cerebral perfusion is impaired uh, this is a quick formula that most of us will be aware less than 70 plus age into 2 the systolic blood pressure if it is less than that that means hypotension is there 
and also a fall in blood pressure if there is a serial monitoring and the fall in blood pressure of 10 mm or more again means that uh, we are in for a significant fall and within a few it, it takes few hours for compensated shock to progress to hypotensive shock whereas within few minutes the child can land up in cardiac arrest so it is very very crucial that if a, we see a child in hypotensive shock that means it's already pre terminal or it means that impending cardiac arrest is there yeah i think these uh, slides we will be again discussing with uh, when we have the shock panel discussion now we'll just touch upon two important reason for shock in children one is volume loss due to diarrhea dehydration and blood loss so when a child has mild dehydration we can just manifest with dry uh, mucosa and low urine output these can be the first early signs so presence of uh, history of urine output is very very important whenever we have uh, diarrheal dehydration or vomiting dehydration in place when the dehydration is more severe goes to the moderate category we can find some clinical signs like tachycardia poor skin turgor sunken eyes or sunken fontanelle and oliguria can be marked when it goes to severe dehydration where nearly 15 percentage of uh, estimated uh, weight is lost we have marked tachycardia some uh, disturbance something okay absent pulses narrow pulse pressure and in late stages can go to hypotension so assessing these clinical signs will help us to know what is the degree degree or severity of dehydration therefore our uh, intervention will be appropriate dr Again, balaji we have five more minutes yeah yeah i'll be winding up similarly for blood loss if it is just a mild severity where less than 30 percentage of blood loss is there the child can be just anxious have some tachycardia pulses may be just weak or ready the blood pressure is be normal in the initial stages when it is moderate severity when the blood loss volume is 30 to 45 percentage again now the blood pressure is normal but you start look at the pulse pressure the difference between systolic and diastolic blood pressure they become narrow so once we have this narrow pulse pressure then we mean that the blood loss is really moderate amount nearly 30 45 percentage of the blood loss has already happened but when we see a child who is having bleeding and has an hypotension that means it's like more than 45 percentage of the blood volume is lost so a child who is uh, unresponsive difficult to arouse has absent pulses or hypotensive means that the severity of blood loss is significant nearly at least half of the blood volume is already lost so knowing these signs is important for us to understand the severity of uh, volume loss in these particular scenarios so just to summarize on circulatory assessment again i want to impress upon hypotension is a late sign indicates impending cardiac arrest in certain scenarios of warm septic shock which is a very uh, special subgroup where the systemic vascular resistance is low you can have sometimes early hypotension but predominantly bp is low means it is we are already missed the uh, uh, crucial first few hours and recognition of altered sensorium as a sign of circulatory insufficiency is also very important because altered sensorium doesn't always mean it's a neurological cause due to respiratory or circulatory involvement again you can have some altered sensorium now moving on to disability we have finished abc it is again a quick evaluation of neurological function by means of uh, abpu scale pupils etc again as i told it can be primarily neurological problem or secondary neurological involvement due to a cardio respiratory uh, involvement when it is sudden in uh, onset like cerebral hypoxia sudden you can have sudden uh, syncope sudden loss of consciousness seizures pupil dilatation etc whereas when it is gradual we have irritability some lethargy some uh, mild changes in the sensorium that can be Uh, that can indicate that there's a gradual cerebral hypoxia that is happening so abp use a short scale it can correlate with the modified gcs like an alert child means a gcs of 15 by 15 a child who is verbal means about 13 by 15 gcs just pain responsive means it's about 8 by 15 and unresponsive means like it's either 6 or less than 6 so just a abp use scale is a simple scale that can be used ipdiye nikkira mari irukke it's also important for us to read the 3rd verse 2nd verse pupillary response to light as well as the other d in disability is dextrose so point of care blood glucose monitoring is also important for us to know and then finally the exposure avoiding unnecessary hypothermia or exposure to cold we need to expose the child as appropriate look for any bruises bleeds uh, any deformities and of course take the temperature so with this we complete the primary assessment where we have a b c d e look at the severity of involvement type of involvement either distress respiratory failure compensated shock or hypotensive shock and what type of involvement <laughs> <laughs> so then we, 
Yeah. Again, there's some noise, I think, in the background. Yeah. Again, after this primary assessment, we then move on to the secondary assessment, which is a focused history. Sample is the mnemonic, signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, any past medical history, what are the last meal the child took, and what event led to the current illness, and a focus head to toe physical examination and ongoing reassessment. Any intervention is needed, then again you go for primary assessment and then you reassess the child. At any point, we come across these life threatening conditions like abs, uh, severe RV obstruction, child has significant work of breathing, not detectable pulse, hypotension, bradycardia, suddenly becomes unresponsive, suddenly has a seizure, suddenly has a bleeding. Uh, bleeding point, a petechiae perfurate, then we stop, we address that, and again we go back to the assessment. So this systematic assessment will help us that we don't miss up on important findings, and it will also help us to know our uh, uh, assessment as a whole. So WHO has again summarized all these, and the, given that these are the emergency signs, a child with a severe distress, obstructed breathing, central cyanosis, comatose child, somebody with convulsions, or a child with diarrhea who is lethargic, sunken eyes and very slow skin pinch. Any two out of these three means that the child is having some emergency life-threatening condition so that we can address it at the earliest. These are called as priority signs put, up, put forward by WHO in their emergency triage assessment and training. A baby who is tiny, less than three months, that's what they define. Very high temperature, severe trauma, who looks pale, there's a history of poisoning intake, severe pain, uh, child is in respiratory distress, is, um, uh, unusually irritable or restless, presence of malnutrition, major burns, all these indicate that the child has a priority sign. So these children should be uh, triaged, maybe looked at in priority uh, with detailed assessment and then uh, maybe management at that place or refer it to an appropriate place. So with that, I conclude my talk. So the summary is majority of childhood critical illnesses or the critical clues can be recognized if you have a systematic approach. The first few seconds are very, very important as the child uh, walks in or the child is brought to the emergency or brought to the OPD, the initial impression. And the assessment pentagon of A, B, C, D, E is also very, very crucial. And evaluate, identify, intervene. This cycle will always follow. So once we evaluated, we have to identify the problem and then give appropriate interventions and then again reassessment. And at any point of time, the life-threatening uh, problems which uh, we have mentioned. So if any of these are there, then we have to stop there address the problem and then move on to the next thing. So with this, uh, uh, I take this opportunity to thank my mentors, uh, uh, thank the seniors for this wonderful opportunity and any questions, uh, we can uh, have a discussion. Thank you all. Thank you, Mullai. Uh, so it's a very um, uh, <coughs> comprehensive discussion on the topic of recognition of critically ill child. You have touched upon each system and grades of severity, when uh, the critical signs develop, what is the uh, trigger point for um, immediately stabilizing and then going back and again assess and again reclassify and proceed. So uh, you have given a comprehensive overview and you have set the correct platform for further discussion. There are a few questions. Uh, so the one interesting question is from Thangavelu, sir. Um, so when you, uh, your talk is predominantly based on uh, PALS uh, guidelines, uh, do you suggest uh, PALS uh, training course is important even for the practitioners? Ah, yes, sir, definitely, yes. I mean, uh, I think uh, the recently the mass awareness program, the IAP PALS, even virtual IAP PALS is, uh, has come up. So I think it's not only for attending the PALS course, but also uh, like reinforcing us like every periodically, every uh, every few years because the recommendations keep on changing. So uh, it's also important for us to uh, get ourselves reinforced with the current or uh, changing concepts uh, with respect to PALS. And uh, as Tangwil sir rightly pointed out, it's not just for postgraduates or uh, the emergency and ICU people. I think it is more important for the uh, 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 primary pediatricians because they are the cornerstones for identifying sick child or uh, identifying and then stabilizing a sick child. So I think uh, Tangwil sir has rightly pointed out uh, that, that that concept. Yeah. Can I can I add a sentence? Sir, please, sir. Uh, so now the IAP ALS uh, e map module. Very very interesting thing is no exams. You can just attend the course. They will give a certificate. They will attend the course. There won't be any exams. So that is the only thing which uh, prohibits the seniors from attending these courses. 
they, they will definitely get the knowledge out of it and some more questions in the youtube yeah. uh, this thing even though it's not directly connected i'll pass on to mullai cannula <laughs> insertion during shock management how many times a try can be given how many tries can be given for iv access sir idly they say three pricks sir if you are not getting in three pricks and if the child is in shock uh, it is best that we put an intracious access and i think uh, rather than intracious needle like what we have all got trained us with the blood bank the blood set needle uh, if we don't have an intracious needle available at many places that may be the uh, resource limiting or cost limiting factor even a, a sharp the blood transfusion set needle that i think may may be maybe life saving uh in that scenario so three pricks and if if the child is in shock i mean this all represents when if the child is critically ill or really sick uh, obviously not fit in with a child who is stable and just needs a stat jab for a, a fluid or a iv antibiotic so you mean shock cardiac arrest or recurrent seizures in this situation yeah. probably this may be useful one question uh, is uh, what is the role of midazolam nasal spray in emergency room either you or we can pass on the questions to the topic on status epilepticus midazolam uh, yes, spray sir, nasal spray in emergency room what is yes, the role sir as the first first line medication for a benzodiazepine the alternatives like lor intravenous lorazepam or im midazolam or a buccal midazolam or a midazolam nasal spray all these things are uh, interchangeably used and therefore i think two sprays Uh, uh given over uh five minutes gap as the first aid measure for seizure along with taking care of positioning rv suctioning it will be probably the first aid that we can uh, institute in the emergency uh, another question is or pre- yes, yes completed yes sir yes, sir I mean, i just wanted to know if there are any other uh, or pre filled dilute pre filled diluted adrenal injections are available or pre filled diluted adrenal injections are available Yes, sir. I think they're talking about the EpiPen. I think in India, I mean, to my knowledge, I think it's not available. So we it's just important. need to, yeah, it's we need important. to uh, dilute it to the 10 ml syringe, make it to 1 in 10,000 dilution. As I think, ma'am had already suggested in her lecture, uh, uh, the shelf life can be uh, extended up to one week or so. Uh, it's also important that the expiry date of adrenaline sometimes, because the old stock sometimes uh, gets forgotten. So it's also important for us to know whether the drug has expired or not. And uh, up to one week is what ma'am has suggested that can be used. another question in the chat box can we use uh, i think they I mean think nasogastric, nasogastric tube for tube, saline yeah. resuscitation if the iv or iv route cannot be established yeah uh, especially in diarrheal dehydration in setting or scenario i think this may be appropriate uh, child who is uh, uh, even during transportation if uh, along with the iv fluid putting an ng tube or and resuscitation through the enteral route may be appropriate with the uh, diarrheal dehydration but in uh, states of shock where already this plantnic perfusion may be compromised uh, uh, giving a pa- giving an enteral route how it will translate it to intravascular volume repletion is questionable i think there if the child is in shock probably intracious will be the best option whereas it's just a diarrhea dehydration not in shock where this plantnic circulation we are not really worried up then i think uh, enteral route is uh, can be preferred over to sasi yeah uh, so the last question is quite interesting so uh, the peritoneal fluid resuscitation is the way in which the actually iv fluid resuscitation history has started but uh, it is only history now so except in diarrheal dehydration conditions we don't prefer that as uh, dr balaji has told with this we will move on to the next session which is quite an interesting session uh, so i invite uh, dr uh, i invite dr mutayya uh to deliver the next uh, talk uh, mutaya can you share your screen please we are sharing sir yeah is my screen visible yeah yes 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 yeah yeah um uh, shall i start sir uh dr muttaya is currently affiliated as a, a consultant pediatric intensivist uh, at meetha children's hospital uh, in chennai and uh, he is our uh, important asset and he is a very um, uh, uh, a close colleague of us and uh, he is uh, having a huge interest in non invasive ventil- ventilation as well point of care ultrasound as well in cardiac intensive care over to dr muttaya to deliver his talk on uh, management of acute 
thank you sir uh, in the next 20 25 minutes we will be uh, discussing of managing a child with wheeze at the level of er emergency room so to start with i'll start with some case case discussion then go to the topic per se just to make it uh, clear for the audience how important it is to identify a, a wheeze which is not due to asthma first question which we have to ask ourselves every time is whether a wheezing child is really an asthmatic or we are dealing with something else so uh, i i i hope in the next 5 minutes i'll make uh, some points clear in that first case is a 2 year old male uh, presented with cough for one day with no history of fever fast breathing for 4 hours with no significant past history it was tachycardic tachypneic pulses were well felt saturation was normal in room air had a normal sensorium the the child had minimal subcostal interactions and minimal work of breathing chest uh, on auscultation at wheeze on the right side with decreased air entry on the left side so we did an x ray in this child uh, after starting nebulizations uh, so this is the x ray which is showing unilateral hyperinflation on, you can see on the left side and uh, this is actually due to obstructive uh, emphysema due to an air, airway obstruction in the left bronchus this actually turned out to be a uh, actually you can see the serial x ray here it is more clear Uh, the air emphysema has increased and the right lung field is you know hemithorax is uh, lung lung because the pushing of the uh, mediastinum to the other side the right hemithorax is uh, lung volume is reduced and subsequently a uh, rigid bronchoscopy was done and it revealed a uh, peanut a piece of peanut so this is one scenario which is very commonly seen the second scenario is a 6 year old male child present with fever and cough for 5 days had fast breathing and decreased activity for one day heart rate he was having 150 of heart rate with tachypnea rate of 40 minimal work of breathing I had bilateral scattered wheeze nebs were started uh, chest x ray was taken after 2 hours as there was no response to nebulizations and a blood gas was done which showed metabolic acidosis uh, the x ray is like this you can see there is a uh, cardiomegaly Uh, in this x-ray and what was missed in the clinical examination was the uh, subsequently the pulses were checked it was weak the heart sounds were muffled and there was in the history there was decreased urine output and there was a large liver span which was missed so if we would have identified this we would have spent little bit more time if we go the system, systematically as dr mullai rightly told the abc circulation part was not properly checked in this child to start with that was the reason why the nebulization was ordered and subsequently the child child took two hours to recognize the problem so the next case is a 4 month old female infant presented with fever and cough for 3 days had fast breathing dec decreased feeding since 3 days there was significant tachycardia tachypnea significant work of breathing with uh, subcostal intercostal and suprastal interactions with room air saturations of only 88% chest had bilateral wheeze here the history was little um, So, uh, prolonged with fever and the fast breathing for three days, so we ordered immediately an X-ray, and this showed this kind of an X-ray with bilateral patchy infiltrates and a huge, uh, you know, uh, it's not looking exactly like a thymic shadow, but something uh, fishy there. So the subsequently the X-ray and CT you can see there is a airway narrowing due to enlarged lymph nodes, and there is carinal widening. You can see the left main bronchus almost obstructed. there is a, a like lower trachea narrowing all these are due to a tb infection like uh, the mother of the child was having a tb sputum positive and subsequently the child acquired uh, tb and these were lymph nodes obstructing the airway from outside third uh, and the other case is a three year old male child presenting with fever and cough for 3 days difficulty breathing since 6 hours here again tachycardia tachypnea significant tachypnea child is hypoxic and uh, there was decreased bilateral entry air entry on auscultation the child was unable to lie on bed even with mother uh, paradox there was a paradoxical breathing pattern child was almost with air anger was moving both the lower limbs had a bad air anger identifies mother but unable to speak uh, this was the status at er and the child had no similar illness in the or significant illness in history this is a classical so x ray of a wheeze associated lrti here this child is bound to uh, respond to uh, nebulizations and iv corticosteroids 
so one thing is common in all these four cases all these four cases result nebulization with acetylene in the beginning with oxygen so um, the first question is is it we is due to bronchiolitis or asthma and we need to rule out the asthma mimics any sick child so wheezing is not synonymous with asthma so any sick child who is hyperventilating could be having bka could be having any problem septic shock hyperventilating may have wheeze uh, so it doesn't mean we have to nebulize any child with metabolic acidosis entities which can present with first wheeze at er are important to identify and treat like the routine ones are like asthma viral illness associated wheeze the other ones are like pneumonia foreign body aspiration uh, heart failure or even viral myocarditis or or to name a few the others are air be obstructive cause obstructive airway lesions like some may be fixed like airway hemangiomas lymph nodes or vocal cord dysfunction some may be dynamic like the routine laryngotracheal bronchomalacias and vascular slings which obstruct the airway so coming back to our topic of the, the discussion a 8 year old female known case of asthma with history of poor compliance and 18 hospitalization with 8 pacu admissions came to er with another exacerbation with heart tachycardia tachypnea increased work of breathing and bilateral air entry decreased child saturation was 90% she was able to speak few words with normal sensorium the blood gas was normal the peak expiratory flow rate compared to her personal best was 50% and she was not responding to initial back to back nibs and iv steroids so what next so here comes the discussion status asthmaticus is a common emergency in children where we see progressive worsening of the bronchospasm with associated with respiratory di- dysfunction and which is unresponsive to our conventional therapy of nebulizations and iv steroids and oxygen nasal oxygen alone and the problem is it may progress to respiratory failure if unattended quickly so the abc of asthma is just for remembrance airway hyper responsiveness reacting to overreaction to some triggers environmental bronchospasm related really, really leading on to bronchospasm and there is a long term chronic inflammation in the airways which lead to some airway remodeling so this is how the airway looks in the asthma compared to the normal airway it, it is narrowed and there is mucosal hyperplasia and everything so you can see there in the uh, asthmatic lung you have unexpected airways that in some areas there is some mucus plugging going on in some places there is airway narrowing and there is inflammation at other zones so it is a heterogeneous lung disease in a like after exposure to some uh, environmental factors in a genetically predisposed they can present to a acute uh, present with acute exacerbation so in early bronchospasm the bronchodilators work in later phases where inflammation predominates anti inflammatory drugs work so we need to do rapid cardiopulmonary assessment in the er as uh, in, like uh, emphasized by dr mullay in his previous talk we need to do, do the rapid assessment triangle airway breathing circulation and primary assessment pentagon following that a b c d e so this has to be done rapidly within a minute at the same time history to confirm the diagnosis we need to ask the time of onset of exacerbation potential triggers severity of symptoms compared with the previous exacerbations uh, because that determines the risk and the response to treatment prior to admission and in examination we need to assess the severity to more uh, to start the treatment uh, the spo2 is part of the uh, initial assessment the level of alertness hydration status presence of cyanosis or pallor to identify respiratory failure and the uh, respiratory distress quantification is important wheezing and decreased aeration is another uh, thing which we identify in physical examination most of these patients and at the same time we need to identify complications mainly related to air leak and also rule out upper airway obstructive causes like croup and foreign body which is not at all uncommon so the respiratory mechanics just a word on that we all know during expiration the intrapleural pressure is slightly high which leads to more narrowing of the airways during expiration so the airway narrowing increased resistance uh, in the smaller airways of children a bit reduced flow this all makes the expiration become a more active process leading on to some work of breathing and with more and more air trapping in the lungs the diaphragm flattens and the expiratory muscles cannot contract properly there is some amount of bq mismatch that is ventilation perfusion mismatch mainly due to the shunt the child breathes fast to compensate there is uh, hypoxemia but hypocarbia initially and once the patient goes for goes in for respiratory fatigue there will be hypercarbia as well as hypoxemia 
so this is how the lung air gets trapped in the alveoli you can see the frc keeps on increasing with time and the uh, there is some amount of pressure trapped intrinsic peep we call in the airways so what are the risk factors for a severe uh, uh, illness or a severe exacerbation past history of pico admission history of rapid deterioration or uh, mechanical ventilation in the past pre term nicu graduates and the children and babies with chronic lung disease where they are exposed to uh, prolonged oxygen exposure they are at high risk psychosocial factors ethnic factors denial from the parents poor compliance to treatment high allergen exposure are all risk factors along with genetic factors obesity and older age uh, of children is a independent risk and pulses paradoxes at presentation is another important risk factor so how do you triage a child with wheezing so uh the more important to identify the critical children where there is wheezing with severe tachypnea bradypnea severe retractions uh with grunting and sensorium becomes drowsy or lethargy clinically and there may be silent chest and a desaturation below 90% the peak expiratory flow below 40% if you have the baseline level and the child will be able to speak only words if it is a verbal uh, age if beyond the verbal age and in other scenarios like it may be wheezing with moderate like milder variants are like a uh, moderate attack with increased work of breathing nasal pharynx tachypnea some amount of retractions prolonged expiration and agitated sensorium with saturation below 92 this also needs immediate attention and asthmatic with history of intubation becomes an independent risk for severe illness and the child here will be able to speak few phrases and another acute scenario is where there will be a mild work of breathing with tachypnea some amount of retractions peak expiratory flow between 40 to 70% the child may be agitated will but here the child will be able to speak sentences so here here it is compared to a mild to moderate attack the emergent and uh, critical uh, triage or uh, triage goes to severe critical uh, thing immediate severe attack and the urgent and less urgent goes to mild to moderate exacerbation so uh, in less urgent phases or mild cases you will have a normal saturation with tachypnea and wheezing uh, will be there and another important clue is the child will be preferring uh, to sit in a upright position and there will be in the history difficulty or refusal of speech such a, remember saturation will help us to grade the severity but it will not help us to identify the, the res, uh, response to treatment uh, and uh, blood gas showing the pco2 or atco2 doesn't grade the severity so there are various scoring systems i'm not going to go into details but the one which is validated is the p school respiratory assessment score or the pram score where they take into account the inter, the retractions the work of breathing the air entry from normal to absent vs which is only in the end of expiration to both during inspiration and expiration and audibly seen and the spo2 being normal going up to below 92% based on that we score it and there is another score which is again commonly used which is modified woods and downy score here the addition is the cns uh, disability scoring where if the sensorium is agitated or depressed they get a higher score so at the er we need to as based on the asthma score and severity where if it is mild a salbutamol puff in the covid era we are all afraid to do nebulizations even a salbutamol puff may be equal with a spacer may be equally eff efficacious in the mild case as just the nebulization of salbutamol alone in a moderate scenario you need to start continuous or repetitive nebulization salbutamol or what we call as back to back nebulizations at least three times within one hour along with oral or iv corticosteroids this is to prevent it from further progressing and if the child is presenting with a severe attack we need to start continuous nebulization salbutamol with oxygen and intermittent nebulization ipratropium three times in the first hour iv corticosteroids is preferred here iv max self can be considered early and other respect other interventions based on the risk factors and here we need to inform and alert the picu team and what are the severe findings at admission severe retractions low saturation diffuse wheeze paradoxical thoracic ab abdominal pattern with lethargy diaphoresis unable to speak and altered mental status all these becomes high risk factors and silent chest is an ominous sign asymmetry of wheeze remember foreign body or complication with local atelectasis or air leak syndromes uh, where there will be associated crepitus also so recognizing and triaging it severe cases at er and rapid aggressive care will interrupt this vicious cycle of air trapping and prevent respiratory fatigue and avoid mechanical ventilation
so the important thing in er is the nebulization most of the time the the non responsiveness is due to poor nebulization aerosol delivery adequate uh, meter dose inhaler with spacer puffs at home also is a question mark in an attack because the cooperation from a crying child is always a question mark in fact the nebulization deposition in a crying child is uh, unknown that the proper dose in a proper carrier solution at least 3 to 5 ml of uh, normal saline is ideally the carrier solution with min- low with minima minimizing the interruptions is very important for proper response proper technique the vertical position of the chamber the good fume generation nebulization always with oxygen free flow oxygen 6 to 8 liters to prevent or treat hypoxia and the end of, at the end of nebulization at the end of 10 minutes there should be only less than 1 ml 1 ml of nebulization left so that is again to say whether the nebulization is working properly another common thing what we see is worsening hypoxia when we start uh, salbutamol nebulizations alone what happens is normally the airway is narrowed and the physiological response is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction so the blood is diverted to uh, the normal zones to maintain the vq mismatch but when we start salbutamol nebulizations the uh, first the uh, blood gets uh, the blood vessels get dilated in the uh, in the areas of poorly ventilated alveoli also the airway is still narrowed but the perfusion is increased there thereby stealing of blood from those well ventilated zones happens and this leads to worsening hypoxia when we start that's why we always advise to start salbutamol nebulizations in a sick child with oxygen to prevent this problem so for a mild attack always Uh, even salbutamol puffs based on the weight you can give four six or eight puffs along with oral prednisolone is always required but in a severe scenario continuous nebulizations again based on the weight we have the dose ranges here again iv corticosteroids will be preferred along with ipratropium bromide and maxelf remember in the if iv access is getting delayed subcutaneous adrenaline or terbutaline is life saving in a severely uh, life threatening hypoxia or a silent chest and even im Uh, steroids may be equally efficacious to oral uh, or iv steroids in when we are waiting for getting the iv access remember all painful procedures may exacerbate bronchospasm so repeated assessment is the key in the er assessment every half an hourly for the first 4 hours is the key based on the severity respiratory score and consciousness uh, heart rate respiratory rate sp2 should be constant uh, monitored and at the end of 4 hours we determine whether the child requires icu care or ward care or discharge so this table you can just take a screenshot just to tell you the weight uh, based on the weight bands the requirement of dose generally 1 ml of salbutamol as 5 mg and uh, 1 ml of ipropropium respuel as 250 mics and continuous salbutamol nebulizations here means 0.5 mg per kg per hour to a maximum of 20 mg per hour and steroids maximum oral prednisolone and methylprednisolone we gave up to 60 mg uh, and dexamethasone based on weight the uh, don't give more than 8 mg uh, as a start dose dexamethasone actually for sorry and another important thing is the uh, puff versus neb ratio four puffs is equivalent to one acetylene neb and uh, to get the same effect of acetylene in oral we need 20 times the doses nebulization so we all know local route is preferred to avoid unnecessary side effects but again the deposition of the nebulization in a narrowed airway is a question mark so sometimes we resort to oral or iv routes also in a severe attack so steroids any steroid can be used but we need to know the duration of action and the dose uh, uh, we uh, it's unit based protocols we prefer dexamethasone some places they, they may prefer methylprednisolone or hydrocortisone and the doses are given along with the maximum doses so maxil is again a useful drug is a smooth bronchial smooth muscle dilator at the dose of 50 mg per kg Uh, which is equal to 0.1 ml per kg of 50% maxim maxil with a maximum dose of 2 grams uh, that is 4 ml uh, given over 30 minutes to 1 hour terbutaline again subcutaneous or iv route is preferred uh, and infusion is preferred starting with 0.4 mics per kg per minute up to 2 to 3 mics per kg per minute very rarely used only used in icu setting because there are a lot of side effects and monitoring needs to be done continuously ketamine again very rarely used only in the icu setting aminophilin again in cases where terbutaline is not available or uh, uh, the patient requires continuous infusion it's again a rescue drug loading dose of 5 mg per kg over 30 minutes to 1 hour is given dr mutaya 5 minutes left okay yeah so and again infusion is based on the weight of the uh, infant and therapeutic drug levels have to be monitored so i'm just going uh, fast in want of time 
so that based on the good treatment uh, based on the response we analyze whether it's good or poor if the bees is settled and if the child is clinically improving with improving respiratory distress we uh, can very well discharge the child or observe the child in ward if the worsening respiratory with if, despite giving proper nebulizations and steroids if the respiratory distress is worsening or if there is access uh, if there is increased use of uh, axillary muscles or uh, worsening uh, saturation then we have to escalate the care to pico here i am not going to dwell too much too much in the respiratory support which we give because there is a separate talk on that i just want to say niv early use of niv in these patients is very helpful it's an alternative to conventional mechanical ventilation but it remains an unproven therapy because lack of evidence is there in children but prior to intubation it is very uh, its trial of niv is important is is a mandatory there are because there are because a lot of benefits of niv like decreased need for intubation uh because no one wants to intubating a intubate a wheezing child improve the alveolar ventilation improve gas exchange relieve the uh, dyspnea and the, improve the work of breathing resting by giving rest to the fatigue muscles and it decreases the length of stay and high flow nasal cannula is what is the preferred mode which we use uh, there are the interface is comfortable and can be used in the er it uh, flushes the anatomical dead space thereby uh, reducing the inspiratory demand and it stents the upper airway thereby reducing the resistance and work of breathing and neps can be easily pro provided with niv compared to other modes of niv like bipap or standalone niv ventilators you can see the niv the doses i'm not going to details uh, this is how we provide niv previously and nowadays we have this inline nebulizations the advantage of this vibrating mesh nebulization is it maintains the laminar flow without uh, reducing the uh, the flow given to the patient and the temperature in fio2 is better maintained and there is better entrainment of the nebulization gases and enhanced delivery of the gases so you can see uh, these are the various de de delivery devices and the connections the the, the air hose which we all are familiar with this is where the new circuit we connect the nebulizer uh, chamber to the wet side of the humidifier chamber before uh, the initiation of the uh, circuit over here so i'm not going into details of this niv settings basically we should uh, uh, we start with st mode or pressure support ventilation in the niv ventilator give a good ipap and epap as per tolerance the interface should be properly fit not too tight not too loose uh, ipap is usually maintained 5 to 7 above the epap and epap we usually uh, epap is like cpap or peep we start with level of around 5 and fio2 based on the saturation to keep it above 92% and uh, always we try to avoid invasive ventilation because endotracheal tube can aggravate bronchospasm and there is a lot of serious complications associated with ventilation like pneumothorax or even later on bap at but at the same time timely institution of assisted ventilation is important if the patient is failing conventional measures or niv the indication for ventilation is cardiorespiratory failure refractory hypoxemia deteriorating consciousness with coma or respiratory fatigue significant respiratory acidosis with ph falling below 7.15 despite niv and uh, aggressive pharma, pharma, pharmacotherapy and the decision of ventilation should be based on, on solely on the clinical criteria rather than one specific abg value and again intubation preparation is very important in er it's a high risk intubation and expert personnel is required the drugs when we exhaust the second line drugs like carbotilin aminopilin infusion uh we sort for in intubation if there is no response and equipments we always prefer to use a larger tube to reduce resistance rsi drugs like midazolam ketamine neuromuscular blockade is important like vicodinium dopamine is preferred along with fentanyl and other invasive monitoring devices are important once the patient is shifted to icu and at the same time we need to monitor the side effect of drugs for want of time and skip skipping this and the discharge criteria is requirement for Be, uh, like the beta agonist salbutamol nips should be reduced there should be no requirement for beta agonist in the last 4 to 6 hours and there should be no signs of respiratory distress in the child the saturation should be maintaining above 94% in room air with good entry good air entry and there should be no respectors and the child should be nearby to follow up if there is a problem if these uh, criteria are satisfied then you can uh, like even discharge the child but we need to follow them up and uh, again there is no role of nebulized max self long acting beta agonists like uh, formiterol salmeterol long acting uh, anti muscarinic agents like tetropium or nebulized steroids in the acute scenario 
again ketamine can increase secretions and aminophilin is used only as a rescue in impending respiratory failure other unproven therapies in asthma is like antibiotics if there is a sec- high suspicion of secondary bacterial infection uh, we may use antibiotics but mucolytics are not uh, proven chest physiotherapy may be helpful in the later part of the treatment manual compression again unsure leukotin antagonists like modulocast and zafirlucast are again not proven bronchoscopy when there is persistent collapse and again very important to prevent an exacerbation and is uh, is of vital importance to prevent such an episode parental education and child training ensure good compliance of preventive therapy avoidance of triggers exercise which may trigger an attack peak respiratory flow monitoring fractional exhalation of fractional exhalation of nitric oxide monitoring lung function asthma diary are all important uh, early mdi relievers at home will prevent a, a further progression early oxygen steroids with sapa is what i want to emphasize and refer to cul- pulmonologist to prevent further cul- uh, like uh, episodes to to summarize ruling out asthma mimics early is very important at the er early assessment of severity and aggressive step wise timeline sensitive protocol leads to quicker recovery and avoids complications continuous nebulization with beta agonist early steroids will prevent worsening ipratropium bromide has a role in severe disease and reduces length of stay chest x ray blood gas has no role in the management but it will help to rule out alternate diagnosis and helps in monitoring uh, the uh, the treatment as well as the complications we we have to catch non non responders early based on history risk factors and treatment response and escalate the care to pcu avoid invasive ventilation as much as possible by instituting early niv thank you thank you uh, uh, dr mutayya you can stop sharing your slide so yeah. we can <coughs> take up the thank you for the opportunity so there are uh, a s- significant number of questions in the chat box okay. so for want of time uh, i i think uh, we will take a few questions and others you can proceed to answer in the chat box o- okay. over time so f- first question is uh, uh, is dexa preferred over prednisolone uh, in routine exacerbation of asthma if so what is your dose practice uh, dose what is the dose okay yeah. Actually, sir, um dexta or oral prednisolone in a mild scenario uh, both are equally efficacious uh, there even the gina tells oral prednisolone may be as efficacious as oral dexta or iv dexta oral dexta is not freely available but uh, said that dexta has a longer half life and has a better uh, uh, glucocorticoid in anti inflammatory property uh, it's a unit preference for a sick child i should say dexta will be preferable because uh, for a stable or a mild exacerbation oral prednisolone may be as efficacious as dexa okay uh, so how safe is aminophilin and uh, are we using aminophilin uh, currently okay so aminophilin since we have the luxury of getting terbutalin easily we have stopped using aminophilin at least in the last 5 years but in still in government institutions i know uh, they uh, prefer aminophilin aminophilin is a uh, has a narrow therapeutic range so we need to uh, monitor it's a life saving drug it, it it is a rescue if there is a life threatening bronchospasm we can use it but we need to monitor for side effects i have not uh, projected the slide because of want of time the, there is uh, in infants seizure we have seen seizures and it works as a diuretic it, there is lot of uh, urine output and patient can go into dehydration and if therapeutic drug monitoring is available we need to uh, do it and we need to uh, give the loading dose at 5 mg per kg and then restrict it to 0.3 to 0.5 mg per kg per hour and stop as soon as possible maybe 4 to 6 hours because giving more than 24 hours will lead to all sorts of complications but we have resorted to, to some time when we didn't have iv terbutalin due to lo- lo- like you know a short of supply or uh, something like that but aminophilin is a is a great drug but with lot of side effects tachycardia arrhythmia all those things are common so we need to monitor the levels if possible otherwise stick to the lowest dose possible give a 5 mg per kg stat get rid of the life threatening bronchospasm use your nebulization steroids uh, break the vicious cycle and uh, go ahead with a low dose infusion and come out of it usually okay. we get out uh, we can get rid of it in 4 to 6 hours uh, thank you mutaya so uh, still it has not gone out of practice so, so aminophilin is uh, still uh, a part of the toolbox in acute asthma management wherever we are whether it is in a private hospital or in a government hospital so thanks for emphasizing that so uh, the last question what we can take is a role of uh, subcutaneous adrenaline in acute severe asthma 
uh, again uh, subcutaneous uh, like adrenaline is both the alpha and beta agonist so it it may cause some vasoconstriction it may cause some worsening of hypoxic uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction but all said uh, i think it is a it ha- um, it has its pros and cons so i if a subcut if tablet is not available still and if ivlan is also not there i think subcutaneous adrenaline has a big as a major role at least in stabilizing basically you are sitting in no p and you just have an adrenaline push the adrenaline subcutaneously uh, give nebulizations if possible and shift as soon as possible to the proper emergency that's what i, I, I but you cannot keep on using it maybe a dose or two is okay uh, but uh, keeping on using it is unsafe yeah not beyond one dose uh, but obviously that also has a um, Uh, crisis rescue role uh, in acute severe asthma practice so uh, thank you dr mutriya so um, with this uh, actually there are few other questions uh, which we are not able to take uh, on want of time so which you can proceed to answer in the chat box itself okay sir okay we will proceed to the next uh, uh, session i invite dr uh, kalaimaran to share his slides please yeah thank you sir Uh, Dr. Kalimaran yes. is uh, uh, currently affiliated to uh, uh, Kanchi Kamakoti Child Trust Hospital as a senior consultant pediatric intensivist. He has been previously a long, tu- uh, a long tenure in uh, UK as a pediatric ICU consultant at Royal London Hospital, uh, London, UK. His areas of interest were uh, trauma and cardiac intensive care, end of life care, and quality improvement and patient safety. So we are extremely happy to have you today. and uh, uh, over to you for taking us through status epilepticus management thanks dr sastra so um, i'll start straight away so in the next 25 minutes i'm going to speak about uh, management of status epilepticus uh, give you the essentials and also add some evidence and add some scenarios so starting with the scenario you have you are the first year post graduate in er and parents bring a 3 year old child with seizures and uh, if you're new the senior nurse goes doctor this is status and you wonder oh, oh okay what is that so and you see the child the child is uh, uh, having generalized tonic clonic seizures has got a rolling of eyes you know this is a seizure and you also know this is one of the most common emergencies presenting to er and also one of the most common unplanned admissions or reasons for unplanned admissions to picu so what is status epilepticus so this is the paper which came out uh, from the international league against epilepsy back in 2015 where they redefined status uh, depending on the duration so they gave two time points one is time point 1 at 5 minutes and time point 2 at 30 minutes so time point 1 at 5 minutes is the time when the seizures are abnormally prolonged and it's also the time for that they say that you have to start giving medications and time point 2 is 30 minutes t2 is the time when the seizures beyond which you have a high risk of long term consequences or injury so where did this 5 minutes come from so we know from experience and various papers that most seizures terminate within the first two one or two minutes and most children presenting even to emergency room 80% of them do not require anti epileptic drugs and 5 uh, minutes comes from so when the seizures is as long as 5 minutes you're reaching the threshold where it's unlikely to self terminate and this t2 of 30 minutes uh, comes from experiments done on uh, primates back in 1970s when they had prolonged when they were made to have prolonged seizures and they were shown to have neuro- neuronal injury and death So back to our scenario, the child is still fitting, and w- what we need to do importantly is to make sure you time the seizures, you administer oxygen, loosen the clothing, turn the child to recovery position, uh, put some monitoring on. If you have basic monitoring, that's okay. Get some monitoring on, and don't forget your glucose. So why do we need to treat a seizure early? so we know that as a seizure prolongs your risk of cardiopulmonary uh, complications increase and also your likelihood of the seizure terminating uh, or spontaneously goes down so, and 
from this slide, what we see is as the seizure prolongs, there's a high risk of hypoxia. That's partly due to your chest wall rigidity, secondary to uh, muscle spasm, your poor handling of secretions. And uh, when it goes uh, longer, you are, have become acidotic, even hypotensive, and very rarely uh, even have rhabdomyolysis. So how do you treat? Remember, this is teamwork. Always call for help early and always be one step ahead in management. So always get the medications ready and to be ready to give it at the right time. While in the first five minutes, while you're awaiting assessing, be ready and get a brief history to try and identify a treatable cause. So what are the common causes you have? So children presenting most likely younger children, it's febrile seizures, then it's CNS infections, epilepsy, intracranial pathology ranging from stroke, infarcts, bleed, a tumor, electrolyte imbalances, uh, metabolic disorders, and don't forget poisons. So the clues to help us identify the etiology of to find a treatable cause or your initial investigations would be your blood glucose, which is correctable easily, your calcium, your sodium. If you have a blood gas machine, which you can check along with electrolytes, brilliant. You can do that as well. Uh, think about poisons and uh, medication levels are there. And also a CT scan, if indicated, will help you give a clue. Next. So next, what is this? Is the, this is the time-based guideline from the American Epilepsy Society. I'm going to walk you through this. And the emphasis here is on the medications and the timing you give the medications. So the first five minutes is the stabilization phase, which we, I just spoke earlier. Uh, you stabilize the child, you time the seizure, put some oxygen on, measure the blood glucose, attempt IV access, and collect essential bloods. At five minutes, the seizure still continues. It's not resolved. You're going into benzodiazepines. So benzodiazepines of choice, if you have an IV axis, it's lorazepam. If you don't have one, it's intramuscular midazolam. So why benzodiazepines? So the advantage is, is that it's very quick acting, very rapid onset, and can be given via multiple routes. You can do buccal, you can do nasal, you can do IM, IV, rectal. But please do remember these all can cause respiratory depression, and the maximum only two doses, and also please give the recommended dose. So again, uh, if you have an IV access, first choice would be lorazepam. For midazolam, the dose is slightly higher if it's an IM dose, uh, you have to remember that. I think there was some questioning about this in the previous uh, speaker, but uh, again, it's a very nice landmark paper, again from NGM, where they compared uh, intramuscular midazolam against intravenous lorazepam in a pre-hospital setting, uh, almost 893 children and adults. And uh, clearly what it showed was administering or giving intramuscular midazolam was much more quicker and also equally effective. So if you don't have an IV access, go for IM midaz. So at 10 minutes, the seizure still continues or the child is still fitting, then you repeat the benzodiazepine dose. So now you're going after 10 minutes. Now at this stage, you have to think, if you don't have an IV access, you have to think about an introsious access because from, from, from now on, your second line antiepileptic drugs need IV or introsious. So at 15 minutes, there is no evidence which one is preferred. So you have four choices. You have phosphenitoin, you have levetiracetam, you have valproate, and you have phenobarbital. So phosphenitoin is... Uh, a pro drug. The advantage of it being over phenytoin is that it can be given slightly qu more quickly. And the expectation is that the seizure will terminate slightly more earlier. And the side effects are also lesser. So these are two big articles. One is from Lancet, which showed that uh, levetiracetam is no better than phenytoin uh, in uh, status. And it's also the other one from NGM, the well-known ESET trial, they compared the three drugs and showed phosphenitoin, valproate, levetiracetam, all equally effective in status. So with this knowledge, that's why you can choose any drug, but know the complications and give them at the right dose. 
So I just at this point, I just want to mention, if you have a child with a seizure, known seizure disorder, you get a history that this child is on a drug and they have been compliant, they have a breakthrough status, then think of another anti-epileptic drug. And if the history is that they are non-compliant, consider topping it up, either half-loading or full-loading dose uh, uh, as individual. So the seizure still continues. Now you are at 40 minutes phase. So now here you are thinking about uh, either repeating the second line drugs once or more, or you're thinking about anesthetic doses. So for terminating seizures, the ideal choice uh, would be thiopentone and propofol. Uh, but please do remember, they can cause profound hypotension. So make sure if you're going to use them, keep your fluids, inotropes ready. And I think by this time, you already have some senior help who can help you with your airway and more personal as well to maintain the airway of the child and help with you, help you. The safer choice, I would say, is ketamine. Ketamine at one to two milligram at induction dose is pretty safe. And the recent studies have shown even in children with ICP, it, it's safe to use. And in children with head injury, it's safe to use. And it gives an anesthetic time of almost 20 minutes at a dose of one to two milligram per kg IV. So I just want to mention, this is the study which is happening in Italy and the recruitment has completed. They are looking at the efficacy of IV ketamine in comparison with conventional anesthetics in treating uh, status epilepticus. So once the results are out, my hope is that uh, ketamine will come more ahead of some of these drugs in the logarithm. So when do you intubate children? So, so you have this protocol, S guideline and every, uh, logarithm. But remember, when the ch you are at 40 minutes, yes, clearly you can go ahead, uh, terminate the seizures with one of the drugs I mentioned, go for intubation. But if the airway is compromised at any time, the child with your first benzodiazepine dose stops breathing, you have to consider intubation. If the child is desaturating or having bradycardias, having hemodynamic instability, go for intubation early. If you're a head injury or a uh, severe trauma post cardiac arrest stroke, uh, think about the intubation early, terminating the seizures early uh, as part of neuroprotection. And also prior to CT scan, make sure you have a safe airway to go for CT. So after intubation, uh, mention about just gentle ventilation. Uh, if you have blood gases, brilliant. Uh, or while you're waiting for your transport team or you're thinking of transferring the child from uh, ER to PICU, get the CT head if indicated. Uh, repeat the blood gas with electrolytes, monitor your glucose, get a chest x-ray to check for your tube portion, get the NG tube, urinary catheter, three percent saline or dexamethasone, if indicated, put them on a midas infusion, which will help for the seizures, also for sedation. So I'm here at this minute, I'm just going to take a break, show you some two videos with the reference. This is uh, from uh, experience, I can show you this was a child. Uh, I know this is a you know, one-way interaction here. So if people are interested, they can put it in the chat box. What do they think is this child is having? So this child uh, uh, was already on four anti-epileptic drugs and was doing all these movements. And uh, the question I had was to start a come referral to PICU to start some IV midazolam. Okay. So I'll go to the next video. This is another example of a child. So what I'm trying to stress here, that all seizure, all movements are not seizures. And the first child had benign myoclonic epilepsy, which happens in sleep. The moment you wake up, the child is all right. And this child has got reflux. Okay, so always remember, please make sure it's a seizure. And in your practice, you also may see children with pseudo seizures. So going back now, you have a two-year-old with seizures, sudden onset, having generalized tonic. So what will you do now? So as I said earlier, again, it's going back to basics. It's airway, breathing, circulation, high flow oxygen, measure blood glucose, confirm it's a seizure and call for help. You get the brief history, history of fever for two days, lethargy. Oxygen sats 100%, airway is maintained, cardiovascularly stable, blood glucose normal, but your IV line is tissue, it's tissue or not working. Seizures continue. So as we discussed earlier, you go for IM midazolam. Now we are on 10 minutes post IM midazolam. Seizure continues. Now you have an IV access. What will you do now? Uh, 
you go for again, you can repeat the dose of lorazepam. So at 15 minutes post IM midazolam, IV lorazepam, child is still fitting, unresponsive, slightly your respiratory rate is low, your pH slightly acidotic, you have a second line, your sodium and calcium are normal. What will you do now? You remember the second line drugs? This is exactly what we will do in our uh, unit or ER. That's what exactly I'm mentioning here. So go for phosphenitoin and levetiracetam. So at 30 minutes, uh, your uh, post IV phosphenitoin, IV levetiracetam is going in, seizure still actively continues. You call for help and consider anesthetic agents. At 45 minutes, the child is intubated with ketamine and succinylcholine. Uh, Metazolam infusion has been started, seizure stopped after intubation. So what will you do next? Uh, your question here will be to get an urgent CT head and transfer the child to PIC. I just wanted to mention, so this is a phase where you have children in early phase established refractory. So if it's the same child after coming to PICU keeps see, uh, having fits, then you are entering the phase called super refractory status ecliptics. And here the treatment becomes, uh, people have tried lots of agents. So from uh, thiopentone infusion, midazolam infusion, phenobarbitone infusion, ketamine infusion, inhalational anesthetics like isoflurane, desflurane, uh, pyridoxine, plasmapheresis, uh, IVIG. Again, here the cost is very important. Uh, depending on the cost, then you, your treatment should be shared. So Okay, now coming back, when do you wake them up? You have a child who's have been a known seizure disorder, who's had a big fit, you have intubated them, no seizures terminated. Uh, if there's no intracranial pathology and it's just a breakthrough seizure, you can wake them up after the seizure terminates. And the rest of them, it all depends on the etiology and what you're treating. Uh, EEG here is very useful to identify non-convulsive status. Some of the children after intubation, if you give them long-acting muscle relaxant, you may not know what's happening. So please remember EEG in that case, if you have facility for EEG, we use it, uh, uh, we have the facility of continuous EEG in our PICU. And uh, we also use it for burst suppression. Also, it helps identifying non-epileptic seizures. I just want to mention briefly on home cat, please remember uh, basic life support is a must for every caretaker if uh, the child with seizure disorders. If you're prescribing nasal midazolam, uh, please make sure they have uh, basic life support, understand what they're doing uh, with the written instructions and also a, a video recording of seizures. So in summary, uh, uh, time them, uh, look for treatable causes, call for help early, your ABCs, glucose, benzodiazepines, uh, phosphine, second line will be phosphenitoin, levipil, valproate, phenobarbitone, third line ketamine, anesthetic agents, and uh, give them at the right time with appropriate management. Thank you. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Radhika, who's a senior consultant in ER for her input, and also Dr. Tangavir for his input as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for... Uh a comprehensive overview of status epilepticus management. And it was uh, very much focused towards uh, emergency practitioner's perspective. Thanks for that, special thanks for that. And we will go directly to the questions. Um, there are a few interesting questions. So um, uh, the first question is, how to differentiate from tetanus? How to differentiate status epilepticus from tetanus cephalic? This is one question in the chat box. Okay. Uh, that's difficult. I think, uh, I think your benzodiazepine works in both. It's been a while since I've been seen tetanus. I'm sure I'll call for help and I'll try to get a differentiate, but I, my belief is benzodiazepines is the answer. Unless Dr. Tangavel uh, or somebody can answer on behalf of me who's seen that uh, recently. Tangavelu, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, tetanus almost now extinct now, but, sir, naturally you may not have seen. The question is how to differentiate uh, tetanus from other Status. classes. Differentiate from tetanus. Yeah. tetanus any from any tetanus. reason, uh, tetanus also, tetanus convulsions, convulsion movements also will resemble status. Only thing, till we control the seizures, difficult to identify, all the movement will be restricted because sensory will be preserved in tetanus, but not in other CNS cause of status epilepticus. But this child will have trismus, cannot talk, 
cannot even turn the head because of neck stiffness only thing which we can which is not affected is the eyeball movement we can open the eyelids and ask the child to look at the finger follow this and that side only the eyeball movement alone may not be affected if the child is able to follow your finger follow the vision that means child is conscious that is the only thing to differentiate tetanus causing recurrent seizures from meningitis or some other cns causing seizures the child is able so, to follow your finger that is in favor of tetanus so child is still conscious that's i think that's is, yeah the child is conscious so, yeah. difficult to assess this is a factor difficult to assess the sensorium but eyeball movement will help us whether the child is responding to your commands sure thank you sir thank you. uh the next uh, next question is um is it necessary that because i think uh, it is better to clarify this question is it necessary that we should wait for 5 minutes for starting aed irrespective of time taken between the start of seizure before arriving in er so this is what the guidelines uh, say so in uh, real practice i think if the child has already started fitting at home and brought to er i spoke this to dr radhika aswal who is the er consultant and she says yes while you stabilize you put the oxygen you get the try for the access you do that you have already gone through the first 3 minutes so you reaching at that stage for the you know, yes you can go for uh, but real time we really rarely you see lots of papers say that people do get it at the 5 minutes or 10 minutes it gets prolonged and prolonged so if the child a simple answer is if the child is seen fitting at home still fitting in er go ahead uh, go ahead manage and stabilize the child and get that uh, midazolam or uh, lorazepam in if at home yes 5 minutes if the child is mean known seizure disorder because we know most of them self terminate you wait for that 5 minutes thank you thank you sir um so uh, with this uh, i think we can go uh, we can wind up this session and we'll go to the next session um can we start the panel discussion sir ah uh, yes sir yeah so over to tangavelu sir for starting the panel on shock thank you sissy uh why this uh, topic of management of shock was uh, considered i just ask as uh, kalemaran said it's a one way only no we can't get the reply but i can ask all the viewers in the last one year how many case of shock you identified in your office practice i feel that even as an office practitioner i feel it's easier to diagnose an alter level of consciousness and respiratory distress rather than shock because shock is a very silent one we are likely to miss that's why this topic has been chosen i have four learned uh, panelists with me to answer my questions dr reshma dr kartik narayan dr ramesh kumar and dr vasant kumar i'll introduce them one by one dr reshma she is the md pediatrics and dm pediatric critical care from chandigarh so pediatric intensivist she is working in vellore one of the intensive care centers she is a chief intensivist there one sentence i want to tell about her is during the flood in 2015 in chennai we went there to pick her up from her home completely flooded in waist deep water she walked across almost few meters to come to the main road to join us and, and looking after the icu in a very critical times that is a commitment she has next uh, panelist is dr vasant kumar again md pediatrics and dnb pediatrics and fmb pediatric critical care he has special interest in cardiopulmonary interactions and ecmo and other extra corporeal therapy is currently consultant in picu cardiothoracic unit in apollo children's hospital and also ecmo coordinator again one sentence about him he is a very friendly person he was when he was working with us was acting like a friend between bridge between the pediatricians and pediatric post graduates and pacu third person dr karthik narayanan he is currently the md dm pediatric critical care currently the pediatric consultant in rainbow children's hospital chennai best in young investigator award in the world federation of intensive care and critical care societies icmr research grant awarded published many original research articles invited faculty in national pediatric critical care and emergency conferences one sentence about him is very smart person once he shared an x ray with me there is a child with a clinical diagnosis of bronchiolitis was brought in 
saturation was 85 even with oxygen child saturation did not improve and everybody was thinking whether to do a non invasive ventilation or intubate from the x ray he picked up that the right ventricular the apex is look like a right ventricular apex and led to the diagnosis of a cyanotic heart disease rather than going into managing a child with a bronchiolitis fourth panelist dr ramesh kumar is an associate professor of pediatrics in jipmer puducherry he has got many award and honors including balagol raj award endowment gold medal award major amit chand gold medal award best research paper of royal australian college of physicians st acharya endowment gold medal finalist again one important quality i admire in him is despite being involved in high end research like even icp monitoring invasive icp monitoring in is during his course in chandigarh still he retains habit of periodic assessment triangle and step wise assessment of the child who is critically ill as per the pal score that is one of the admirable quality which i look at him from this this uh, panel discussion will go for about 50 minutes first 5 minutes i'll just present recognition initial management of shock followed by the panelist they will present and discuss different types of shock so shock by definition is inadequate circulation of blood through an organ or a part of the body leading to reduced cardiac output reduced delivery of oxygen to vital organs one word is shock means reduced delivery of oxygen that is a important word that is why any child coming with shock in er we don't start an iv bolus or iv access first simultaneously do everything but first thing is to start an oxygen this is a social emergency you know we have faced last in lockdown and other place other times no water no petrol no milk so what are all the possible reasons i am just trying to identify various cause of shock through this either no water mean there is no stock in the store no petrol means our stock is there but there are no distribution because lorry is on strike the third reason is lorry may be running but all bridges and roads are blocked by strike that is third reason fourth reason lorry may be running no block but heavily leaking from lorry the all the petrol and water are leaked outside so that it is not properly delivered we want to we want to bring it in into the medical emergency where there is reduced oxygen delivery to tissues because of inadequate circulation reduced cardiac output reduced delivery of oxygen again we want to extrapolate the same causes no stock in the store means hypovolemic shock because of diarrhea volume is intracellular volume is reduced hypovolemic shock lorry is running no block but leaking heavily because of poor maintenance that can happen in dengue where there is a capillary leak partly in septic shock shock is there but there is no distribution because of lorry strike that is comparable to cardiogenic shock sudden increase in the need that is occurs in vasodilators in septic shock lorry is running everything is available but all bridges and roads are blocked by strike that is obstructive shock so shock is a clinical diagnosis clinically shock is assessed by evaluating heart rate blood pressure right. end organ perfusion level of consciousness and the quality right. of peripheral right. pulses capillary refill urine output and acid base status of course right. if it is available right. so the popular periodic assessment triangle first assess the airway or appearance which tells you about the level of consciousness breathing and circulation here the alter consciousness is easily identified by the parents because the child is sleeping too long prolonged sleepiness not getting up for feeds respiratory disease also easily identified by the parents because it makes lot of noise but shock is very silent parents cannot identify even a doctor who is not ready to touch a child will likely to miss it so make it a habit to touch and assess the peripheral perfusion unless we touch and see we will completely miss the diagnosis of shock it takes only less than a minute to assess the five parameters pulse volume and rate preferably dorsally speed is then post tbl capillary refill time color and temperature of the extremities respiratory rate and level of consciousness in the form of fbu i repeat this word from the dengue who guideline book only a trained humans can perform this five vital functions not even a costless machine can do this so we have to touch and see the child to assess the perfusion to diagnose shock the feel in the central pulses simultaneous palpation of the central peripheral pulses capillary refill time and appearance child may be drowsy and have level of reduced level of consciousness and breathing child may have fast breathing because of hepatitis tachypnea issue due to metabolic acidosis in shock how do you classify shock as per the pals we classify the shock based on severity as compensated shock and hypotensive shock type they are classified as hypovolemic distributive cardiogenic and obstructive 
But look at his picture. This this is compensator shark. He's well away from the dangerous cliff. When he further worsens further, here the hypotensive shock occurs. The next minute is likely to fall into the trap of cardiac arrest. So time interval between the hypotensive shock and the cardiac arrest is very small. Potential for rapid deterioration is quite large. So we must be able to identify the child in the compensator shock itself. And the child has got even normal BP and has features of shock or narrow pulse pressure. Hypertensive shock is a further deterioration where the blood pressure is low, very advanced stage where it's difficult to treat and the prognosis is not good. Hypolemic shock common causes acute diarrhea disease, blood loss, diabetic ketosidosis, distributive shock, septic shock, anaphylactic shock, and neurogenic shock. Cardiac shock can occur secondary to congenital heart disease or myocarditis. Obstructive shock mostly happens in hospitalized situation, pneumothorax and pericardial effusion. Can you identify the type of shock in the ER itself? Yes, just before starting the bolus or even starting the bolus and reassessing. It's very much possible. If a child presents with shock with the different history of fluid loss in the form of diarrhea, polyuria, having dehydration, raised respiratory rate, not work of breathing, that is hypolemic shock. If it is a child presenting with uh, fast breathing, respiratory distress and bounding pulses and infective focus, septic shock. A child who has got respiratory distress, disproportionate tachycardia, edema, gallop or murmur, it's cardiogenic shock. The child is presenting with afebrile stays with shock. It is more likely to be dengue with bradycardia, narrow pulse pressure, rashes, more likely to be dengue. So all the, we must be able to identify the type of shock in the emergency room itself. We'll go a little into the basic. The primary goal of the cardiorespiratory system is to deliver the oxygen. So oxygen is measured in two ways. One is oxygen content and oxygen delivery. These are not very little more uncommon way of describing oxygen except in PAC. So oxygen content is the amount of oxygen carried in the hemoglobin and oxygen dissolved in plasma. Both put together it is roughly about 20 ml per 100 ml. I don't want to go into the complicated formula, but if you look at it, this is 1.34 into hemoglobin and then this is saturation, this is PAO2. So, so by modifying these three, we can achieve increased oxygen content. That's what I'm trying to say. Oxygen content multiplied by the cardiac output will be the oxygen delivery. The Q is a cardiac output is reduced in shock. Naturally, the oxygen delivery is also reduced in shock. So, in a child with shock, the main issue is reduced oxygen supply to the tissues, causing tissue hypoxia, leading to organ injury. So, two important systems, respiratory and cardiac system. What the respiratory system does is, it loads the oxygen from atmosphere into the lungs, into the capillaries, into the pulmonary veins, so that the oxygen content is maintained in the respiratory system by 20 ml per 100 ml. But circulatory system delivers the oxygen, carry and deliver to tissues in the form of 1000 ml per minute. So both maintain the oxygen delivery. Blood pressure depends on cardiac output and system resistance. Cardiac output depends on stroke volume and heart rate. Stroke volume depends on preload, myocardial contract and afterload. This is a very nice graphics, but see here, all our intervention for shock correction is based on the physiological principles. So oxygen fluid bolus increase the preload, vasoactive agents increase the myocardial contractility and after reducing agents when the child has got increased afterload resistance. But remember only two, two things are measured, clinically measured, which are blood pressure and heart rate. The general management, before we go into specific management and recognition of shock, any child with shock recognition is important, oxygen ensure airway patency, need for respiratory support, Start a vascular excess, start a fluid resuscitation, either 10 to 20 ml per kg of isotonic saline. In some situation, we use a low volume boluses, as in dengue, cardiogenic shock, DKN, SAM. Vasoactive agents, correction of metabolic disturbances, organ system support, and specific treatment are other steps. Do you think false assessment is possible in a busy clinic? I just recorded this video in the clinic. A pulse based assessment is still possible. It won't take more than one minute. If you look at this video, Child is entering into the clinic after removing the shirt. The child has got good eye contact, interest in the surroundings. Looking at me. So appearance is good, conscious child. Now I have opportunity to count the respiratory rate. I counted, it comes around 32. I don't find any retractions, no noisy breathing. So breathing also normal. I talking to the child, make some interesting noise and check the pulses and skip the CRT capping. Measure the temperature of the extremities. It looks warm. So all the 
appearance breathing and circulation can be very well assessed within a span of 1 minute if everything all these three are normal is absolutely we can exclude a serious illness in this child may not require anything more than simple paracetamol so this is what uh, the questions were raised earlier all the practitioners can undergo this course iep als e map course where this is a one day course all the concept of pulse are taught without any examination so please take this opportunity to undergo the pulse course now we'll go into the specific uh, discussion of different types of shock the first panelist i invite is dr vasant kumar i present a case scenario to him this is a 6 months old child vasant can you present your uh, and stop sharing you can present your uh, slides okay sir me audible and slides visible right sir yes sir audible and okay. visible yes sir slide show yes sir huh. yeah this is a six months old child brought with fever refusal of feeds lethargy diarrhea but no blood in the stools and abdominal distension we look at the vital signs tachycardia bounding pulses white pulse pressure tachypnea grunting no eye contact cvs examination no gallop bounding peripheral pulses with this i'll hand over the child to vasant asking many questions so what is the physiological status how are you going to manage how many fluid bolus are there many questions are there i request dr vasant kumar to present this slides in the form of question answer so that it is easily understandable over to dr vasant kumar thank you sir thank you sir uh, you have given me a sick child i'll hope to stabilize the child and clarify the issues with respect to the shock management so here uh, this is the child which dr tangvelu had uh, given to us so first question is what is the physiological status so for that just have a look at the child on just looking at the child you can identify that the child looks sick there's some abdominal distension the child looks dull so the first interpretation is the child is looking sick so identification of sick child is very important so you are the first look of the child you identify that the child is sick and you are, there are clinical pointers to the diagnosis which you are going to make here you can see this is an infant less than 1 year of age 6 month old so that is a high risk so you'll have to be even more alert so any infant present in thing with fever so you think of serious infection or sepsis so initially started with some loose stools and some uh, noisy breathing refusal of feeds so uh, these are some pointers towards a serious illness so you find here there is some tachycardia and bounding pulses and hypotension so tachycardia bounding pulses and hypotension points towards the hypotensive shock and with respiratory system you can find there is tachypnea work of breathing and grunting and hypoxia so presence of grunting hypoxia and lethargy or altered sensorium points towards respiratory failure and it is not respiratory distress because of grunting and hypoxia so you have a sick child who is hypotensive and in respiratory shock an infant with a febrile illness so this likely to be a septic shock so first we'll go on to the what are the para clinical parameters of shock as we all know first is cold periphery you touch the child you feel the child is cold and crt is prolonged 2 uh, seconds is the normal crt you have to remember that even 3 seconds is prolonged crt so cold periphery is with prolonged crt if hypothermia is ruled out you have to think of shock in that case usually if it's hypothermia you reassess the baby after warming the child so the most important parameter one i mean new value which you have to remember is like parameter is tachycardia tachycardia is the earliest sign and the most sensitive sign for shock if tachycardia is there there is something abnormal in the child so always remember suppose if you have uh, ruled out fever pain anxiety and still the child continues to be tachycardia think of sepsis as a uh, shock as a criteria i mean one of the symptoms so along with tachycardia feeble pulses sensorium irritability can isolated be a indication of poor cerebral perfusion low urine output indicates poor kidney perfusion and sometimes you can have bounding pulses and white pulse pressure with flash crt that is again an indicator of sepsis or septic shock so here you can see i have never mentioned bp as a parameter for shock so that means blood pressure is not the only criteria of shock it can be normal it can be high or it can even be low always remember in shock the bp can be high too and always measure with an appropriate size cuff so cold periphery is prolonged crt in tachycardia yes. so why is it septic shock and why not other side of types of shock as i already said this is an infant with a febrile illness and you have a warm wide and bounding pulses 
so that points towards a septic shock and uh, you don't have features of other shock there is no significant volume loss like two or three diarrhea episodes only are there no gallop or hepatomegaly which rules out cardiac cause suppose you have a child with cold shock cold peripheries and narrow pulse pressure and tachycardia with hepatomegaly and gallop it usually points towards a cardiogenic component another child suppose with cold peripheries and tachycardia have a history of significant volume loss the history of volume loss should be significant the child should be pouring stools not just one or two episodes of stool that points towards hypovolemic component in commonly in our emergency we usually get the sign of cold peripheries so how do we approach if there is cold peripheries if there is cold peripheries with prolonged crt once you have ruled out hypothermia to think of shock especially more so if there is tachycardia but simultaneously you will have to rule out other triggers of tachycardia like fever pain anxiety so other things are ruled out and you find feeble pulses definitely there is shock without any doubt so cold peripheries in shock so here if you have hepatomegaly crepes edema or gallop it goes towards cardiogenic if there is history of significant volume loss it goes towards hypovolemic so if all these are not there then you think of plus these underlying signs of fever and signs of infection and the focus you suspect septic shock always remember when you see the child for the first time you may not be able to clearly make out sometimes a cardiogenic shock may not have the repetitions or the so much of edema or gallop may not be difficult to auscultate when there is tachycardia so usually after a fluid challenge if you see the child is worsening after a fluid challenge it can be a cardiogenic shock then there can be a doubt whether it is septic shock or a dengue shock both can have cold peripheries so in that case in septic shock you usually have a febrile illness high grade fever spikes running in dengue as you all know the problem happens only in the afebrile phase so shock in a afebrile phase usually point towards dengue and septic shock children are usually sick looking and this disproportionate tachycardia for 1 degree temperature 10 only should be the increase in heart rate if it increases disproportionately then there is a worry and dengue patients can be sick or they can come walking also adolescent boys walking and the heart rate may not have this tachycardia response may not be there so sometimes we may get fooled by it so we we'll always have to be careful so the septic shock the pulse pressure can be narrow or wide as in this case it was a wide pulse pressure but in dengue it is always an narrow pulse pressure wide pulse pressure sort of rules out a dengue illness dengue type of shock the counts can be any type in septic shock in dengue as you all know it has leukopenia high hematocrit with a low platelet crp will be negative in dengue and crp will be elevated in septic shock usually septic shock will have a focus here if you see the child has a diarrhea and some distended abdomen so ga is a focus in dengue you may not have a particular focus usually dengue is endemic in our place but sometimes it you can based on the number of cases we get the seasonal trend will help us in guiding so what instruction you given a sick child your resident is there asking you how to manage this child so how do you go about it you ask him to collect the leads we pick up appropriate and such scope as far as already said you start oxygen nrm always remember no nasal prongs it is nrm at 10 liters per minute and the child is in respiratory failure so i'll keep my things of niv and intubation also ready at that time so i'll secure two iv lines any sick child two iv lines preferably blue this child was chubby so in that case iv line access may be difficult so in that case i like called already discussed three times i try iv line if i don't get i'll go ahead direct with io line where you can give anything including vasopressors so after i put the iv line i take samples any sick child like even a shock child should need a blood gas vbg is enough along with a lactate and blood sugar has to be taken so we are thinking infection here so i'll take cbc crp and two sets of blood culture at admission so i start fluids because the baby is in shock give antibiotics give supportive measures and do re- respective imaging always remember to counsel the child saying that the child is sick and may need icu admission at the beginning itself so as you see the ch- resident doctor has lots of work to do here along with the nurse so what i would suggest is in septic shock there are so many things to be done but as you all know you have seen this comedy you know by vadivel and parthiban there is something called give and take policy so to easy and minimize so many work to be done we should not because of the so much work we should not miss what has to be done definitely so that is called give three and take three so you'll have to give three and take three what all will you give you'll have to give oxygen via nrm in one line you give a fluid bolus in the other line you give a broad spectrum antibiotics so what all will you take you'll take blood cultures you'll take a vbg with a lactate and you'll take a urinary catheter to measure the urine output so all these give three take three has to be done within the first hour so you have to take without forgetting and keep giving without remembering so this you have to remember always so next comes fluid bolus the baby is in hypotensive shock so what is the rational for giving a fluid bolus and the other questions which i have mentioned so the main rational is so septic shock is a type of distributive shock but in addition where you have capillary leak the fluid doesn't stay inside and sort of leaks out but in addition to it there can be element of hypovolemia 
and there can be a component of myocardial dysfunction so there are three components not only one component in septic shock so by giving fluids we are trying to correct the hypovolemic component and a part of the vasodilatation so more you give fluid the capillary leak will happen and it will worsen further and for myocardial dysfunction more fluids are obviously harmful so by fluid we are addressing only one component of the problem in septic shock this is very important to know so how fluid to give how much to give based on the latest pediatric 2020 septic shock guidelines they recommend is your initial resuscitation should be based on whether you have an icu facility proper icu facility available or not what is icu facility it doesn't make sense no what is icu facility what icu meaning you should have a place where you can mechanically ventilate the child you have an ultrasound machine where you can assess the of intravascular status the cardiac function and where you have facility for invasive blinds so you have a facility there or you the child can go to a place where the icu facility is available so based on that the treatment will depend suppose you do not have a icu facility then the uh, fluid management will state accordingly i'll tell you how it goes suppose you have a icu facility available with you then you start with usual 10 to 20 ml, 20 ml per kg fluid bolus and in one hour you can reach till 40 to 60 ml per kg fluid by the time you give fluid bolus you catheterize the child and watch for signs of improvement if the child is improving it is good if it is worsening then stop the fluid bolus remember just that the guideline says 40 to 60 not necessary that all children should receive the 40 to 60 suppose you do not have an icu facility and there is no hypotension remember very clear if there is no icu facility and the baby is in compensated shock that is there is no hypotension the guideline strongly recommend against giving fluid bolus so you will not give a fluid bolus and directly start only maintenance fluids in this situation but if hypotension is there it is like dr tangavel sir slide you are hanging at the cliff he is going to arrest any time so in that case anyway you will have to give fluid 10 to 20 ml per kg fluid bolus if hypotension is there irrespective of whether icu is there or no icu is there you start fluid bolus saving the life is a priority that time but the maximum volume at that time will be only 40 ml per kg just to summarize you don't have an icu and you are in compensated shock i will not give a fluid bolus i will directly start maintenance fluid in hypotensive shock icu is there not there whatever it is you will give 10 to 20 ml per kg more so at 20 ml per kg at the start if there is no icu available the total fluid is basically restricted to only 40 ml per kg with icu available is 40 to 60 ml per kg just have a look at this slide once so what type of fluid will you give so i can either give crystalloids or colloids crystalloids are the preferred and they are effective as equally as colloids so because of the problem with normal saline minor problems of hyperchloremic acidosis and aka balanced salt solution like plasma light is preferred but if you have normal saline in a er it is still can be preferred so there are few problems with it but definitely a big no to colloids or starch it should not be used because of the problems with aka and coagulopathy so what is the problem with fluid why are we worried out excess fluid so as i already said hypovolemia is only one component there are other components of capillary leak and myocardial dysfunction which can worsen the problem so more capillary leak all this fluid which you give more boluses will leak into the lungs and in the abdomen if it leaks into the lung there will be fluid overload and increased needs of mechanical ventilation so your ventilation days will increase there is pulmonary edema heart failure abdominal compartment syndrome will happen so because of this overall icu stay will increase and your mortality will increase so here you can see the fluid usually in septic shock vasodilatation is predominantly venodilatation where your veins will expand 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 and whatever fluids you give it sort of gets dumped in and bees in the reservoir rather than going translating as increase in preload so this is a problem with excess fluid which you give so how will you monitor the patient clinical monitoring most important one parameter is heart rate if the heart rate declines with your fluid that means the baby is responding if the heart rate is worsening there is tachypnea which is happening which means the fluid what you are giving is leaking into the lungs and the parameters are worsening pp is worsening there is no urine output that means the child is worsening so there can be a response there can be worsening if the baby is worsening that means there is either a cardiac problem or the disease as such is worsening or there is fluid overload so in that case you think of early referral and consider starting inotrope if there is no response it can be either you have to give more fluids or that is the fluid is not helping the baby or you have to think of vasoactive but in either case you have to think of referral so target again blood pressure is not the target the tissue perfusion is only target which means you feel the cold should become warm now the peripheries pulses should be felt the urine output should be at least 1 ml per kg so we are not concentrating only on macro circulation the target is micro circulation which means cold peripheries 
feeling the pulse crt should be okay and if you can do a lactate the lactates should try to come back at least in a declining trend so which inotropes should be used so the word inotrope itself is not right because all do not increase the cardiac activity some are noradrenaline does not have any inotropy at all so vasoactives are a preferred word what do you use the guidelines recommend do not recommend any specific line a specific first line drug they say if you have epinephrine it is preferred over dopamine if you have norepinephrine it is preferred again over dopamine so epinephrine or norepinephrine is the first drug why is they saying no dopamine the problem with dopamine is increases the tachycardia tachycardia is not a small problem it is a major problem the heart rate increases your myocardial oxygen demand is increasing oxygen should get delivered to the tissues it should not go and remain inside the heart itself the heart should not utilize it so it increases the myocardial oxygen demand it has a lot of immunological side effects increases infection risk and some endocrine effects so there is a question i have only dopamine with me i don't have any other drugs can i use dopamine or not so dopamine fans do not get disappointed dopamine can be still used when others you do not have adrenaline or noradrenaline you can use dopamine but start at low dose don't directly start at 15 mics 20 mics 2.5 5 mics 2.5 and 5 mics of dopamine will also work please remember that so finally what do i use adrenaline or not adrenaline you said dopamine only if adrenaline or noradrenaline are there so it is based on your preference and based on cardiac function and whatever local availability suppose you have a wide warm bounding pulses like this child the index case as you all know the venous reservoir is wide so you try to narrow it by veno constriction which norepinephrine does and based on availability and practice you can use norepinephrine in bounding pulses clear cut but suppose you have a child who is suspecting cardiac uh, dysfunction or the child is worsening after a fluid challenge you can prefer adrenaline in this case in many places in peripheries adrenaline is much cheaper than time tested drug so you can try adrenaline also as a first line so any drug you can use either adrenaline or noradrenaline anything you can use so these are the some of the factors which will favor the usage of one over the other so can i give inotropes in peripheral line so i am starting adrenaline but i do not have central line you can give provided till the time you wait for a central venous access or if the access is not available definitely you can use in peripheral line without any doubt what we usually do we give suppose noradrenaline also can be given dopamine can be given dopamine can be given adrenaline noradrenaline anything can be given noradrenaline can be given we can use a ejv external jugular vein which is preferable we use a dilution this is the dilution we use 0.1 mg per kg in 50 ml of id at 3 ml per hour if you give it will give 0.1 mics per kg but always remember to check for free flow the flow should happen freely and always watch for extra vasation the child may be out of shock but will have a uh, ulcer here in the hand or the neck so that you have to be careful so categorizing cold shock or warm shock is it still practiced now so cold shock means what that is a baby is vaso constricted which means the systemic vascular response is high resistance is high so in that case if you start noradrenaline the vaso constriction will increase and the shock will worsen so that is the concept in warm shock it is vaso dilated which means the systemic vascular resistance is low so in that case like adults noradrenaline will be the drug of choice but what they have found is whether it is cold or warm it does not make any distinction at all even in, by invasive monitoring devices they found that many of the cold patients from outside are not cold inside that means you think they have a high systemic vascular resistance but from inside they have a low systemic vascular resistance that's why this noradrenaline had come to the place so irrespective of whatever type of shock if you give whatever i mean if you give noradrenaline even for a cold type of thing it does not cause any problem because as such inside it is a vasodilated state which is actually happening so that's why i put this all of them and kamal veliye mirgam ulle kadaval the outside is not seen inside there may be something different that is called a clinical and vasoactive mismatch so it usually does not cause any harm so antibiotics so the right time should be within 1 hour in septic shock each hour delay increases the mortality by 7% so always in er itself the first dose of antibiotics have to be given and so how do you give it so you will have to keep the antibiotic stocked in your er then only you can give the antibiotic so that is very important give a right choice broad spectrum for a community acquired do not overdo the antibiotic also the right dose if i have aki there is no urine output can i give the first dose full dose or not yes you can give full dose because the volume of distribution in septic shock is more you can give a full dose at the first dose later on you can adjust the renal dose and always remember bacterial infection alone will not cause septic shock viral covid can also cause septic shock like feature even fungal infection dengue is a separate topic anyway so how commonly you do you see septic shock in our hospital usually 
the problem with septic shock which we find is it's first is under diagnosed and there is a fear to label as septic shock because we have to do so many things take blood cultures which are all costly investigations many times what we do we do not label them as septic shock and we hesitate so the incidence will be around 5 to 30% it can be anywhere around this range but what happens is many places including our hospital it has been labeled as dehydration where we give fluid bolus and give antibiotics and take cultures but it is labeled as fever with dehydration rather or fever with some pneumonia and dehydration rather than being labeled as septic shock so all management of septic shock is done but it is not being labeled as septic shock so what do you do if the shock is refractory to fluids and vasoactive how do you proceed so you have done everything for the child despite that the shock is still persisting catecholamine refractory first this source control very very important you identify the source in this child the abdomen is distended so you will have to identify the abdomen as a source and do what is required for it second is also source control third is also source control so source control is the key so what are the different sources is one is suppose you have n pi ma you can do a tap and relieve the drainage suppose you have abscess anywhere you can relieve it here this child had a surgical abdomen so where you can do a surgical removal of the this thing surgical so surgeon has to be involved earlier so you have to call him and push him to do drain we had a neck abscess recently for which we had to do a surgical drainage so other things are adrenal insufficiency where hydrocortin has to be given abdominal compartment syndrome always remember the fluid goes into the abdomen so bladder pressure and you can do measures to relieve the abdominal pressure that can be done obstructive shock again echo will help occult cardiac dysfunction cardiac dysfunction can be occult sometimes so again echo will help so the other reasons hypothyroidism other reasons but usually remember just one point source control so summary now the tendency is more to do less than to do more for the baby so that is called as intensivist approach so you give less fluids but i'm not saying don't give give titrated based on the response so what will you give balanced salt solution if you have or else normal saline do not use colloids unless there is hypotension if you are in a working in a peripheral center do not give rush to give fluids early vasoactives especially if you feel the fluid is intolerant or there is evidence of myocardial dysfunction go ahead with inotropes if there is myocardial dysfunction you will go with adrenaline but if there is no myocardial dysfunction you can prefer any of the inotropes and vasoactive agents i always give less dose of vasoactives if you are in a very high dose that means there is something wrong that means either you are missing something that's why you are needing more so in that case think of early referral so less invasive use peripheral line vasoactive you can use ejv dbg is enough there is no need to do abg at all if possible try get an radial access in centers wherever it is possible the early radial line is very crucial early antibiotic always monotherapy is enough there is no need to give polytherapy unless you have a recent admission or immune suppressed baby less category of third generation cephalosporin is enough most of the time and niv or hf is not that you give 40 ml per kg the baby has to get intubated there is no need for intubation immediately so niv or hf and these preferred and early identification is a key the more early you identify the risk of mortality comes down significantly so if you identify the patient at sepsis itself you can prevent the baby from going into septic shock and always remember the give 3 and take 3 thank you thank you vasant uh, can you stop sharing uh, we'll yeah. ask uh, reshma to start presenting a slide thank you very sure. much uh, vasant you have just presented every aspect of uh, septic shock like a sadapti train almost covered all the questions so Sir, we, are, we, we are already uh, 33 minutes uh, uh, of panel discussion completed so we have 27 minutes more so to keep a tag on time sir. okay thank you reshma Yes, sir. Can you uh, see the slide, yeah, sir? Yeah, I can make it a slide show. Yes, sir. So now, from septic shock, move on to the another type of common shock is dengue shock. This is a nine-year-old child. Present biphasic fever. Every word is important. The child is drenched in rain. A fever last well. A fever brain for last twelve hours. Present with vomiting and abdominal pain. Platelet count is dropped from one point seven five to forty three thousand. Child is referred to us. Child has conscious answering questions, has a normal heart rate, and has features of shock with hepatomegaly. With this, I'll just hand over to Reshma with a list of questions for her to present the uh, slides in the form of question answer. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. I request other people to please mute their uh, uh, mics. Yeah, so we'll go on, go ahead with the case. So we see that this nine-year-old child has come in uh, with the biphasic illness and has had some 
phase of a febrile period and has now come with vomiting and abdominal pain and she has some investigations done outside which is showing falling platelet count and uh, the uh, other complaint is that there is decreased urine output she's come to the er and has ha had a pro uh, postural syncope so on uh, general examination she is uh, found to be conscious and she is answering the questions and her respiratory system seems to be okay but when we look at the uh, cardiovascular system we see that the, uh, she has a heart rate of 70 her peripheral uh, her central pulses are well felt but the uh, peripheral pulses are not and she has a prolonged cft and she has a, a, a maintained blood pressure however we notice a narrow pulse pressure here uh, disability wise she is found to be slightly lethargic and on examination systemic examination there is uh, hepatomegaly and her skin is showing uh, signs of purpura so uh, her final physiological categorization uh, will be that of a compensated shock though the uh, blood pressure is maintained it will be the last one to fall as we have already been um, um, educated by uh, Tangavelu sir and wasn't also covered in detail about the shock uh, 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 pathophysiology and progression however in this child we also see that there's impaired peripheral perfusion in the form of prolonged CFT and the pulse pressure is also narrow. So looking at the case scenario, we, we, we see a lot of these cases were coming into our hospitals during come the rainy season around June, July uh, to October, November. And we, uh, we can identify that this is probably a case of severe dengue. And the mechanism of shock in this is usually hypovolemic because of capillary leak and third spacing, which, uh, which leads to uh, the following manifestation. So what could be the possible differential diagnosis diagnosis other than dengue in this child. Other than severe dengue, we have to consider other viral hemorrhagic fever like chikungunya, which off and on we do come across. And um, West Nile virus is also uh, one such thing that we have to keep in mind around, uh, I, I think, um, uh, uh, um, uh, on and off in, um, uh, in Gujarat, Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh, that area also they keep seeing on and off West Nile virus. Overwhelming bacterial sepsis is another possibility and Vasant and Tangavelu sir both have highlighted the differences between bacterial septic shock and uh, dengue shock so i'm not going to uh, the details of that another thing to keep in mind is corrupt typhus and uh, malaria these can also occur as co-infections that is something to be kept in mind so um, uh, because we are uh, because uh, next over the course of next around uh, uh, eight to uh, nine minutes, I'll be covering um, a dengue, severe dengue shock. So um, uh, we look at the um, timeline of illness. So uh, here we see that during the febrile phase, child can have. Uh, potentially dehydration because of decreased oral intake or vomiting. But we see that in three to seven days of illness, uh, there is a possibility of them uh, developing third spacing and that is called the critical phase where there is excessive capillary permeability leading to shock. Other thing that happens is um, thrombocytopenia and capillary fragility as well, falling platelet count also leading to bleeding. So bleeding is another cause for shock in dengue, but most common reason is capillary uh, permeability leading to third spacing and um, hypovolemic shock. Uh, so um, what are the investigations to be done in such a child? So in every child whom we suspect dengue, this, these investigations have listed out for a district level hospital. So every single child has to have a, a complete blood count, a, a pack cell volume that is the hematocrit. And of course, in every child presenting with shock, we, we need to check the capillary blood glucose. Diagnostic workup will depend on the availability of the same that is either the NS1 or IgM, IgG that will based on uh, based on where, what is available where. But others, other other important investigations are blood grouping, typing, cross-matching because these children have a high likely possibility of developing major uh, hemorrhage. That is one thing. Another thing is if the shock is refractory to crystalloids or colloids we might, and there is a falling PCV, they will have to consider whole blood transfusion. So we'll have to send the blood grouping cross-matching at the outset. Other uh, investigations are as listed, coagulogram, chest x-ray to look for any uh, um, third spacing that is pleural FP arterial blood gas with lactate is important one is to identify hypoxemia, uh, hypoxemia other lactate, to look at the um, microvascular um, sorry the uh, microcirculatory perfu uh, perfusion uh, other organ end organ uh, functions like renal functions liver functions and cardiac enzymes ecg echocardiogram are also important so when a 
child presents in febrile phase what are the red flag signs that should alert us that the child can possibly proceed to have a more severe illness are the warning signs that have been listed out so uh, uh, repeated vomiting poor oral intake decreased urine output acute abdominal pain mucosal bleeding third space fluid accumulation in the form of pleural effusion or ascites rising hematocrit or falling platelet count without any clinical symptoms also have to uh, we, uh, this this we can identify only by sending the lab investigations so we have to keep all of this in mind other situations where we have to admit children are uh, the high risk population that is the infants obese children and those with comorbidities like hemolytic anemia or uh, uh, kidney uh, kidney diseases or other immunosuppressed conditions so these children with dengue we'll have to keep a high watch uh, on them uh, other poor social situations like they have to travel from far and they have uh, no caretakers these are the other conditions where we'll have to admit the child for um, um, observation is there any scoring system for severity so there are some studies that have been done in southeast asian countries like uh, uh, thailand vietnam one such study has shown that during the febrile uh, phase itself if uh, we start seeing um, uh, third spacing that is increasing hematocrit or the platelet count starts falling or there are features of coagulopathy those are uh, markers that the child can progress into septic uh, in, into the uh, uh, shock um, uh, uh, the other another study shows that hepatomegaly is a very strong marker for predicting uh, severity of illness other features are high, uh, obviously hematocrit leukopenia is something we have to keep in mind leukopenia and thrombocytopenia often precedes the um, uh, capillary leak phase so that is something to keep in mind so at a primary or secondary healthcare facility our um, we what we do when a child presents is we assess by history examination and basic investigations as i have listed out we make the diagnosis and we assess which phase and what severity of disease it fits into and we manage accordingly so if it's a probable dengue with no risk factors that is there is no the, none of the warning signs or risk factors we advise ambulatory care and uh, however if they have risk factors we have to admit for inpatient management when a child presents with severe dengue that is shock bleeding or other features of uh, organ dysfunction we have to urgently uh, admit uh, either admit in our center if we have all the facilities or we refer them to an appropriate center which is equipped to man uh, manage the similar uh, situation so for the index patient who has presented with sorry uh, who is present who has presented with compensated shock we manage with uh, so start with abc um, uh, so uh, start high flow oxygen 100% oxygen with non rebreathing mask so the uh, I, this this slide is just about the uh, fluid management so the first uh, fluid of choice is isotonic crystalloids that is either normal saline or ringer lactate you start at 10 ml per kg per hour uh, you send a, a hematocrit before and after this bolus and you assess vital parameters if you see improvement then over the course of next few hours you slowly taper down the fluids as as shown in the uh, figure however if there's no improvement you can try one more crystalloid bolus or uh, maximum up to 30 ml per kg that is uh, that is what 20 to 30 ml per kg and there is no uh, uh, improvement we go ahead with colloids so um, colloids uh, are given at 10 ml per kg per hour for 1 to 2 hours there is no improvement you have to look at something called abcs the a is for acidosis b is for bleeding c is for hypocalcemia or cardiac dysfunction and s is sugar that is hypoglycemia another thing to uh, remember is in, when a child has received such a uh, high volume of fluids there can be third spacing in the abdominal compartments and that can cause intra abdominal hypertension so that also might have to be relieved that can be a cause for refractory hypotension uh, refractory shock in a child presenting with hypoten hypotension we go ahead more aggressively but still we see, uh, we see that the uh, fluid administration rate is slower than what it is in septic shock it is over 15 minutes and then um we we review the first pcv if there was a high pcv and there is no improvement in uh, shock after the first bolus then we go ahead with colloid if there is no improvement go ahead with another bolus of colloid so uh, again we have to remember the abcs and the intra abdominal hypertension if there is in, uh, further in any step 
uh, there is um, uh, improvement, then you start coming down on the fluids as uh, shown in the figure. So colloids we consider when the when the when you have given 20 to 30 ml per kg of crystalloid and the child uh, continues to be in shock with the high hematocrit. Which one to give? Gelatin, dextrin, and hydroxyethyl starch have been found to be similar in efficacy, in, uh, but however, dextrin has higher incidence of allergic reactions in the form of minor events like fever or rigors. Theoretically, though it can impact coagulation and cause aka it has not been found to be of clinical significance by various studies. 5% albumin is also something we can, uh, we can consider. When we have to start inotropes, so around 10 to 30 percent studies have shown that 10 to 30 percent of dengue shock can have associated myocardial dysfunction. So we give around, uh, so that is something to keep in mind. So, uh, however, again, fluids that is crystalloid followed by colloid are still the first line, uh, still the first line, uh, not the inotropes, as opposed to what we see in septic shock. And another thing uh, to keep in mind is when we have to induce for intubation, when we give pseudoanalgesic drugs for intubation, or when they have life-threatening hypotension as a temporary me measure, we can give inotropes. What respiratory support to give? All children should get high flow oxygen. NIV, we, sh we should consider with appropriate interface if we have that facility. Again, like in asthma, like in diabetic ketosis, acidosis, invasive ventilation comes as a last resort if the child is not tolerating NIV and continues to have hypoxemia, altered sensorium, refractory shock. These are the conditions where we have to consider. Obviously, when a child is gasping, we'll require invasive ventilation. Again, this is a high-risk intubation. It has to be done by the senior most person on the team. Lower doses of pseudoanalgesia drugs and prefer to give ketamine and fentanyl and inotrope should be on flow very intubation when a child comes with both shock and respiratory distress what modification in therapy to be done we have to be highly watchful for fluid overload fluid overload in this in in the in the shock is basically what I mean is the um, extravascular fluid overload, uh, something we have to keep in mind. So we should always be more watchful for uh, overhydration and overzealous fluid therapy. Our target should be a just appropriate urine output that is 0.5 to, 0 .0, 0 .5 to 1 ml per kg per hour urine output is fine for dengue shock. So if we, we see that if they touch around 2 ml per kg per hour, they go into overhydration. So that is something to keep in mind. We have to have our six early input output chart in place and we have to titrate our fluids accordingly early use of colloids and uh, blood products also we can consider non-invasive ventilation with an appropriate interface we have to do and also another thing we have to do when a child has respiratory distress early with the fluid boluses we have to consider myocardial dysfunction a simple chart for monitoring uh, what we can use is uh, the the following with the uh, date time the vitals especially the pulse pressure the urine output is something that will give an indication of the endorgan perfusion. We should never forget that. Hematocrit will give an idea. It will help us to titrate the therapy, but I wouldn't say hard and fast, but it will give an idea. Uh, 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 when there is a sudden fall in hematocrit and the child continues to be in shock, major bleed, especially GI bleed, is something to be co uh, co considered because it will be occult and it doesn't manifest soon. So we'll have to give appropriate blood products at that time. Lactate is another think we have to monitor if we have the facilities that is uh, with abg with lactate if we have that is good to uh, give an idea of the microcirculatory status blood products when do we transfuse in a severe dengue if it is mild mucosal bleed supportive care is enough no need for pro prophylactic transfusion however centers what they prefer is uh, less than 10,000 cells per millimeter cube platelet count we do transfuse severe bleeding no question we'll have to give fresh whole blood that is we give 10 ml per kg of fresh whole blood or if that's not available 5 ml per kg of um, uh, packed cells is uh, something to be given de-resuscitation so fluid removal strategies are important during the resolution phase because whatever fluids we have pushed in during the uh, critical phase everything will be pushed in from the extravascular compartment into the circulatory compartment leading to circulatory overload so this leads to a prolonged hospital stay need for ventilation and morbidity so uh, uh, once we uh, see the critical phase lasts for 24 to 48 hours so during that time overzealous fluid 
fluid therapy we have to monitor for we have to dial down our fluids and during the recovery phase we have to uh, focus on uh, fluid removal strategies like flu uh, frusamide infusion peritoneal dialysis also pd also helps in relieving the intra abdominal hypertension crrt if the facility available that is well and good so this is just Dr. To Dr. Sorry to I think we are running a bit short. Uh, maybe can Two slides. have some yeah uh, Two things slides, in the sir. discussion. Okay. So uh, dengue fever, when we see at the outset, we have to tell them other than hydration to watch for the danger signs and also look for the mosquito breeding sites in and around the house uh, and eliminate them. Also, when when we feel that they are going uh, to become sick, then risk of bleeding and multi-organ dysfunction uh, something to uh, be counselled about. Tips on safe transport. These are the things we have to keep in mind uh, while referring a, a, child, a sick child to a, a, a higher center. So capillary leak, just to summarize, capillary leak is the hallmark of severe dengue in critical phase. Early identification and judicious fluid administration is vital. Fluid titration should be based on pulse volume, urine output, watch, strictly watch the input-output balance. Acetonic crystalloids are the first line of choice. Colloids comes next. Fresh whole blood also uh, as a backup we'll have to keep if not responding to either of them. Early self, a safe referral is important for a good outcome for the child. I, I thank my seniors and uh, mentors uh, for this opportunity to present. Thank you, Reshma. We'll be answering the question in the chat box itself. Can you stop sharing? I'll uh, request uh, Karthik Narayanan to present these slides. Thank you, Reshma. We may not be able to exceed more than 20 ml per kg in a child with dengue shock. You may have to restrict fluid only to that. Over to Dr. Karthik Narayana. <coughs> Karthik and uh, Ramesh, I just request you to please restrict yourself to 10 minutes each. Already we are running short of uh, almost 10 uh, 20 minutes. Hello, are my slides visible? Yes, yes. Sir? Visible. Yes. Slides are visible. Audible, audible. Slideshow. Slideshow, please. Please try to restrict by 10 minutes. Yes. Yeah, it's fine. Good. So, uh, uh, this is a third case scenario. It's a 15 month old boy uh, who is having a low grade fever, cough, and cold for three days, along with vomiting and decreased oral intake, as well as decreased urine output. And on the third day, it was accompanied with fast breathing. Uh, they were admitted initially in the peripheral hospital where the child received 10 ml per kg bolus and was then referred. On arrival in ER, uh, according to the triage as well as the Pentagon assessment, the airway and breathing, respiratory, there was tachypnea with uh, significant work of breathing and there was forehead sweating and in room mass saturation was 88%. There was tachycardia with uh, weak peripheral pulses, but the blood pressure was more than 5th centile. Uh, the child was lethargic, but however, has some eye contact and the child also had forehead sweating and hepatomegaly. Like right from the initial presentation, we know that we are dealing with a sick child and this child is having a compensated shock because the blood pressure is normal. And there is an increased work of breathing with hypoxia. So therefore, prob probably this child is in respiratory failure. So how to proceed with the initial management? As usual, any child who is presenting with respiratory distress and hypoxia as a norm, we start them on non-rebreathing mask. Similarly, we did for this child. And because this child is in shock, already received a 10 ml per kg bolus outside. Uh, since at present also the peripheral pulses are weak, we initially start at another 5 to 10 ml per kg of crystalloid bolus over 30 minutes. So why our bolus should be cautious in such a situation? So in any child, when you have shock and uh, when, you, uh, when you find like this child is not recovering, you have a weak peripheral pulses and a compensated blood pressure, as previously described by Vasan, you should be cautious in your fluid bolus because what you could be dealing with could be a cardiogenic shock and you have not completed a total clinical assessment. So why, what happens when you give an additional bolus? As you can see in the left side of the slide, the, there is a Frank Starling curve. On the right side, we call it as a Marek Phillips curve. So in the Frank Starling curve, whenever there is a reduced inotropic effect or decreased contractility, and there is an increased systemic vascular resistance or increased afterload, the curve shifts towards the right or it plateaus down. 
So when there is a plateau towards the right side, what happens is the preload reserve, the amount of fluid that can be given to prevent an increase in the extravascular lung water or pulmonary congestion is very narrow. If you see the point A, you can give a large volume of fluid, but in, in the case of point B, your fluid volume becomes restricted because more than that volume, it will increase pulmonary congestion leading to worsening of hypoxia. So what happens when you give even small volumes of fluid, the extravascular lung water can increase. It can lead to pulmonary edema and worsen respiratory failure. And also at the same time, if you're giving a faster administration, like less 15 minutes or 10 minutes, the faster administration can lead to further blunting of flank stalling curve, causing worsening of shock, meaning your BP will fall down from the compensated state. So you will further increase the congestion as well as you will cause hypotension. Therefore, in such a case, it is always better to be cautious whenever you find there are pointers towards cardiogenic shock. It is always better to be cautious with small aliquots of fluid bolus, 5 to 10 ml per kg over 30 minutes to 1 hour. And as said before, observe for pulmonary edema. Most important thing is the heart rate. When you are giving mm -hmm. fluid, if your heart, straight, heart rate is increasing, that is the point you have to think like your, 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 going, your child is going in for a cardiac failure or fluid overload. After the heart rate increases, you will develop increase in crepitations and then a hepatomegaly. So observe for the change in heart rate. So when will you suspect cardiogenic shock? It has been discussed uh, extensively in the previous sessions. But broadly, what you have to think is observe for signs of pulmonary congestion, systemic congestion, and signs of hypoperfusion. When all these three things are together, or at least two of these things are together, then you are dealing with a cardiogenic shock. Sometimes there can be some dilemma when you're dealing with tropical infection, especially in a case of dengue or streptiphus, where you can see edema and hepatomegaly, even though the child can be in a distributive shock. So that is when you have a dilemma. So in such a situation, when you are doing a cardiac examination, it would give you a clue. So look for gallop or murmur. If these thing, two things are not there, attach your child to the ECG monitor because even in your previous description, the ECG monitoring has not been described. According to me, for any child presenting with shock, ECG should be attached and we have to see the ECG monitoring in these children. And you will get a lot of rhythm changes. You might get ST, T wave abnormalities, low voltage QRS complex, and also you can look into the QT prolongation. By eyeballing, if you find the T wave ends after the midpoint between two R waves, you can say that the QT is prolonged. And if these things, either there is an ECG abnormality or a gallop of murmur, along with signs of pulmonary systemic as well as uh, hypoperfusion, you are dealing with a cardiogenic shock and you should be careful when you are administering your fluid bolus. So ECGs are virtually always abnormal in children with myocarditis. As an office practitioner, our concern is, are we missing a microbe? That is the commonest thing in a viral season that we get. So ECG are virtually always abnormal in children with myocarditis, but obviously a normal ECG does not rule out for which we have additional investigations that I will be dis discussing down the line. And when you are What causes do we expect? Myocarditis, obviously that is what, is what we are seeing routinely. And during the post-COVID season, we are also see, seeing myocarditis due to the multisystem inflammatory syndrome. Cardiomyopathies, rhythm abnormalities can also present. Post-cardiac arrest states can have cardiogenic shock, metabolic and toxins, and muscular dystrophies. So when these histories are history is there, and uh, if you are suspecting cardiogenic shock, be careful. So in our index child, X-ray was showing cardiomegaly with the right pleural effusion, as you can notice. And in PICU, this child was in compensated shock with feeble peripheral pulses. And the child was started on adrenaline, intubation was done. All the central venous axis arterial lines were secured. Still, the child was having fever. Then echo was done, which was showing global hypokinesia. Trop I was negative. It's less than 0 0.010. Trop T is also negative, but pro BNP was more. So how, what is the initial investigation? So what investigation you have to do? The most important investigation that we all get, get it done is a chest X-ray. And invariably in the chest X-ray, what we have, we want to look is for cardiomegaly, meaning the CT ratio, which is the points that A plus B divided by C into 100, it is more than 55%. We say there is a cardiomegaly. So, and other thing is ECG. Suppose if you have, if you are trained in echo, you can get an echo. In the blood investigations, 
we have to look for correctable causes which is blood sugar and electrolytes especially calcium and potassium trop i uh, trop i might not kartik yes you are requested to go a little faster and skip few slides we may not be able to complete i think yes sir, yes so trop i uh, might might not be a good marker because it elevates only after myocardial necrosis but pro bnp is a very sensitive marker for cardio cardiogenic shock so x ray as i said but how to differentiate with it pericardial effusion in an x ray you find a cardiomegaly but no pulmonary congestion that is when you have to suspect whether this cardiomegaly can be due to a pericardial effusion or not but if there is a cardiomegaly and there is bad wing appearance or there is very high line infiltrates then what you are dealing with is a cardiogenic pulmonary edema echo is a very good modality and it is a gold standard modality to identify cardiogenic shock we look into the, at least you have to know whether to see into the ejection fraction and the intravascular volume status by looking into the ivc so what is the specific management optimize ventilation optimize the preload and afterload and treat the correctable causes so in the optimization on how to initiate inotropes this is what we are going to look into first you decrease the afterload either by starting positive pressure ventilation that is very important if the child is fine The, uh, the there is no significant hypoxia and bp is normal and the child is compensated start with the niv if there is hypotension or low gcs go ahead with invasive mechanical ventilation and suppose if there is hypertension and then there is pulmonary edema you can consider vasodilators like how we deal with hypertensive emergencies decrease free load always ensure that your maintenance iv fluid is only 50 to 60% and you can consider a diuretic infusion if your blood pressure is normal and then increase your inotropy if a normal bp consider dobutamine or mildrenone if the bp is low you can consider epinephrine so positive pressure ventilation as i said it decreases after load so you what when you have to not use non invasive ventilation is if there is hypotension if there is low gcs or if there is if your sf ratio meaning saturation divided by fao2 is less than 250 or your pf ratio is less than 200 it is preferable to go ahead with invasive ventilation so when you are going to intubate it is a very high risk intubation because it is a physiologically difficult airway always have a senior person with you and use ketamine and fentanyl instead of midazolam because it will further depress and cause hypotension always start epinephrine infusion before intubation procedure or administering sedation and always always use a short acting muscle relax relaxation like procnodium or a succinyl choline all cardiogenic shock requires psu referral there is no second thought because the risk of sudden cardiac death is very high it can happen at any moment so don't after initial resuscitation if you don't have a level 3 pacu unit do not keep it in your center always ensure that ecg and spo2 is continuously attached labs you can monitor probe bnp to see the response obviously if you have continuous echo like you can do frequent echocardiography that would be more appropriate and the nivp is sufficient in normotensive children Whereas, if the child is hypotensive, it is preferable to have a invasive arterial monitoring. Thank you. Now, I. Uh, Arthi, you can uh, stop sharing your slide. <clears throat> Sangavelu sir. Ramesh, Ramesh requested to present his slides. Um, yes. So, thank you for the opportunity, sir. I am going to present on case scenario based on uh, this talk next ten minutes. So, here are the received vaccination. After twenty minutes of vaccination, our face and eyes become swollen and develop arthritic area. And the uh, forces of white and stridor, the tongue started to swell, and the heart rate is um, tachycardia with uh, brachial pulse was weak, and the systolic BP of just borderline 80 millimeter mercury. We felt uh, dizzy and started losing consciousness. Because we all know that after vaccination, any uh, events happen. This is called adverse event following vaccination. We need to follow the certain norms and guidelines according to the uh, the respective state government uh, uh, guidelines for the reporting all those things. And uh, in this uh, 10 minutes, I am going to see what is adverse reaction and uh, uh, how the initial assessment is going to help us. 
and uh, just uh, commonly we have to palpate the pulses uh, quickly and uh, to uh, look for any uh, difference in the pulses or not is there or not and is there is fainting attack or any anaphylactic shock is there how to help differentiate if i am alone in the clinic what can i do and uh, what are the intervention i can do first and uh, any uh, what are other features uh, should i look for and uh, the adverse event is nothing but is any untoward medical occurrence which follows immunization and it does not necessarily have a causal relationship with the usage of the vaccine uh, the adverse event may be any unfavorable or unintended sign including even abnormal laboratory findings and symptoms and disease uh, uh, so many classifications are there in this uh, following immunization and uh, this case pertaining to the vaccine product related severe reaction the we all discussed uh, the since the beginning is uh, how the pat triangle and uh, pentagon is going to help us so consciousness and child is less interactive and breathing is abnormal sounds the color of uh, skin looks abnormal so it's a uh, child is unstable become life threatening one the airway is uh, at risky because is uh, though is maintaining but is uh, we should assume this is unmaintainable we can uh, child any time going to collapse because of the complete airway obstruction if you are not going to intervene early so on breathing this tachycardic and increase of breathing stridor and uh, saturation though is maintaining or minus some person the circulation wise the tachycardia is there weak pulse and uh, systolic and diastolic beats of 80 by 50 we can use commonly all radial and peripheral pulses and uh, it was discussed by dr angavel sir at the beginning itself and uh, disability wise is uh, child is verbal uh, response to the verbal and exposed articaria and swollen face and is there So on the classification, simple is uh, upper respiratory tract obstruction with respect to distress and uh, hypotensive shock. It probably is a distributive. Then is a painting or anaphylactic shock. Simple sample history will help us because uh, the child doesn't have any allergic prior to this, not on any medication, and no significant past medical history. And had a breakfast. After that, we received vaccine, and uh, within two hours, uh, everything happens so rapidly. So it probably is uh, uh, anaphylactic shock because this is sample history also helps us that whether suppose sometimes child has a, some kind of beta blockers for any underlying cardiac disease that time we can expect the refractory anaphylactic shock for the epinephrine one because those children require may require glucagon for the uh, subsequent management. So I will discuss in the subsequent slide. the basic i propose uh, main same in this situation we can even say that eabc the epinephrine and airway breathing suppression and uh, place the child in the recommend position if possible if tolerated otherwise do not disturb the child because the more as we can disturb the child with the stridor become getting worse and worse so all of the child the position of comfort and oxygen we can it required we can not try to organize uh, most of the child any uh, anaphylactic shock with respiratory symptom oxygen is always required so try to give it through non threatening manner like free flow oxygen or if possible or uh, stay small kind of thing and by the time we should prepare for epinephrine it should take time and uh, and also you can prepare for the iv fluid may definitely is required because of the massive fluid the shift usually occurs with anaphylaxis so epinephrine the only the treatment of the choice no substitute for epinephrine in anaphylactic choice and no absolute contraindication to the epinephrine in the setting of anaphylaxis and uh, try to give deep im at the earliest opportunity and uh, usually in the thigh region and lateral aspect of the mid third of the thigh the vascular excretion lateralis muscle uh, if it if we don't have a time to dilution and do all those things simply use undiluted 1.01 ml per kilo up to 0.2 to 0.5 ml by deep im or even you can give in subcutaneous also and 95% of the children even up to 98% of the children will respond single dose of the epinephrine sometimes they require second dose usually we can try to give uh, every Uh, you can reassess every 5 minutes and we can decide within 10 to 15 minutes maximum we can uh, decide about the second dose the needle the most commonly we can uh, because we need to ensure the deep enough to deliver the drug into the muscle so for the 22 to 23 gauge with 25 mm length is enough good enough to cause for the im and if it's obese patient you can use little longer 38 mm length uh, needle uh, if it decided to give sub cut you can go for 
25 to 27 gauge needle with 16 mm length is good enough and most important thing if you are sensitive to the light and air this most of the guidelines is recommends uh, to protect from the light and please don't use the epinephrine is the color is changed or any precipitate is there and after dilution if you are dilution keeping there you can keep up to 4 hours at the room temperature sometime you can up to 24 hours at 20 20 25 degree but each the manufacturer give their own recommendation please follow that advice no the universal uh, storage for the room temperature or any other things but one thing is very clear usually do not refrigerate usually do not any freezing this is not recommended so uh, what about the other things uh, apart from the epinephrine we should prepare for the uh, crystallite is normal saline is good enough to give sometimes is require even 40 ml 60 ml also because of this massive fluid uh, distribution we abnormal distribution and please continue your ongoing ongoing simple vital monitoring every 2 to 5 minutes that's very very important and uh, second one is saturation blocker we often every almost all the patient will use but one thing is important that the first thing is epinephrine okay this uh, all other drugs will come second or third line so diphenhydramine can be give because it will uh, act as inverse agonist uh, so the receptor so it reversing the effect of histamine on capillaries and reducing the allergic reaction symptoms the dose is 1 to 2 mg per kg either im or iv or sometime if possible mild cases we can even try for the oral the maximum dose is 50 mg per oral we can now we can often repeat up to every 6 hourly second thing is citrosin one we can also is recommended one based on the age based 6 month to 5 year 2.5 mg 6 year to 11 year we can go for 5 to 10 mg iv the another one is ranitidine fomentidine also recommended uh, second thing is, is uh, that also often uh, used for uh, 1 mg per kg or fomentidine is 0.25 mg per kg maximum dose of 20 mg then do not use as a initial therapy it comes as second or third line therapy second some evidence is clearly uh, recommends simultaneous h1 and h2 blocker may superior to the h1 blocker alone but we should remember that these medication do not relieve airway obstruction or hypotension or shock in a standard dose what we are following in this one even do not inhibit the mediator release from the mast cell and basophil this is only going to help to affect on the capillaries and try to reduce the allergic symptom what can this third one is steroid because almost all the patient we often describe uh, prescribe the hydrocortisone but my order of preference is mesalpenicillin 1 mg per kg maximum 125 mg iv or if it not available go for hydrocortisone 5 mg per kg maximum 250 mg iv or if it still not available you can consider for dexamethasone is up to 0.16 to 0.6 mg maximum 10 mg iv or im can be repeated every 6 hourly and maximum requirement is only 24 to 40 hours uh, 40 hours only we can stop the steroid without any tapering The, but steroid is usually the mechanism action takes place only at the fifth hour minimum if you after because the predominantly is going to prevent the recurrent that means biphasic uh, type second phase of your anaphylaxis is not a primary one so the current evidence is uh, 2020 evidence is clearly recommend not to give steroid routinely to the patients who respond well to epinephrine second one is this mild or moderate one you are planning for discharge within couple of hours but still our practice we used to give but this, uh, this is the evidence based one second uh, is there any role of the bronchodilator yeah of course and uh, if any is uh, if just now the uh, 0.1 mg routine uh, bronchodilatation 3 ml saline if we can give and uh, should be given in patient with severe bronchospasm and uh, in along with epinephrine only and not a first line one and it does not prevent or relieve upper airway edema or hypotension or shock and uh, just only for the bronchospasm is uh, in addition to adjuvant to the epinephrine one and those children if they have asthmatic patients they may have some role if the case is refractory one the sample is still will help us if the child is on some beta blocker something is there we should consider the glucagon 0.02 to 0.03 mg per kilo iv bolus maximum 1 mg per dose then try to uh, think about the continuous infusion of 5 to 15 microgram per minute 
the titrate based on the response to the clinical response and uh, if it remain refractory then we can think about the isoprotenol is 0.05 to 0.5 mic per kg per minute and some case may go up to even 2 mic per kg per minute it will help to overcome the depression of the myocardial contractility caused by the beta blocker but we should be very careful about that this drug alone can aggravate hypertension and can cause cardiac arrhythmia and myocardial necrosis so this is one of the refractory cases the few case reports they often they are using the third line of the defense one is the methylene blue is the inhibitor of the nitric oxide synthetase and uh, guanine acyclase inhibitor the single bolus dose of 1 to 2 mg per kilo over half an hour to one hour maybe think about the your third one the remain refractory then still remain refractory and hypotension is uh, not improving after the fluid and everything we should think about starting the vaso active medications and even second case support even there up to ecmo okay but it's a rare one uh please continue ongoing assessment of your response to therapy the monitor the vitals and if you are not able to handle the child at the clinic this is depends upon the availability and resource and the expertise so the prepare for the transfer nowadays is ambulance is freely available and uh, effort to stabilize before transport that's most important but sometimes is not possible we of course know that we have no overall limitations and uh, arrange for the transport the nearby hospital so after 10 minutes of this one child start obeying commands and stridor and vocal breathing start improving and significantly the central and peripheral pulse is very felt after the one dose epinephrine and one bolus dose and maintenance fluid and oxygen and uh, bp is become 100 but 70 so uh, with the 10 minutes we can decide about whether second dose epinephrine required or not um, so after the care and uh, while uh, planning for the discharge one we should uh, always try to brief the family counseling about the condition and going uh, care and uh, after successful management we can uh, med- uh, plan for the discharge medication if the two days may require and uh, how to prepare everyone we know that basic life support dr tanvesh ali told that he the learning uh, model by the iap please uh, try to go through that uh, that's very very important and uh, in our clinic that our anm and everyone to train to give the deep im epinephrine at the earliest that's most important that means here the eabc okay and uh, in case of cardiac arrest and no excuse as a medical practitioner we start to give uh, chest compression and try to give the airway breathy circulation and uh, no excuse and uh, then we can arrange to transfer the baby after depend upon the availability and of the resource and expertise the medical legal implications the first thing is we need to inform to our uh, the adverse even following immunization protocol as per the local authorities and like any other case we should uh, document all the events and we should save ourselves and uh, no one going to be save you or save us and uh, the situation is totally different and any lab test available and we needed is usually limited is uh, based on the underlying clinical conditions but if the child is apparently normal child is doesn't require much about the clinical uh, condition will help uh, us to order for the lab investigation how to prevent further and manage we can follow the safe the counseling module that is called seek support don't hesitate to call help then try to identify the allergen and uh, to avoid and uh, then follow up for the specialty care and uh, second thing is if you have recurrent recurrent episodes of allergy and all those things documented third one is we can even teach the parents how to give epinephrine for the emergency and uh, like auto injectors even we can simple scaring the syringe and the ampule is also is good enough we should treat them with called safe counseling module because it's a life saving one and uh, any drug any vaccine any substance can cause anaphylaxis including epinephrine can also cause okay so we do not uh, uh, classify that which one is going to not cause the patient should be assessed and treated as rapidly as possible and because death can occur within minutes the epinephrine is a life saving in anaphylaxis no substitute for epinephrine the no absolute contraindication to the epinephrine in the anaphylactic setting the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis of any kind of severity is epinephrine the massive fluid trip can occur in anaphylaxis so the fluid resuscitation is must 
The supplemental oxygen is always recommended as like any other standard air with breathing circulations and particularly those patients present with respiratory signs and symptoms. The patient should be discharged with personalized and written anaphylaxis emergency action plan like you can follow this safe counseling module and uh, so we can save this any patient present with anaphylaxis. Thank you for opportunity. Thank you, Ramesh. You can stop sharing. There are only three things I want to stress upon. Adrenaline, don't hesitate to give adrenaline. Always keep the stock of adrenaline. Are you fleeced in your clinic? Every child after vaccination has to wait in the clinic for 30 minutes. Even if they develop shock, anaphylaxis shock, if you correctly manage with adrenaline, IU fleets and bag mask ventilation, medical legally are saved. If you don't have adrenaline, you have to give a prescription for adrenaline to get uh, from the nearby shop. Then you will be medic medical legally, we are be liable. So keep prepared. Thank you very much for uh, all the panelists for uh, finishing up faster in time. Anyhow, sorry, we have exceeded the time by 15 minutes. Uh, thank all my panelists for uh, speeding up and uh, presenting various types of shock recognition management. Thank you, organizers. Uh, now it is, uh, uh, the session is now handed over to Mulay Balaji to continue the further lectures. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, panelists. Now, uh, because of short of time, we'll just be moving to the next presentation. Uh, for the next four talks, I think uh, we can have the discussion in the chat box unless there is some time left with us. So I call upon Dr. Srinivasan, uh, who will be our next speaker. Uh, he has completed his MD Pediatrics and uh, done his DM Pediatric Critical Care from Jipmer Puducherry. He is currently Assistant Professor, Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at the Institute of Child Health Hospital for Children at Chennai and also heading the Pediatric ICU at uh, Prashant Hospitals. His areas of interest are poisoning, critical transport, ultrasound in uh, Pediatric Intensive Care Unit and Renal Replacement Therapy. He was the best outgoing student in MD. Uh, received awards like Dr. Balakopal Raju Award for uh, Best Research Paper and Dr. Satyamuthi Goldman for during his DM tenure. Uh, I invite, it's my pleasant op uh, opportunity to invite Dr. Srinivasan. Uh, you can please share your slides and start your presentation. Sir. He'll be talking on approach to a child with uh, toxin ingestion. Is it audible? Yes, audible. It's audible, audible and the screen is visible. 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 Thanks for the nice introduction, Bole Balaji. Uh, good evening, Tanguvela sir, organizing team, my seniors and friends. In the next few minutes, I'll be talking about an approach to a child with toxin ingestion. So, 90% of the poisoning in children occur from 9 months of age to 5 years of age. Most of the poisoning are unintentional, but there are also cases of suicidal and homicidal poisoning. Sometimes the poison event is not recognized by the parents or the caregivers. It is not only important to identify what is the poison, but also the amount and route of exposure. In a poisoned child, it needs a good competency history, focused physical examination and relevant lab evaluation. In this presentation, in addition to approach, I have added a few case scenarios. I have not covered envenomation syndromes. So, as previous speakers have told about initial impression, primary assessment, a child with suspected poison, poisoning should have initial impression, that is appearance, breathing, and color. In the primary assessment, apart from airway, the breathing may be de depressed or child may be tachypneic. Sometimes the child may have acidotic breathing. We'll be discussing about acidotic breathing later and added sounds like crackles in a child with aspiration. Circulation, whether the child is having bradycardia, tachycardia, hypotension, hypertension, any flushing, cyanosis, etc. In disability, Glasgow Coma Scale is preferred rather than AVP scale. How are the pupils tone power? In addition to clinical examination, primary assessment, also look for saturation, the bedside ECG model, that is the uh, cardiac monitoring, not the toilet ECG monitoring, and capillary blood glucose. In the exposure, look for any spills of the poison, any particular odor, hyperthermia or hypothermia, secretion, sweating, salivation, whether the child is having dry mucosa, oral lesions, ulcers, or lacrimations. 
So apart from clinical examination, some basic investigation, investigations like X-ray, ECG may help in many poisoning. For example, an X-ray may be required in uh, radiopic poisonings like chloral hydrate, calcium salts, heavy metals like lead, mercury, iron, phenothiazin, plaidoc, that is the colored clay, entry coated pills like uh, even uh, calcium salts and dental amalgam. In ECG, most of the PR intervals, QRN, QRS interval and QT intervals may be prolonged. For example, PR interval is prolonged in digoxin and lithium, whereas QR, QRS prolongation occurs in tricyclic antidepressant, Benadryl, fluorokin, quinine, etc. QT prolongation occurs in antipsychotics, macrolides like erythromycin and carithromycin, and fungal azoles. There may be hypoglycemia in sulfonylureas, megalitonides, insulin, quinine, ethanol, and propanolol. Some children may have high and anti metabolic acidosis, that is agma, which occurs in methanol, metformin, propylene glycol, INH, iron, ethylene glycol, and salicylate poisoning. So you can remember the mnemonic mud piles. So coming to the management, there are four principles in the management of poison child. So the first one is decontamination, remove whatever the material is available and enhance elimination, which is what of the entering the body, remove it as early as possible, particular antidote and supportive care. This all the principles are equally important in the management of a sick poison child. So coming to the decontamination, if you have any spills in the skin or the eyes, you rush with the tepid water or normal saline. If you suspect organophosphorus compound, you cleanse with soap water because the soap has high pH, which removes the phosphate bonds. Avoid flushing with water and normal saline in suspected elemental sodium or phosphorus or calcium oxide or titanium chloride. Avoid epicac and induced emesis in a poisoned child. You can use gastric lagwage with the rice tube and the endos. It is recommended within one hour of ingestion, but if you don't know the interval or if you feel that the child will be having because of the delayed uh, stomach uh, emptying, you can use gastric lavage. Avoid gastric lavage in a child with who is unconscious, who is unable to maintain the airway reflexes or in corrosive poisonous acid, alkali or hydrocarbons like kerosene. So activated charcoal, is useful at a dose of one gram per kg. It is advised within one, one hour of ingestion. Most of the cases which where you use active charcoal are carbazepine, phenobarbital, ferritine, dapsone, quinine, theophylline, and salicylate. Activated charcoal is not useful in iron, lithium, hydrocarbons like kerosene, alkalis, acids, electrolytes, alcohol, cyanides. It is controversial to use activated charcoal in pesticides. Coming to enhanced elimination, whole bubble irrigation may be indicated in children with the entry coated pills poisoning, where you can use polyethylene glycon at a dose of 35 ml per hour. In children with poisoning like SPM, you remember the mnemonic SPM, salicylate, phenobarbital, and methotoxate, where sodium, sodium bicarbonate can be used to increase the urinary pH from 7.25 to 7, uh, 8.0 to uh, increase the urinary excretion of the poison. Lipid emulsion at a uh, concentration of 20% may be used in tricyclic antidepressant, calcium channel blockers, and local anesthetic like bupivacaine. You remember the indication for hemodialysis in poisoning, basalt, that is bromide, methyl, methyl alcohol, salicylate, ethyl alcohol, lithium, and theophylline. So these are the common antidotes available in poisoning. Atropine is useful in organophosphorus, carbamates, calcium gluconates for hydro hydrogen fluoride, calcium channel blockers, and cyanide kit, which contains amyl nitrate, sodium nitrate, and sodium thiosulfate. For example, in iron poisoning, desferoxamine is used. This is the entire exhaustive list. So I'll be sharing at the end. You can uh, see it leisurely. So these are the potentially toxic compounds which are commonly seen in ICH and all over Tamil Nadu. So in addition, I want to stress the four important household poisons like camphor, eucalyptus, marpal, that is the naphthalin, and neem oil. All of these poisons will cause status epilepticus in children. 
So what are the corrosive household poisoning in children? That is ethylene glycol, toilet cleaner, detergent like soap uh, for detergents, bleaching powder, dishwashing powders. So in this uh, corrosive poisoning, gastric lavage is contraindicated. So coming to the ICH statistics, I took this statistics like a few months back. For the period of uh, 2014 to 2019, there were about 2,10,000 10, admissions, which are uh, in, in this 0.5% constitute uh, poisonings. Tablet poisoning occurred in 140 children. There was a slightly male predominance, 75 versus 65, among which 50% is by paracetamol. There were no deaths in tablet poisoning except paracetamol. Out of the 12 deaths, all the deaths were due to paracetamol. So uh, others, in others also, there was a male predominance, two-thirds is males by and one-third by females. The most common is kerosene. Out of 1,100 poisoning, 478 was due to kerosene, followed by mosquito repellent, detergent, and turpentine. In this 1,100 poisoning children, there were 14 deaths, eight by kerosene, two by rat killer and pesticide each, iron poisoning one, and paracetamol one. So in the next few minutes, I'll be talking about a few case scenarios. Case scenario one, a six-year-old boy who was sleeping in the uh, village in the prone position. Father noticed that he is having sweating, salivation. So he turned the child, he was lethargic and he was breathless. So he was immediately taken to a GH where I was working. He was found to have bradycardia, bilateral crackles and small and reactive pupils. Initially, I was thinking of argonopospheros poisoning but there was no smell in the mouth. Can anybody smell what it is? So it is argonophosphorus. So the, you remember the demonic dumbbells, which constitute diaphoresis, urination, myosis, bronchorrhea, emesis, lacrimation, and salivation. The child was playing in a cornfield, which was uh, sprayed with argonophosphorus with a bare body. So through skin absorption, if he got all the features of organophosphorus poisoning. So the antidotes are atropine and pralidoxin. Atropine is given at the dose of 0.05 to 0.1 mg per kg. And based on the response of the pupillary uh, reaction, pupillary size and bronchial secretion, you can increase the dose. And in addition, you can use pralidoxin in organophosphorus compounds. So there are still controversies because of the two RCs done in CMC in the early 1990s, whether pralidoxin is useful or it causes more death. So till now, with evidence from animal studies and observational studies, pralidoxin is useful. So for want of time, I am skipping the mechanism of action of argonophosphorus. So coming to the paracetamol poisoning, the toxic dose is 200 mg per kg and the toxic compound is N-acetyl parabenzoquinin. So there are four stages in paracetamol poisoning. Stage one, where the child will have GI symptoms like vomiting, malaise, and anorexia. After 24 to 48 hours in stage two, the child will have resolution of the symptoms where he will have elevated AST and ALT and PTINR. In stage three, there will be peak elevation of liver enzymes with multi-organ dysfunctions. The child may die or recover. Recovery starts in stage three. In stage four, it occurs from four days to two weeks where the liver functions, abnormalities recover and child is clinically recovering. This is the rumac mati nomogram. It is useful after a single toxic dose of paracetamol ingestion. It is used from four hours of ingestion up to 24 hours. So before that, if the child present, you send the samples for liver enzymes and wait for the paracetamol level after the four hours. So if you don't have a uh, rumac mati nomogram or the facility to measure the paracetamol levels, if the child is sick or having elevated liver enzyme, you can start NSTL system. When the liver enzyme started decreasing, you can discontinue NSTL system. The indication for liver transplant are when pH is less than 7.3 or INR more than 6, or child is having hepatic encephalopathy stage 3 or 4. Coming to the scenario 2, a 9-year-old child was brought with history of vomiting and abdomen pain. There was no history of fever. 
child was clinically stable there was jaundice and hepatomegaly liver enzymes were in 1000 and 1100s pta was more than 60 and inr more than 6 viral markers was negative were negative so i was talking to the child what happened to her so the mother had a quarrel with the child and child took the dratal poisoning the dratal poisoning contains yellow phosphorus the toxic dose is 1 mg per kg even 30 mg kg 30 mg for this 30 kg child is fatal so this child was treated for vomiting and abdomen for 3 days outside she pre presented to jipper where i was working at the time at 72 76 hours so usually what is the antidote for rattle poisoning you can do exchange transfusion or nst cysteine before 24 hours since the child presented after 72 hours we tried for benefit of doubt but this child this did respond she developed hepatic encephalopathy refractory shock and we lost the child after 9 days of hospital stay so what are the stages of rattle poisoning initially in the first stage she will have gi symptoms and smoky stools in the second stage it is symptom free where she will she can have elevated liver enzymes and the third stage she can she can have liver failure followed by multi organ dysfunction like renal failure metabolic acidosis encephalopathy and coagulopathy coming to the case scenario 3 a 2 year old girl brought to by mother with bluish discoloration of hands for the last 2 hours on examination airway was clear breathing was normal there was no added sound cyanosis was present so saturation was 83% with oxygen circulation there was tachycardia perfusion and bp were normal disability she was irritable and limb movements were normal exposure showed a normal temperature no abnormal cell and smell and central cyanosis so cyanosis low oxygen saturation and normal po2 we did proximetry methemoglobin level was 60% so this is a case of methemoglobinemia the father was having some after sulcers he was using benzocaine local anesthetic it was very tasty and child took about 2 to 3 gram so she presented with methemoglobinemia so this is the blood of the child where showing the chocolate brown color change of the blood the column 3 and 4 are normal blood for comparison so what are the causes for methemoglobinemia it is it occurs after organic or inorganic nitrates chlorates benzocaine lidocaine sulf, silver sulfur diazine after uh, burns applications and dapso so what is the problem here normally iron contains ferrous form in methemoglobinemia the ferrous form is oxidized to ferric form where it is unable to leave the oxygen into tissues it causes tissue hypoxia even though the po2 is normal so the odc curve is shifted to left the antidote is methylene blue at a dose of 1 mg per kg given over a period of 10 minutes so rule out g6pd before giving methylene blue so scenario 4 a 2 year old boy from rajasthan presented with fever for one day and seizures airway was stable breathing was normal there was no added sounds circulation tachycardia no murmur child was irritable exposure there was paler saturation was 78% no cyanosis pao2 was 89 hp 3.2 a smear emergency smear from the er showed hemolytic feature and lactate was 6.0 can anybody guess what it is so this is also methemoglobinemia the purpose of putting the slide is even though the saturation was 78 there was no cyanosis because you see the look at the hp it was, it was 3.2 because of the hemolysis i was asking the father whether there was any exposure to naphthalene balls he was unaware so this child is from rajasthan gcspd is common in that place so with a child with tissue hypoxia we took a uh, call that we gave methylene blue so do not wait for gcspd levels in a chick child with hypoxia so we treated the child the final diagnosis was naphthalene ball induced methemoglobinemia the scenario 5 a 4 year old female child the mother gave it, it occurred in the year 2016 mother gave odum bleach to the two daughters after a quarrel with her husband so all the three were taken to senchi gh and referred to velapuram medical college 
they were treated symptom symptomatically on day 4 the mother expired these two daughters were sent to jip birth at the er the child was unresponsive workup breathing was decreased color was pale she was intubated in er so i was unaware of what is oduvum bleeds so this is clistanthus pollinis it belongs to this is the leaf with the fruit the tree usually uh, grows up to 10 to 15 feet so there is an adult study from jipmer where over, over a period of uh, 10 years they could see about 51 cases of uh, clistanthus pollinis poisoning the mortality in this study was around 20% so the manifestation should include hypokalemia neutrophilia leukocytosis and aki so the clistanthus collins belongs to the euphorbaceae Eur- family all the parts of this plants were poisonous most commonly the leaves are used the mortality in children is about 30% so death occurs in 3 to 7 days the active ingredients in this compound is clistanthin a clistanthin b and collinis so we had difficulty in in managing child because of the proximal tubulopathy where they have severe hypokalemia metabolic acidosis with metabolic acidosis we have to give soda bicarbonate so in a, in the presence of hypokalemia so it is very difficult to bicarbonate so the potassium levels were less than 2 so it lasted for 5 to 6 days so the, the children with clistanthus collins poisoning were also have cardiac arrhythmias encephalopathy neuromuscular weakness respiratory failure and liver toxicity we lost one of the daughters due to ards so this this is from cmc where they recommend treatment with uh, for hypokalemia with potassium chloride by sodium sodium bicarbonate for acidosis dialysis for renal failure arrhythmia management intubation and management of shock so scenario 6 three month old female child was brought by well educated parents with seizures for 15 minutes abc was taken care of for disability we gave lorazepam followed by two doses of lorazepam followed by phosphenidine and levetiracetam there was strong odor of eucalyptus and isti the grandmother told she has applied some eucalyptus oil on the skin so since there was isti of fever for the last two days we did, we thought initially thought of meningoencephalitis so work up for meningoencephalitis is negative EEG was normal the final diagnosis was topical eucalyptus oil toxicity usually eucalyptus oil will cause status epilepticus when it was taken orally in this small infant even topical exposure will cause status epilepticus scenario 7 one year old female child from nellur andhra pradesh was had an accident con- consumption of coconut oil she was asymptomatic for 24 hours after which she had cough she was taken to a nearby physician where he took some x ray it was normal sent home after 4 days she developed respiratory distress and was brought to ich so this is the first x ray uh, this is the first x ray showing uh, ards so child was intubated but unfortunately the, we lost the child due to ards child developed lipopneumonia due to aspiration of coconut oil coming to scenario 8 a 2 year old female child brought with history of accident in ingestion of mosquito repellent that is all out usually the active component is pyrethroid such as cypermethrin so this all out and uh, mosquito repellent contains pyrethroid which is more than 2000 times toxic to the insects rather than males because of the increased to sodium channel sensitivity so usually they are asymptomatic if the child is uh, just uh, licking the rod nothing will happen whereas some children the rod is pulled out and they they will drink the fluid so in mild toxicity they will have gi symptoms moderate toxicity they will see in as depression fever sweating and blood vision whereas in severe toxicity you can have status epilepticus coma pulmonary edema and even respiratory failure coming to scenario 9 a 7 year old male child was brought with history of lethargy irritability fever and photophobia for one day there was no history of neck pain or seizures i was working in a gh initially i thought of meningitis on examination arrow was maintainable work of breathing was normal in cardiovascular system cvs there was tachycardia hypertension and warm peripheries no shock pupils were dilated there was no specific smell and the mucosa was dry 
So initially, I thought of meningitis, and finally, it turned out to be because of the pupils, dilated pupil. I was asking the detailed history. So the child took the datura, that is thanapil. The seeds contain atropine, hyosin, and scopolamine. The symptoms are delirium, mad as a matter, blind as a bat, red as a bee, hot as a hair, and dry as a bone. It is similar to sympathomimetics, where you can differentiate between anticholinergic and sympathomimetics by no sweating and a warm skin in anticholinergics, whereas cold skin and sweating in sympathomimetics. The antidote is physosigmin. At that time, we don't, we didn't have physosigmin. The child was managed symptomatically and was discharged home successfully. So we know that ORS saves billions of children with diarrhea. It is available in two. Uh, sizes 1 liter and 200 ml sachet it is a real incident occurred to my friend a one year old boy was brought by parents with both are it professional with acute watery diarrhea with some dehydration so he prescribed 200 of 1 liter sachet to be mixed with 200 ml water whereas they mixed 1 liter or solution in 200 ml water so normally the virus contains 75 milliequivalents, whereas because of the wrong composition, it was 375. Because of the dehydration, the, drank, the child drank liters of ORS and brought with lethargy. Admission sodium was 179. The child was lost because of encephalopathy and cerebral edema and hemorrhage due to ORS poisoning. Coming to scenario 12, a two-year-old girl from Kalakuruchi, the mother was pregnant and was on oil iron. The child accidentally took six to seven tablets of iron referred to ICH after going to four hospitals because of the unavailability of desperoxamine. So this is the X-ray of the child where you can see the iron tablets in the abdomen. So it is radio opaque. An X-ray suspected iron poisoning is useful. So in iron poisoning, there are four stages of symptoms. Stage one will have GI symptoms where stage two, there is resolution of symptoms. In stage three, they will have shock and metabolic acidosis. In stage four, liver failure. Later, they can have scarring and strictures. So the antidote is desferoxamine given at a dose of 15 mg per kg per hour. The indications of presence of metabolic acidosis are serum oil more than 500 microgram per deciliter. You can have allergy or hypotension or pulmonary fibrosis after desferoxamine. So when to stop desferoxamine infusion is resolution of metabolic acidosis, Normalization of serum 9, improvement in clinical parameters or urine color changes to normal. This child present with the shock, we are giving uh, fluid boluses. You see the initial color, urine color, and right side, you can see the windrose color of urine after the desferoxamine ion complex. So coming to the last scenario, one and a half year old boy present with the accidental ingestion of thyroxine tablet. They were not sure whether it could be around 10 to 15 tablets. An admission, GCS were 15 per 15, heart rate and BP were normal, there were no tremors. We took a sample for thyroid function test 12 hours after that where T3 and T4 were elevated and TSH was too low. So since the child was asymptomatic, we just observed and discharged the child. So we didn't start. The management includes stomach wash, activated charcoal, treat with propanolol, dexamethasone, or propyl thyroxine only if they are symptomatic. The thyroid function test will be hyperthyroid maximum at 48 to 60 hours and it falls. In campers toxicity, it is a compound in big paper or in some paint box. The toxic dose is 30 mg per kg. Usually the symptoms occurs after 5 to 90 minutes. They can present with status hepaticus, ataxia or GI symptoms. Harpic, they, can, they will, can produce corrosive poisoning because of the hydrochloric acid. Whereas in ALA, it's a common poisoning. Usually they will be asymptomatic. It contains alkalis like sodium hydroxide, sodium hypochlorite. Most of them will be stable. In a series of ALA poisoning in gym, where they were asymptomatic, but we did uh, upper GI where we could see grade 3A and 3B esophageal injuries. To conclude, suspicion of poisoning is more important. Histi helps in many times. Antidote is available only in certain poisonings. Make sure the antidotes are available. Even if the expiry is there, it is more important for the life of the child when compared to the cost of the antidotes. Supportive care is equally important with the antidotes and maintain child-friendly environment. So this is the National Poison Information Center in Ames, New Delhi.
so the common and antidotes available thank you thank you dr srinivasan for that elaborate uh, uh, discussion on poisoning and you nicely discussed the different case scenarios the wide variety of cases that were managed uh, thanks a lot for short of time i think we can have this uh, discussion with respect to poisoning in children in the chat box uh, and uh, now i just call upon the next speaker uh, professor narayanan sir yeah i think dr srinivasan you can stop sharing your slides so that yeah thank you so dr narayanan uh, is currently the professor in department of pediatrics at jipmer puducherry the areas of interest include uh, pediatric critical care mechanical ventilation evidence informed medicine and patient safety and quality he has close to 60 publications in uh, international and national peer reviewed journals and the more than 5 chapters in textbooks it's a pleasure to have you amongst us sir dr narayanan sir for his uh, deliberation of talk on uh, minor pediatric office emergencies Yeah, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, your audio yes, is clear, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the screen is visible, correct? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mulai, for that uh, uh, introduction, and I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Since we are running late, we'll start with the topic straight away. Uh, I've been asked to talk on uh, minor uh, pediatric office emergencies. Uh, of course, sitting in a tertiary care center, I may not be the correct person to see to talk on this. But uh, we do see a few of these minor uh, emergencies in and around Pondicherry who come to us. So, with that experience, I will try to do justice to the topic. In the next 20 minutes, uh, what we're going to do is uh, uh, just case by discuss on four of the case scenarios, which is uh, uh, we we'll try to see how they can be managed in the office pediatrics. So, the first case is a 18-month-old girl who was brought with uh, complaints of choking on a plastic toy when she was playing around 30 minutes back. On arrival, she is coughing repeatedly and is irritable and has respiratory distress. Parents are worried and wants you to do something immediately in your clinic. So, uh, what would be our response? So, there are multiple things we can do. Uh, we can arrange to refer the child immediately to the nearby hospital. If you have an X-ray facility somewhere nearby, you can send her for an X-ray and see if uh, or really she has ingested anything. Uh, and then uh, we can try some first aid measures. We have been taught hemolytic spinal cord or uh, back slaps and chest thrusts, uh, you know, in uh, during our uh, training. Uh, we can, of course, reassure and calm the parents as she better cough it out uh, and nothing to worry. So among, from all these options, uh, uh, for most of the time, when I ask uh, my residents or other people, they always go for this uh, C. They, of course, all of them feel that child is. No, come with an acute event, and we should do something. And you know, we should do some first aid, which is uh, so. Let us see what we should do. Uh, why this choose? Uh, you know, uh, trying uh, option C sometimes can be dangerous. So, uh, what is most dangerous in a child who is coming to you with a foreign body aspiration is a complete airway obstruction. So that happens only if there is a laryngeal uh, obstruction with larynx and subglottic areas that are lost part of your airway. So for everybody can get lords uh, there, and if there's a complete obstruction, they can die immediately. So that is the most life-threatening thing if you're worried about. So how does a laryngeal foreign body present? See, first, most of the features would be that they'll have no cough, no voice because larynx is obstructed completely. So you know, they don't, they won't be able to make any noise. They'll not be coughing, and some the universal choking sign, even though they're described in adults and. Uh, Or sometimes it can happen that the foreign body is actually passed in the larynx and in the large and one of the smaller airways, either the right bronchus or the left bronchus. And when you do some first aid measures like hemolytics or uh, just the thrust, this body, foreign body, can get destroyed and go back up into the larynx. And especially vegetable foreign bodies, they swell up after they. Enter the airways because they absorb the water, and when they go back, even though they were small enough to pass through the airway uh, larynx before, now they may be enough, and they may get stuck completely and produce complete obstruction. So it can be counterproductive. And most of these first aid measures, what we do, hemolytic maneuver or chest thrust, they are just uh, you know, imitating a cough. They just the mechanism of how they act is they increase the intrathoracic pressure and uh, push the foreign body out. So that is what we do when we cough. So they are just an imitation cough. So when the child is actually coughing, you should not try any any more imitations and just wait for the child to handle it. So in this child, it is dangerous. Even if the child has tried, that means some sound is being produced. That means airway is not completely obstructed. 
the these first aid measures are used only when the airway is completely obstructed so in this cell we just need to watch for uh, what's going to happen okay so is the bronchial foreign body that is not an emergency of course it's an emergency but it's not a dire emergency where we need to do something immediately the foreign body in one of the bronchus even if it is one of the main bronchus the other side the lung is completely able to work and it, it will save the child and we can wait for even uh, you know 24 hours or 48 hours so it's not an absolute emergency we can safely refer the child to a hospital where they can do a bronchoscopy in a, a control situation so when to refer a child if you turn the click a child like this comes when to refer the child so you first of all examine the child in great detail so is there any evidence of any decreased air entry either unilateral or bilateral carefully look for it any, any respiratory distress or any noisy breathing and if you have a facility take an x-ray any abnormal just x-ray look at the two lungs field and if they look symmetric or not it can be a collapse hyperinflation mild asymmetry those things indicate that there is some uh, airway obstruction, either complete or partial. If all, all these things are normal, then most probably, even though there's a choking episode, most probably there's nothing serious. And uh, you can even observe the child. He, he, our common practice is if the child is high door distress and uh, bilateral air injury is symmetrical and good and x-ray is normal, I mean, they, we usually observe the child. We don't do check chronoscopies in our hospital. So we can actually observe the child without refer, unless the parents are very worried. So we, uh, this is another similar case, which was uh, you know, given shown to us by Professor Thangvelu sir many years back. I'm just borrowing from sir this case. So this is a two-year-old Down syndrome child with body complaints of drooling of saliva since one day. So uh, suspecting that child may have swallowed something, they took an X-ray, and uh, there was a round metallic uh, object looking like a coin. So it was removed very easily with the help of a surgeon. But still, even after that, child continued to worsen. The child developed an air leak, as you can see here. There is some amount of uh, subcutaneous emphysema. So when we looked at, they looked at the metallic thing clearly, they found that actually it was not a coin, actually it was a button battery. This button battery is a very dangerous thing. First of all, you should have... It's got two edges uh, no, with a shallow ridge in between. So that can be sometimes seen in the next ray. Sometimes the lateral view also we can see a slight uh, slanting slope from the one side to the other side. Okay, so these are signs. If you see like this and carefully, you may be able to pick up a uh, um, button battery. It's very very important because button batteries can be very very dangerous. You know why? It's dangerous primarily because produce extensive tissue damage, not because of uh, chemical leak. That's what I used to think many years back. But the way they produce damage is through electrical uh, circuit. So this is the diagram which is on the internet about how to handle uh, button batteries by one of the companies which make button batteries. They say you should not touch the battery like this. You should only hold it like along the edges. That is because this battery, one side is positive charge, other side is negative charge. And if you hold like this, the circuit can be completed through your hand and it can get slowly get discharged. So this this is, this is happens when you just a button by the child ingests a button battery and is lying in some uh, no, tight cavity like nose, ear, pharynx, or esophagus. The, the mucosa, uh, along with the uh, secretions, the mucosa act like a very good conducting gel. And uh, the circuit is completed, battery is short circuited, and even if the battery is walled, it will have enough current to burn the mucosa. So it basically cauterizes the mucosa and the surrounding tissues. In fact, we had seen, uh, I had seen actually two children who had massive hematomases following a button battery injection where even the iota, iota was eroded and we lost them. So if you, the child comes to you with a button battery injection, it's an immediate. Uh, it's a very uh, acute emergency. Child has to be referred to a place where it can be taken out as early as possible. In the rare circumstances, if you find the batteries uh, reach the stomach, then this the danger of perforation and damage is very less because this is short circuiting is unlikely to happen. So, and if the battery is less than uh, 15 millimeter, usually it passes out safely. But uh, button battery is always a very dangerous thing. Well, now we'll go to the next case. Uh, this is a two year old developmentally normal girl who was born complete. So, first episode of abnormal movements one hour back. Child appears to be normal and interacting when seen with you. So you don't know whether the child had a seizure or not. So how do you uh, distinguish? The seizure means no, there are a lot of different ions comes in and you may have to treat them differently, especially multiple episodes are there. So uh, there are some green flag signs for seizure mimics and some red flag signs for seizures. This is uh, taken from one of the uh, review articles. So the movement is suppressible by tactile stimulation. Suppose any movement which you can stop by your own touching the patient easily, then that is a seizure mimic. And seizure mimics are usually triggered by a specific event, location, or emotion. For example, a breath holding spell where they do you know, a painful stimulus or child gets upset or standing for a long time in an assembly line. So this is, usually there will be a triggering event. 
and the movements or the steering or vacant steering, whatever you describe, the scene mimic usually stops. You can uh, with the distraction. That means child has, actually has not lost lost consciousness. You can distract the child. It's, but for uh, but if it's a seizure, then most of these movements are non-repressible, and they seizure the triggering event usually. Uh, suppose mother, mother says that that uh, usually when they get up from sleep or around that time. You know, when coming out of sleep, it happens. Then that is highly suggestive of seizures. That is a very threshold, uh, you know, low threshold for seizures. The sleep, around the sleep and uh, waking from sleep is a uh, time and seizures can be uh, exaggerated. And loss of consciousness during an event, any stuff, loss of uh, consciousness, any post uh, post event, if there is some drowsiness or fatigue for lasting for half an hour to one hour, highly suggestive of seizure. Then, of course, any past history of developmental delay, regression, or neurological injury. So, Taken alone, none of these red flags or uh, green flags are actually reliable. But if taken as a whole, suppose a child has a lot of uh, uh, green flags and hardly any red flag, or a lot of uh, red flags and hardly any uh, green flag, then we can say differentiate a seizure or a seizure mimic. Of course, there is a lot of big list of seizure and seizure mimic. We are not going to go through all of that. Common confusions, uh, just as an example, I have taken breath holding spell for infants. If you carefully take a history of breath holding spell, the, uh, the synodic episode, the, the holding during expiration, and the typical age group, you will find that uh, child, uh, the mother description involves a lot of uh, green flags and hardly any red flag. Less than 10 to 15 percent of them can have any transient loss of consciousness or convulsions. If that is there, of course, there can be a confusion. In that case, we may have to do further investigations, which we will uh, discuss later. So, for example, syncope in older child. This is similar, it's a common thing which you get confused with seizure. Even yesterday, one of my pediatric ICU sisters, uh, brought her, uh, daughter, who is around nine, 10 years, who had a syncope when we were studying in church, but somebody had, uh, outside had advised the MRI for her, and she was coming and asking me what to do. So, uh, so sometimes in syncope, you can have some oral like symptoms which may confuse you for a like a temporal of epilepsy. They can have occasional jerking of limbs, some urinary incontinence can be rarely be there. But if you ask you stick very carefully, you find that these movements in syncope, if at all any movements are there, usually they are not there. They are actually high amplitude cube twitching lasting only a few seconds, like a jerk. Uh, and unlike seizure with the rhythmic, you know, and uh, last for longer time and multiple uh, moments. And the fall, when the fall from the syncope is more gradual as compared to an atonic seizure, usually they don't hardly ever injure themselves uh, seriously when there's a syncope. And usually there will be no fecal incontinence or any tongue bite. And usual trigger factors are quite uh, you know, typical, long standing, standing in, like an assembly line or a church, exercise, heat, etc. Okay, so uh, the most important thing is again, uh, Evaluating the child for uh, taking detailed history uh, where for the red and the green flags. And if there is a doubt, the next thing to do is not a imaging, better to do an EEG. If a video EEG available is very useful because suppose the child has a particular that uh, seizure mimic during a EEG, then we can actually look at the EEG signatures. Yeah, and of course, this will be not to be discussed if it's a seizure, what to do. I uh, skip that. Now come to case four. So, case four is a five month old uh, boy who came with ecstasy crying for one day. He did not have fever, uh, was feeding well, was uh, occasionally consolable, but he was uncooperative for examination as most of the children are and was observed after giving uh, some uh, finagar or some sedative. But that lasted only for one hour. He was quite early for one hour and again he started crying. So mother was unwilling to go home. Uh, we need to figure it out. So this is a common scenario, a child with incessant cry. So uh, the issues which faces is can a normal well-appearing infant presenting with acute excessive crying as a sole symptom can have a serious underlying disease. And if so, then what test or a lab investigation or test can it help us find this thing? So the, the important thing here is there is no, even though there is a big list of things. See, I've taken it from some book. Uh, there is a three slides full of causes for incessant crying. So there's no way we can rule all this out. So this loaded list uh, evaluation will not help. So the, maybe a better thing to do is to do a systematic approach where step one, you wrote any life-threatening conditions. And then once you, once you uh, reasonably ruled out life threatening situation conditions which can present like this, then you can go for common varying conditions. Even after that, you're confused, then it may be better to observe the child till uh, either the symptoms completely disappear or something else comes up and you're able to diagnose. This is what we usually follow. I mean, I usually follow. So, step one is like, you know, serious things. So, what are serious things? We, we already had a discussion on how to pick up a, you know, evidence of common set of shock. Okay, look for subtle signs like, you know, the change in mental status, long CFT or you know, difference in central and peripheral pulse. Look at subtle signs for common set of shock. If that is there, of course, then you are dealing with a serious situation. If they, that is not there, look at temperature instabilities. Especially if fever is there, then look for, you know, all, all infections which are not very obvious. Like, for example, a common example is a urinary tract infection. So, look for that septic workup. 
some of the children uh, then make sure you check an spo2 because some of the children especially with the neurovascular disease they may not have you know obvious distress so you uh, know respiratory tachypnea or you know retractions so if spo2 is low hypoxia without much distress then suspect a neurovascular disease but when you any check spo2 suppose suddenly you find that actually spo2 is low and then you look carefully child has some distress actually then actually you may be dealing with a cardiac or a pulmonary disease so spo2 is useful for screening and look at the heart rate the heart rate is specifically very high yeah, more than 200 220 and not coming down at all even with you know some coming medications what you have tried then think of an arrhythmia and of course any bilious vomiting or for abdomen distension think of a surgical thing malnutrition is also sufficient which uh, dr kumar will be dealing with uh, in the next talk and look at the, of course look at the fault and always bulging fault and with seizure irritability and vomiting of course suspect uh, infection serious infection or trauma uh, i simply in your rash is your rash anywhere uh, recently or even the mother for an infant think of herpes encephalitis then pupil sign look at the pupils any trauma pupil signs any hypertension tachycardia this are and any j symptom these are signs of some toxin ingestion either it is you know uh, or a scorpion sting once we are a child what scorpion sting oh, mother did not notice scorpion so they are having an irritable cry there are all signs of autonomic disturbance when you look at we are it so toxins and metabolic causes things can be thought of if all these things are ruled out then most probably you are dealing with something benign so common benign conditions are these you know even nasal congestion uri throat stomatitis pharyngitis insect bites foreign bodies in the ear nose pharynx covert elaborations uh, anal fissure post immunization of course drugs some drugs and uh, you know especially sympathomimetic drugs given for common cold uh, digital tunicate so these are the common things so just have a head to toe carefully complete the strip the child and examine complete uh, a thorough examination you'll be able to find it uh, so basically thorough physical examination the key and if i can offer that nothing is found just observe the child especially since you ruled out most of the dangerous conditions so case 5 is a 2 year old child bought the allergy history of floor cleaner in uh, one hour back for home on examination the child appears conscious interactive with stable vitals this is a common thing we our, our household has maybe a dangerous place for most small uh, toddlers and infants so many chemicals are there they get into so many things starting from floor cleaner to toilet cleaner nowadays a lot of you know hand uh, sanitizers are there uh sinivas has already mentioned about mosquito repellents and all that so this is a very common thing uh, and they present to you they look all, all right to you so what to do so first question is should we do a stomach wash if you look at the evidence uh, the literature there are strong recommendations for example this is a position paper from a clinical toxicology from both american and the european uh, toxicology groups okay so they uh, definitely say that this should be it should not be performed routinely and uh, if at all for the treatment of poison patients in the rare circumstances in which used it should be performed performed by individuals with the proper training and expertise so in a peripheral clinic in an office practice better to avoid this because sometimes they can have dangerous consequences and the benefits are never been proven and most of the household chemicals no they may not uh, get benefited by an alkalic lavage and suppose there are some corrosives they can produce more damage so it's is uh, better to avoid stomp wash in your unless of course you want to do it as a punishment for the child also you want to repeat the attack but that is not our intention of course so we are not going to do it stomach wash is dangerous in the uh, peripheries what about activated charcoal even same group has also mentioned that its role is also doubtful yeah so it's got a different role in some medications and other things what sinvas has already pointed out but a child coming to you with a household ingestion this chem kind of chemicals you see the role of uh, activated charcoal is limited and uh, better to avoid it okay so single dose activated charcoal should not be administered routinely in the management of poison patients that is a statement from Uh, the toxicology group, both European and American, with uh, great evidence. So better to avoid that. Then, uh, whom to refer then? Suppose the child like this comes to you, whom to refer? Look up for any evidence of corrosive ingestion because some of these uh, toilet cleaning agents are uh, strong acids. So uh, one evidence for that may be to look at the child's oral mucosa. A normal child can ingest a corrosive substance without you know, uh, damaging his uh, oral pharynx. And uh, so a careful look at the pharynx and uh, oral mucosa. If the, everything is looking clean and nice, unlike the child has taken anything corrosive. But if there is a whitish tinge or erosions or congestion then be careful uh, there may be more damage uh, inside so you should refer the child immediately of course any systemic signs such as ultrasound sorry we should refer any significant ga symptoms repeated vomiting especially you should refer the child and there is this i made a partial list of uh, dangerous household items if parents say that this is the one they ingested then you should be very careful okay? because these are the conditions uh, these are the things which are, we have encountered as children with severe morbidity and mortality in our you know institute who are interested this for example kerosene or any hydrocarbon petrol diesel any hydrocarbon paint can turpen dye paint thinner you know. camphor uh, eucalyptus oil and neem oil they can put this in as toxicity already sinivas has mentioned that they can come the status 
any any household drugs which like paracetamol poisoning already has mentioned uh, suppose somebody in the house household is taking some uh, psychotic medications iron tablet or uh, and high high um, hypoglycemic agents if child has taken better refer because they can have complications sorry sir three more minutes sorry yeah yeah sorry uh yeah uh, we are coming to second last uh, case uh, i mean uh, almost last case yeah three year old child is brought history of alleged history of unknown bite on his right leg sustained while playing outside child is complaining of some pain at the doctor's side yeah so except for the pain nothing is there child has come to you so what are the dangerous bites in our area you see uh, uh, there are a lot of things which can bite you there are a lot of insects are there but actually what can kill you are only very few uh, what in our experience in our area what we see is only snake scorpion and sometimes bee uh, things like you know all this the dangerous spiders black widow spider and all those things they're just stuff is not seen in this part of the country likely so we need to identify when a child comes with an unknown bite we need to just figure out whether it's one of these three okay so how do you identify a snake bite uh, it's very easy of course if they've seen it the snake is there's no problem otherwise the, the first important sign for a snake bite is a significant local reaction especially if the swelling is increasing rapidly as opposed they say the initial swelling was only in the toes of fingers now it's crossed one joint then definitely it's snake bite no infection nothing else can spread so fast okay the only except except is common crate uh, common crate where uh, common crates sometimes can have absolutely not sometimes always never has a any local reaction it can be absolutely crystal clear because there will be no sign at all locally and of course fang box if it is there is useful coating up normal all of us know this how to do a whole blood coating time uh, you need just need a, any clean glass test tube or any vial take one two to three ml of blood keep it for 20 minutes doesn't clot definitely something is wrong Neur neurological manifestations okay ptosis to start with they can have any kind of uh, respiratory paralysis most common is ptosis then uh, for this uh, obviously this is another thing we should know about the clinical manifestation of uh, snake bite is a function of not only the amount of venom they ingested it's also the how much time has elapsed since bite so a, a patient a child who's got a lethal dose coming to you the half an hour being completely normal but a child who's got a sub lethal dose not enough to kill him but coming after say 8 10 hours may have significant local symptoms and you know all those things so you should also take the time into consideration when they when evaluate a child okay what about scorpion so scorpion sting of course the typical thing all of us can recognize is the characteristic autonomic storm both sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, or or activities like your hypertension profuse sweating uh no bronchorea lacrimation uh you know, and priapism etc so but the issue with this is it's commonly mistaken for shock uh, we had a excellent session on shock by tangvelu sir so the problem is is a child like this comes yesterday there is no history of uh, no it's not bite nobody knows something has become the child child comes to you with the signs it be uh, child will be looking at tachycardic cold extremities profuse sweating and you know the prolonged cft commonly managed as a shock uh, we have seen many times they be given iv fluids Uh, start around catecholamines and then referred okay, but that's it's going to be dangerous if it is scorpion sting and why because uh, you know uh, first four to six hours of scorpion sting is the sign or the time when there is a severe catecholamine you know, over i mean over uh, circulation so the sympathetic storm is there catecholamine levels are very high child is severely vaso constricted and uh, you know tachycardi because of uh, you know lot of catecholamine circulating giving more catecholamines to the child is actually can precipitate uh, cardiac arrhythmia and is uh, dangerous so please avoid doing this so how to recognize this is this uh, uh, if you carefully look at the child the bp be on the higher side of normal child will have hypertension you know so that is a immediately a suspicion you should suspect that how can a child with shock and have hypertension so that that say that is i mean catecholamine storm then look for uh, parasympathetic signs if you are unusual in shock you know especially if you boy they can have priapism some profuse oral you know secretions bronchorea those things are unusual in shock so that may should make you suspect that it may be a catecholamine storm maybe a scorpion sting then the most important thing is that they won't have any signs of cardiac toxicity at the first four to six hours when the autonomic storm is happening if you look at the heart except for tachycardia there will be no gallop there will be no lung condition except for some conducted sounds because of secretions no crepitations no respiratory gris work of breathing there is no hepatomegaly so absence of this should make you suspect that this could be a it may not be cardiac uh, cardiac failure or cardiogenic shock but of course if time is around 6 to 8 hours after scorpion sting if the child has the same presentation then usually they will have, uh, you should think of cardiogenic cardiogenic shock and manage accordingly that time they will have gallop they will have respiratory distress hepatomegaly and uh, bp will be also on the lower side of normal all right yeah this sting this sting is really uh, i mean if uh, it's not life threatening unless there is large number of stings but we uh, we have seen children getting very sick with even only one or two of these stings you know uh, child has come with bia children with enough access or even acute language in ards so it should be taken seriously you know, sometimes they can do badly so when to refer this children with unknown bite is snake bite of course if you know it's snake bite you have reason to suspect Uh, even if the cell looks completely normal please refer because this still need to be observed for at least for 24 hours unless you have the facility to do that for new your place 
uh, if child has ptosis you know, any signs of neurotoxicity please uh, don't send the child like that we have an innumerable number of cases like this where children with the neurotoxicity have been referred and on the way they are arrested and they have died but by the time they reach the our hospital or any other tertiary care center they would have been dead long back cardiac arrest you know, because sometimes the neurotoxicity can progress very fast so if you are referring a child with already having a onset of um, neuroparesis in the time of process unless it is few minutes so please uh, somehow get a you know secure the airway before referring uh, try to get you know intubate the child or accompany the child otherwise of course the neostick mean atropine is an option uh, the second option but that works only for cobra bite uh, for crate bite which is a presynaptic blocker neostick may not work and child can rapidly progress so airway protection is very important by referring this child so it interesting if child only local pain and no systemic uh, features of an autonomic storm child may not be referred you can observe them but if there is an autonomic storm please refer and when you are referring please give the first dose of prasosin 30 by kg per kg thank you thank you dr narayanan sir for the elaborate presentation and uh, the sharing your experience and knowledge with us uh, for want of time we will have a discussion in the chat box i request the audience to post their questions in the chat box now we move on to this next presentation uh, it's our pleasure to invite dr kumarvel sambandhan who is the additional professor pediatric surgery at jipmer puducherry uh, with special interest like neonatal surgery pediatric laparoscopic and robotic minimally invasive surgery sir has uh, uh, won innumerable awards including innovation award winner for two consecutive years he is a member for multidisciplinary robotic committee invited faculty for uh, association of minimal access surgeons of india he been trained in advanced pediatric robotic urological surgery at us and has multiple uh, papers and thesis presentations uh, he has guided many post graduates uh, it will be a pleasure to listen to you sir and uh, over to you dr kumarvel sir for his talk on uh, pediatric surgical emergencies in office practice thank you sir yes sir your slides are clear i think you need to unmute yourself and greetings from uh, pediatric surgery department pondicherry am i audible yes sir you are audible uh, i think you just need to rotate the screen it is the video is slightly okay uh, yeah that's so fine, fine sir. Yes, sir. No. no sir it's thank fine you. sir yeah thank you sir thank you uh, so the slides are clear i'll proceed uh, as has been i'll dive straight down into the topic i will start with an approach to a vomiting child and then proceed from there depending upon the time frame this 5 week old male infant mother says started vomiting about 2 weeks back uh, and vomited so forcefully recently that she has been sprayed and this has been happening frequently she also complains that the urine output has decreased so when a child comes like this we have a few things to ask for sorry we have few things to ask for the more first and foremost is to identify whether it is a bilious or a non bilious vomiting i will confine myself to surgical topics because as medicals you are the bosses as far as medical causes are concerned we also need to identify whether it is painless or it is associated with pain is the child eager to feed or is it refusing feeds is it been associated with constipation is there any blood in stools is there progressive decrease in urine output as the child become progressively irritable or lethargic putting the combinations of these we will be able to come to a reasonable solution so at the time same time when examining the child along with all the rest we will be looking at the abdomen particularly to look for distension whether is any upper abdominal distension or is it a diffuse distension are there any visible gastric or intestinal peristalsis any visible bowel loops is tenderness and rebound rigidity is it present and are palpable bowel masses or loops noted here i am going to show you
in the upper abdomen you are able to see classic visible gastric peristalsis which is progressing from the right and going down to the left compare this to this child where there are already multiple loops which are visible and it seems to be going from up downwards there is some respiratory there is some respiratory movement also seen but you are able to see the step ladder pattern this is visible intestinal peristalsis and this was gastric peristalsis palpation of an olive is now becoming a lost art however if you keep a child on the mother's lap warm and comfortable maybe give 5 to 10 ml of dextrose water stand by the left side of the child use your left hand palpate the edge of the liver and just dive deeper push your hand deeper under the liver we should usually be able to roll the olive however if the child is not quiet it is difficult usg is more often used nowadays as the diagnostic mode and we also need to assess dehydration status when the life uh, child is how dehydrated the child is and of course all the medical signs to differentiate it from a medical problem sonographic signs are plenty the target sign the cervix sign and the antral nipple sign here's the antral nipple sign which is clearly seen here's the target sign the length of the pylorus more than 15 to 17 mm and the thickness of the pylorus which is more than 4 mm is considered diagnostic of ihps here it is better see this is the mucosa which is hyperechoic and this is the serosa which is hyperechoic and the hypoechoic muscle in between initial management is to put in an ng tube empty the stomach fluids recommended are usually n by 2 dns with a rate up to 150 ml per kg per day bolus with normal saline depending on dehydration and potassium to be added at milli 20 milliequivalents per liter antibiotics are not required alkalosis corrects itself it is important to keep these children nil by mouth as soon as the diagnosis is made while the referral is being done as it prevents more vomiting and loss of fluid pyloromyotomy is the surgery of choice however we do not rush to pyloromyotomy as soon as we receive the child the it is more a medical emergency the electrolyte collection and the metabolic alkalosis correction takes precedence over surgery and only after those things are corrected child is operated with laparoscopic surgery the scarring is quite minimal and the child can go home in a day or two after the surgery however consider an alternative scenario with similar child but coming now with bilious vomiting it is now mandatory to rule out malrotation malrotation is considered by all of us as a ticking time bomb because the vol because of the volvulus it can undergo and delay in surgery can lead to massive gut loss by age wise there is more than 50% half the cases of malrotation and 3/4 of the cases of malrotation present by one year therefore a high index of suspicion is required in this period of time hyperacute presentation occurs in about 5% which in which indicates volvulus neonatorum where no time should be lost at referral or surgery most important cause of high intestinal obstruction because delay can lead to loss of the entire jejunum ileum or half of and half of the colon and this child is unsalvageable in our current scenarios how do we suspect malrotation bilious vomiting in a present in the presence of visible gastric peristalsis we have to have a high index of suspicion that is the most important thing and volvulus neonatorum child may have the distension of abdomen and the bowel mass is usually palpable and it is tender plain x ray the gasless abdomen is the omnious one where all the air has been absorbed because of 
they are there's no air going into the bowel because of the complete obstruction here's a child with an upper gi contrast study which shows the dj which is here should have been beyond this area but it is now in this place and in the next one i will show you video where you can see the volvulus here's the contrast which is going you can see the spiraling or the spring coil sign ultrasound may also help in the diagnosis however it is not diagnostic whirlpool sign is suggestive of volvulus the blue is the superior mesenteric vein normal and this is the superior mesenteric artery normally it should be seen in this place but it has moved to the left this is a surgeon's nightmare where a delay in diagnosis and surgery has led to complete gut loss these patients are unsalvageable without home tpn and multiple surgery so early surgery pre op stabilization is done in early diagnosis it can be skipped or should be skipped if volvulus is suspected and is done concurrently with surgery that procedure is a surgery of choice now consider a older child who has come with passing brown colored stools or blood in stools the child may be irritable with or without incessant or irritable crying and may or may not have non bilious vomiting if the child has had a similar episode 2 months back as in this case intussusception is unlikely because intussusception doesn't go away on its own if it is the first episode then intussusception would be high on the list of differential diagnosis in a child like this the differential diagnosis would be into susception a bleeding meckel's diverticulum enteric duplications with ectopic gastric mucosa and of course malrotation also ultrasound of the abdomen can diagnose into susception and therefore in a patient with bleeding per rectum an uh, ultrasound is a more important test rather than a plain x-ray as it is not so useful whereas in a child with bilious vomiting and plain x-ray would be a more suitable first test it can also diagnose or suspect duplication because of the gut signature mickels scan is also useful in this particular case that i have mentioned the ultrasound was normal and hence we requested for a mickels scan a normal mickels scan will only show the stomach and some amount of the radionuclide in the bladder as time progresses the bladder is filling up and as the child voids the bladder is become empty stomach is still persisting if after about 15 to 20 minutes we continue we see another spot a single spot you can see here it is and at 40 it is more prominent and it stays as long as the stomach is staying it is meckel's diverticulum however in our case we had multiple such spots or one long spot like that which is suggestive of a rare long tubular duplication a meckel's diverticulum which is bleeding here you can see the blood dark in the bowel whereas it is not so in the proximal limb this is a duplication cyst which also can have gastric mucosa ectopic gastric mucosa and can bleed and this is a intussusception however we had one case of this long tubular duplication which was almost 80 90 cm and we managed to save the entire bowel if on ultrasound we pick up in a similar child a target sign or a pseudo kidney appearance thanks to this doctor who has managed to show the normal kidney as well as the pseudo kidney next to each other to contrast we suspect or make a diagnosis of intussusception intussusception and if the child abdomen there are no abdominal signs and the child is not sick we would proceed with a non operative management the protocol usually is to correct the dehydration give a initial bolus start on third generation cephalosporin and metronidazole as iv antibiotics this is required before starting the procedure of saline hydrostatic reduction to avoid transmigration during the procedure 3 minutes of pressure 
about 90 centimeters of water. Usually the saline bag is kept about three feet above the child and no pressure is applied. This would help to reduce the intersusception and this is done with ultrasound guidance. Not more than three attempts are usually done at one go. If the child has completely reduced, then we bring the child back, continue IV fluids, check, or do a repeat, check ultrasound after six hours or eight hours and then start the feeds. If there is a residual intersusception, we can give another attempt, maybe four to six hours later. If that also fails, child will have to go for surgery. So I have given you various scenarios, a young baby with non-bilious vomiting, which is also hungry, a older child or a newborn with bilious vomiting, which can be malrotation, a child with bleeding per rectum, if it is painful, will colicky crying spells, it would be intersusception. If it is painless, may be recurrent, it may be Michael's diverticulum or a duplication cyst. Going to a totally different level area, a nine-year-old boy is brought with sudden onset of left scrotal pain, which is severe. And parents say it started about 12 hours ago and the child feels nauseous but has not vomited and he has no fever. Mother also complains of swelling of the left side of the scrotum. This would be consistent with an acute scrotum. The most important and the dangerous diagnosis is testicular torsion. The other differential diagnosis of testicular torsion are given here and the clinical clues that with epididymorchitis that is a known case or with GI, I mean genitourinary abnormality or recent viral illness may be present. If there is urinary tract infection, it may be related to that also. Idiopathic scrotal edema is however painless and there are no signs of infection. However, it is quite swollen up. Torsion of the appendix of the testicle is described. Blue dot sign is well described however hardly seen in our dark skin. History of trauma, if it is forthcoming and significant, should be taken into account. Tumor, inguinal hernia and varicoceles are usually more chronic things. So what is classical testicular torsion pain and symptomatology? We usually see severe unilateral testicular pain can be associated with nausea and vomiting and may have nonspecific symptoms also to uh, confuses and they may also give history of minor trauma or some physical exercise even though no association has been confirmed. The ipsilateral skin may be indurated erythematous. The left testis is usually lower than the right testis and if it is higher than the right we can suspect that it might be torsion. It is usually because of the foreshortened spermatic cord. The testis may or may not have a horizontal orientation and cremastic reflex is usually absent. However, if both sides cremastic reflex cannot be elicited in a child, then this yeah, test is not so useful. Prediction of viability of the testicle is difficult. However, it is reported that if they present within six hours of onset, which I have not seen in the last 20 years or so, the surgical exploration gives a 90 to 100 percent salvage rate. If it is between 12 and 24 hours, it's about only about 50 percent. And if it is 24 to or beyond, it's less than 10 percent. However, given the importance of the organ, we have to suggest, even though there is so much of uh, description I have given on examination and such, we have to su suggest immediate surgical exploration if the child has come in a salvageable state that is less than 20, uh, 24 to 48 hours. So that is what is suggested by most of the uh, guidelines also that immediate surgical exploration if it is consistent or highly suggestive of testicular torsion. If there is questionable diagnosis, they would advise Doppler ultrasound but they also give a caveat, do not delay surgical referral for imaging. So unless 
a OPD setting or a clinic has an associated ultrasound, it is not feasible or it causes delay in presentation or referral. Absent blood flow may not always be pre is always present with torsion, but the peripheral tissue may show increased blood, which blood flow, which can be mistaken for peritesticular blood flow may be mistaken, and therefore there might be some blood flow shown around the, in the scrotum, which is misdiagnosed. Therefore, Doppler ultrasound, unless done by a, an expert who is with children, it is not as useful as described in literature. Immediate surgical exploration, if it is before 48 hours, and if it is beyond 48 hours of presentation, go ahead with the ultrasound or whatever, and then do the referral because in any case, testicular the salvage is very unlikely. This is a child who came to us about three weeks back. First, they found that ultrasound was done elsewhere. Uh, there was some flow. The 24 hours later, the pain was persisting. So they got another ultrasound done. The, that time it was unequivocal and a third ultrasound was done on the third day, which also showed some blood flow, but there was heterogeneous uh, eco texture of the testis at which time it was referred. And this is a torsion of the testis. It is already black. This would have been torsion of the testis from the beginning. Opposite side is usually uh, pexed. That is, an orchidopexy is done of the opposite side because 80% of these cases, the, the potential for torsion is bilateral in up to 80 cases, 80% 80 of the cases. This is the bell clapper phenomena, which if is present on one side, which predisposes to torsion, is in 80% of the times present on the opposite side also. Sorry, sir. Five more minutes, sir. Yeah, I uh, will be completing quite. Uh, for, as a request from the uh, Professor uh, Angavilo, I thought I will just cover quickly, even though the video and other things are not my own. Non-suture wound closure would be of much use in the clinic. However, the utility of this is in relatively small clean wounds where the edges are clean and there is no tissue loss or tension in bringing these two edges together. These can be considered, absence of these can be considered contraindications. It should also not be bleeding overly. It should not be over mobile areas like joints, and the patient should have presented with it early within six to 12 hours. Delayed presentation also, it doesn't help as much. So what are these non-suture wound closure techniques? Simple lacerations with only slightly separated wound edges can be used with adhesive strips, what are known as steri strips, which are clinic, uh, commercially available, a little expensive, or with micropore, one can fashion their own steri strips. The wound edges should be cleaned, preferably with saline, a jet of saline, made dry, apply benzoin, tincture benzoin around the wound, but don't put it inside afterwards, the child will run away from you. And bring those two edges together, place the strips with some space in between. So the each strip should be about three millimeters or so. And you give a gap of another three or four millimeters, place another strip and close the wound. Keep dry for about 72 hours. If you, the stickiness is not so great, therefore either with steri strips or with uh, micropore. And therefore, if it is wet or it gets wet, these would open up and the scarring would be pretty bad. The other alternative is to use the dermobond glue or the tissue ad adhesive. It is monoctanyl cyanacrylate, basically what super glue that we use commonly in households, but this is medical grade and therefore costs about a thousand times more expensive. Uh, used on wounds with clean edges. And again, it should not be under great tension. Minimal tension is acceptable, but it should not be under great tension. It is best for wounds less than three centimeters. For wounds greater than three centimeters, if the subcutaneous tissue is sutured, then it can be used. But if one is suturing that, one may use as well suture the skin also. It is not to be used on mucosal surfaces. It should be 
the eye should be protected. So if it is being used in the chin or forehead or something, pad the eyes and apply ointment into the eyes and then pad the eyes so that it does not get into the eyes. Do not allow glue to enter the wound itself. Then it will not heal because it acts as a foreign body. The exact procedure I will proceed in the I will show in the next one. And it need not be removed as it is. As it is, uh, it will fall off in a couple of weeks. This is a video I have borrowed from University of San Francisco. So this is the derma point, and you can use in small lesion like this. So as I said, you should get both these edges of the wound together and then apply it. It should not be applied like this, like pasting two sheets. If that is done, there will be a foreign body reaction. It also causes heat. So you can apply some neomycin or something like that oint ointment around it. and get the wound edges together. So you require one assistant to do this. So there are different types of applicators. So read the instructions because each of them have slightly different ways of this one. In this, you are breaking the glass inside. In another one, it will be a twist. There are different applicators. And you first apply it together. Then you start applying around. And then you start applying again. So three layers are uh, applied with about 20 to 30 seconds between each layer. So first layer, give a gap of 20 seconds to 30 seconds to dry. Then second layer, then the third layer. And in one and a half to two minutes, the entire thing is dry. And you can leave it as it is. So next, I thought I would uh, add a few slides on foreign body injection, even though it has been covered. This three-year-old child is brought with a history of swallowing a coin about three hours back. What would we do? This is straight, straight from Naspogan guidelines. We would ensure that the child is not sick. If the child is not sick, then we would take the child up for an x-ray and identify. Otherwise, we will stabilize and then take the x-ray. Usually, x-ray would tell us what the type of foreign body is it and where is it. If the child is having drooling, dysphagia, respiratory compromise, then of course urgent endoscopic removal is required. And if it is asymptomatic, for example, in a coin, sorry, uh, for example, in a coin, one can wait for about 24 hours, even if it is in the esophagus. And if it has not gone down, then it can be removed. However, in case of gastric foreign body, then if it has passed into the stomach, usually, and the child is asymptomatic, usually it can be left alone and a repeat x-ray or ask the parents to strain the stool and see it regularly. And one can identify that it has come out. Otherwise, after two to four weeks, it can be removed. If it does not come out in three weeks, usually it means that there is something wrong in the passage. If it is small bowel, again, it is the same. It is similar to stomach. However, we may require surgical removal in these cases if it has not passed out. And usually it is associated with either a stricture or a meckels or something like that underlying. This eight-month-old child was brought to us with a history of swallowing a battery about four hours back. X-ray was taken. And these are the guidelines. However, most common scenarios which would come to an office practice are the child is stable and therefore can be referred for immediate. If it is esophageal and it is stable, it is referred for immediate removal. If it is gastric or beyond and the child is less than five years and the, uh, the yeah, sorry, if the child is greater than five years and the uh, foreign battery is less than two centimeters, the child can be observed under outpatient. Usually after two days, we take a repeat x-ray, make sure that it is passing along. And if after two weeks, it is not passed out, then we need to remove it. 
However, if there is any suspicion of symptoms, then it needs to be removed immediately. Here's the child which came at four hours. It uh, went to a uh, the primary uh, the pediatrician who has uh, I didn't taken an X-ray and referred it to us. Child reached us after 31 hours. This was the X-ray. The lateral one shows the step beautifully, showing that it is a uh, that it is a, the button battery. It was about 12 millimeters, and here you can see the rim sign. Since the child was asymptomatic and it was referred for uh, endoscopies, the endoscopist did it the next day morning, and this is what they removed, and it was removed uneventfully. So stomach and it is non-progressive, it should be removed. Or if it is more than 15 millimeters, 20 millimeters, it should be removed as early as possible. Sharp radio, uh, sharp objects on ingestion in the esophagus, urgent removal. If it is gastric, it should be removed urgently unless it is very short. short. Whereas if it has gone beyond the stomach, then Clinical follow-up, if they are asymptomatic, is more suitable. Sorry, sir. One more minute. Sorry. Yeah, this is the last slide. This is our uh, uh, data of 150 cases over a period of three years. We had only 3% of surgical removal required. This only goes to show that if it passes beyond the stomach and it's not a, uh, even button batteries, they invariably come out even if they are sharps or button batteries. This was 8 and 38%. Many thanks to my patients and parents for their uh, uh, who formed the majority of my experience. My thanks to my residents for the data and with all that they put up with. Thank you one and all for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Kumarvel, sir, uh, for your elaborate presentation and sharing your valuable, been spending your valuable time with us and uh, sharing your vast knowledge and experience. Uh, I think there will be a few questions uh, which can be answered in the chat box. Now, uh, uh, with that, we just move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Vijay Williams, who has completed his DM Pediatric Critical Care from PG Chandigarh, currently Associate Consultant Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at Glenigals Global Health City, Chennai. He has his areas of interest in fluids, DKA, ventilation, AKA, and uh, peritransplantation care. Uh, multiple publications, multiple awards. Uh, yeah, we are waiting to listen to you, Dr. Vijay Williams. Over to you. His slides are yeah visible. Is it visible? Yeah, it is visible and audio is also clear. You can proceed, Dr. Vijay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so, uh, as the time has delayed, my slides have also got reduced proportionately. So, today, over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, what we will do is uh, uh, discuss on basic principles while approaching a child with coma, the common etiologies which we encounter in our clinical practice, emergency stabilization of these kids, key management strategies, and a bit about neurocritical monitoring. So I would like to begin my talk by this uh, quote by William James, who said that everyone knows what consciousness is until one attempts to define it. So consciousness includes two key elements. One is arousal, another one is awareness. Arousal is dependent on reticular activating system and awareness is dependent on the cerebral hemispheres. So coma is an extreme state of unresponsiveness where there is absence of arousal and awareness Practically, one may take that if these two are absent for more than one hour, we should assume that the child may be comatose. Coma occurs when there is an extensive damage of reticular activating system or when there is a diffuse or multifocal bilateral cerebral dysfunction. We need to note that unilateral lesions usually do not cause coma unless there is a secondary compression or compromise of the other hemisphere or reticular activating system. So, Coma is a relative common medical or sometimes surgical emergency, which accounts to about 4.7% uh, over 1 lakh population per year. And even in children less than 16 years, it may increase up to 30 per lakh children in less than uh, 16 years. So it is a common presentation uh, to a pediatric emergency uh, and we are more likely to see such cases. The causes can broadly be classified into two. One, it could be traumatic, 
or it could be non traumatic the non traumatic ones could be infective hypoxic ischemic metabolic vascular and rarely malignancy if we see the the traumatic brain injury the major event which causes damage and triggers everything is the direct injury which occurs which may be an acceleration or injury or a deceleration injury which commonly occurs during a road traffic accident or during non accidental trauma as well in non traumatic coma the usual causes can be classified as focal intracranial lesions which may include vascular lesions like an infarct bleed or malformations or a tumor or abscesses sometimes cs of overproduction or obstruction can lead on to hydrocephalus leading on to raised icp and in many cases generalized brain injury most commonly in our setting we see infectious that is acute meningoencephalitis or a chronic tuberculous meningitis presenting as non traumatic coma other common causes include hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy osmolar injuries which we commonly see in dk hypernatremic dehydration and in liver diseases such as ray syndrome or hepatic encephalopathy due to any a uh, significant fulminant hepatic failure and metabolic crisis and finally intoxications uh, a lot has been discussed uh, before the by the speakers before me can all lead to non traumatic coma so what is more worrisome is be it uh, traumatic brain injury which is in one time single incident or a non traumatic cause which can be a continuous process the majority of injury or the manifestation is due to secondary injury which usually occurs 2 to 3 days post injury this leads on to a state of cerebral edema which eventually culminates in raised icp so while managing a patient with raised icp we need to remember the age old monroe kelly doctrine that brain is composed of three elements brain csf and blood whenever one component increases it may compromise the other component the most important component which we are determined or which we are uh, more uh, um, uh, which we are uh, uh, afraid to compromise is the cerebral perfusion the cerebral perfusion pressure is given by the formula mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure so whenever the mean arterial blood pressure gets compromised or when the intracranial pressure gets increased the cerebral perfusion gets compromised this leads to decrease in oxygen and nutrients thus leading on to ischemia and cell death so the balance is very important and we need to understand that this cerebral blood flow is mainly determined by some three elements this may include blood pressure which is the mean arterial pressure and pao2 and pco2 so the zone of auto regulation occurs at a particular zone when changes in these three parameters may not affect the blood flow however in extreme conditions these three parameters play a key important role not only these factors in uh, in, uh, in by their own but also the duration of these factors also tends to affect the blood flow uh, blood flow and the ischemia that the brain suffers so in a emergency when a such a child presents to us as discussed by dr balaji in his initial presentation we need to evaluate identify and intervene and then reevaluate once the once we have intervened the patient so what we what is post specific about neurological cases who present with coma we need to quickly remember the neurological abcdf which includes neck examination airway breathing and circulation disability especially dextrose monitoring exposure wherein we need to check for rashes bites and bleeding and electrolytes especially sodium and also uh, take a look at the fever and if the child had any seizures objectively we can assess by two scales one is the avpu scale wherein the child may be alert he may be responsive to verbal stimulus or he may be responsible or responsive only to painful stimuli or he may be unresponsive the more objective method since this is, since avpu is a rapid but rough method the more objective method is the gcs scale which we commonly use though it is extrapolated from traumatic brain injury so the three components include eye opening response verbal response and motor response and the maximum score is 15 so based on this scale whenever a child presents with a gcs of less than 8 or if there is any evidence of herniation that is unequal pupil abnormal posturing or abnormal breathing or if the child is completely apneic or in other conditions whenever the child has any fluid refractory shock or hypoxia which is not related to neurological so these are common indications wherein i will intubate up front and and ventilate these children so we need to follow rapid sequence intubation with caution in order to avoid icp increase during such procedures so whenever such cases especially a child who has suffered road traffic accident comes to us with coma we be should be mindful of the neck injury whenever suspected we need to stabilize the neck first use a neck collar if not available at least use two saline bottles and a strap so that the neck is prevented from movement 
use jaw thrust and never try to extend the neck during the time of intubation quickly check for correctable factors like hypoglycemia hypoxia hypotension and rhythm disturbances especially when the child is having extreme tachycardia if at all any of these is identified try to intervene start a face mask oxygen if the gcs is more than 8 establish a good iv access use fluids and vasopressors if needed and try to resuscitate these children after the resuscitation take a quick sample history with key focus on antecedent symptoms especially whether there was fever or not look at the onset and progression of each symptom whether there was any medication use because accidental poisoning as uh, well described by dr narayanan it is very common and and also ask for trimural trauma and violent shaking to rule out non accidental traumas also animal bite is a very important history that we need to take and always take into consideration local epidemiology and circumstantial history vitals can give us many clues like pulse blood pressure and temperature and their variations could point to the diagnosis and the severity of symptoms as well also note that the respiratory rate wise a child can have tachypnea which may be related to acidosis or pneumonia or there can be bradypnea which can be a sign of brain stem compression all sorts of abnormal respiratory pattern can be seen in brain stem dysfunction which can vary from chain stroke basing where then there is a periodic hyperventilation and hypoventilation and there can be apneuses ataxics and in extreme states the child can present to us with apnea and respiratory arrest pupillary examination is the key eyes are windows to the brain so we can see different sizes of pupil and reactivity what is more concerning to us is that we should be in the watch out for Uh, unequal pupil and dilated non-reactive pupil and very small constricted pupil because these can point to different lesions and especially if a child is having absent brain stem reflexes after ruling out neck injury we need to do a complete dolze examination and ocular vestibular reflex as a clinician in the emergency we need to pick the signs of lateralization which may include un unequal pupil facial asymmetry focal seizures unilateral hypo or hyper hypertonia asymmetric deep tendon reflexes and unilateral extensor plantar which may sort of localize or lateralize a lesion what is more important is since herniation syndromes require urgent management be it whatever type of herniation we need not uh, understand that this sign is specific for this type of herniation what we need to understand is that any child who presents with abnormal breathing any abnormal posturing be it decorticate or decerebrate any third nerve palsy and, and and especially apnea we need to consider that the child is having herniation syndrome and we need to aggressively manage this child i uh, as we can see in this picture here these are uh, the upper one is the decorticate posturing wherein we can see the flexion of the upper limb and uh, which is and the supination of the arm and the lower picture shows the decerebrate posturing wherein there is extension of arm and wrist with pronation finally we need to examine for meningeal irritation which includes neck rigidity the kernicks and grudzinski sign but beware that all infants may not demonstrate these signs and occult meningitis and meningitis may be present in these children so having gone through a quick history and examination we may able to localize or form a provisional diagnosis in our mind if there are if there is absence of localizing or lateralizing feature it can be any of the severe systemic illness be it shock or it could be post ictal or non convulsive status any metabolic intoxication or a post infectious cause which can lead on to a diffuse presentation or it could be a vascular or a bleed ictal or post uh, or post ictal tort paresis if there are any signs of focality in our examination if there are clinical signs of meningeal irritation it could be a uh, infective process or sometimes subarachnoid bleed can also present with significant meningeal signs once we form a provisional diagnosis in our mind we investigate with the basic investigations like serum electrolyte glucose a, a blood gas analysis with anion gap do a complete blood count if infection is suspected do a renal renal function test especially if the child is having oliguria or having disproportionate hypertension on examination liver function with ammonia especially hepatic encephalopathy is suspected do a toxicology screen of of blood and urine if any signs of intoxication is suspected and we can screen for infection based on the local epidemiology for example if the clinical symptoms are are uh, suspicious of uh, scrub typhus or a malarial infection or if the child is having comes from a local area where this these diseases are endemic we need to screen for such in infections up front 
when do we do imaging so head ct is needed in all conditions of traumatic brain injury and whenever any structural abnormality such as a bleed abscess tumor or hydrocephalus is suspected the point to note is a normal ct does not rule out raised icp brain mri is a useful modality wherein the he, wherein the head ct is non down diagnostic or if there is a posterior fossa lesion so where feasible and if the patients are affordable in conditions of non traumatic coma we may go in for brain mri more than ct but if in your center the ct is available go for a ct csf examination is usually done in whenever the csf infection is suspected and it's the gold standard test for proving meningitis so we do basic csf studies like protein glucose cell count gram stain and aerobic culture always preserve additional samples depending on the possible etiology and in we have to exert caution in children more than 12 months in whom sutures are starting to close and with especially with gcs less than 12 as fundus examination and head imaging even if done prior even prior to lb may not effectively rule out raised icp especially when there are features of focality on clinical examination eg is as such not a great tool to be used up front uh, in a case of non traumatic coma but as suggested by dr uh, kalaimaran in stock any explain unexplained encephalopathy after the initial evaluation especially in a status epilepticus setting wherein we are suspecting non convulsive status epilepticus we may use majority of traumatic brain injury studies have shown that during the initial phase the egs may show non specific findings in up to 30% of cases which may resolve spontaneously after one month of observation so in such cases wherein we are suspecting a specific diagnosis such as uh, or a finding such as hsv or ssp or when non convulsive status is suspected we may go ahead and do eeg and in such case, in status epilepticus wherein we are using a medication to control these seizures or we want to achieve such targets we may use a eeg examination the management strategies include two fold one we have to preserve the cerebral blood flow and the second is to lower the intracranial pressure in simple terms we need to rest the brain <clears throat> sorry any child presenting with coma should be presumed to have raised icp should i treat all patients with low gcs a gcs of 12 to 15 needs close observation and you may start neuroprotective measures any child with gcs of 9 to 11 start neuroprotection and osmotherapy uh, as per necessity and any child with gcs of less than 8 intubate and follow all tires based on the response observed from the child it is always better to over treat these children than under treat them the neuroprotective bundle which is commonly suggested includes simple steps like head end elevation to 30 degree midline headline pos- mid- midline position minimal stimulation adequate pseudo analgesia use lidocaine before any plain uh, full procedure or suctioning try to maintain euglycemia or try to maintain a normal state that is euglycemia euthermia avoid fever euvolemia normoxemia and normocardia other important components which we can try to main, ma- manage in our setting are stress ulcer prophylaxis prevent bed sores give a good bladder and bowel care i care with lubricants and prevent exposure keratitis and dvt prophylaxis especially in obese children and those with traumatic injury who require prolonged immobilization all children who have tbi had to be started on some kind of an antiepileptic which is usually given for a period of 7 days to prevent early post traumatic seizures but as discussed in our previous lecture there is no role of prophylactic aed in non traumatic coma if the child is found seizing give benzodiazepines if whether to give levipril or phenytoin there is insufficient recommendation at at present to recommend one over other give whatever is available at your setting at the earliest which drug to use sedation for sedation any stimuli be it agitation pain or ventilator asynchrony can worsen an icp we need to avoid bolus administrations of midazolam or fentanyl during icp crisis as this may cause hypotension and worsen cerebral hypoperfusion better to avoid propofol as it as it can again cause uh, hypotension during prolonged infusion and metabolic acidosis the current recommendation says that the choice and dosing of analgesics and sedatives have to be left to the local physician what we commonly use is a combination of midazolam and fentanyl osmotherapy there are two drugs which we commonly use manitol and hypotonic saline manitol has a vast history and experience easily available however it has uh, it does cause hypotension and worsen acute kidney injury and longer use may not be helpful and it has to be given as a bolus and repeated over 4 to 6 hours hypertonic saline has there is increasing evidence that it is it performs better than manitol 
a slower and a smoother control of ACP, and many centers have routinely started using hypertonic saline yes, in their management of ICP. So the current consensus states that the mannitol has to be used at doses of 1.25 to 5 ml per kg over 20 minutes. In cases of herniation syndrome or whenever there is an acute elevation of ICP, can be repeated every 4 to 6 hourly. What is suggested for 3% saline is a dose of 2 to 5 ml per kg bolus over 10 to 20 minutes for ICP control, followed by continuous infusion of 0.1 to 1 ml per kg per hour on a siding scale for 48 to 72 hours with a target sodium of 145 to 155. If you are having a facility to ICP monitor, we titrate these doses to maintain an ICP target of less than 20. There is no role of steroids in traumatic brain injury. However, if you are suspecting intracranial tumors with perilational edema or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or TBM or significant neurocystic sarcosis with high lesion load with edema, we can use dexamethasone as the preferred steroid. Acetazolamide, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, which decreases CSF production, is primarily used for acute hydrocephalus and in, and in uh, chronic phase also, used in benign intracranial hypertensions and high altitude sickness. Any signs who children who presents with herniation pathway identify by pupillary asymmetry, posturing, bradycardia, apnea, or abnormal breathing. If any, hyperventilate them till pupillary signs reverse, give 100% FAO2. Give a stat dose of mannitol if not available, hypertonic saline, and try to do a urgency, urgent imaging and maybe a CSF drainage or a decompression, which may be necessary. Hyperventilation is routinely not recommended. It is usually recommended as a short-term temporizing measure and aggressive hyperventilation, that is PCO2 of less than 25 should be avoided as it per se causes ischemia. So when to consult a neurosurgeon, whenever there is a mass lesion such as blood, tumor or abscess that needs removal. Any hydrocephalus that needs a CSF diversion procedure, maybe a congenital hydrocephalus or, a, or an acquired case such as a tubercular meningitis with hydrocephalus, which needs diversion. Whenever you need to place an ICP catheter for monitoring, a decompressive craniectomy, uh, when all first and second tire measures fail, a neurosurgeon needs to be consultant and involved. There are various modality to monitor uh, monitor uh, ICP in an advanced ICU setting, uh, which uh, is good to know, uh, but many centers do not have all the facility. One, one important monitoring tool, which I will discuss shortly is ICP monitoring. It has been found that use of ICP monitoring in the initial 48 hours has been associated with better predict, uh, has been associated with better survival. Uh, whether to target ICP or CPP, the threshold for ICP is to get it to less than 20. There are various CPP targets which are age-based and we try to bring up the map so that we try to maintain the cerebral perfusion. And if all the targets cannot be met by maximal use of vasopressors and fluids, it is important to bring down the ICP by using measures such as mannitol or hypertonic saline. So what if our center does not have ICP? So this is the only trial I'll discuss in this uh, presentation. So this is an adult trial which included children more than 13 years of severe traumatic brain injury. And what they did is uh, they had a pressure monitoring group and an, and an imaging clinical group, wherein they did frequent clinical examinations and frequent imaging as per necessity. And their outcome was functional and cognitive status score at the end of six, uh, six months and uh, six months mortality. And they found that Children who were monitored with ICP at less than or equal to 20 uh, mm of mercury was not found to be superior when intensive care based serial CT scans and clinical examination was conducted. So I would still feel that your centers does not have ICP facility, go with your clinical examination, do appropriate clinical imaging when indicated, consult your surgical colleague whenever there is necessity to drain, their, uh, drain the uh, uh, and reduce the ICP. The take home point points would be medicoma is a neurological emergency which requires quick identification of treatable causes. Emergency stabilization and complete neurological examination is necessary. Early neuroimaging with CT may be needed in traumatic coma and MRI in non traumatic coma and seek surgical consultation when necessary. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Vijay, for uh, keeping it short and sweet. Uh, it was actually an elaborate presentation on the various causes of uh, altered sensorium. I think uh, it will be uh, good for uh, discussion points to be made on the chat box. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Vijay. Uh, now we move on to the uh, fag end of the lecture. I think uh, the next speaker is none other than Dr. Sashidharan, uh, who doesn't need much introduction. 
uh, as he starts his presentation is the uh, completed dm pediatric critical care from pj chandigarh uh, currently consultant intensivist and head pacu at metha multi specialty hospital program director of dnb pediatric critical care and uh, director of vs institute of hematology and oncology chennai uh, i think short of time uh, i'll stop with this and over to dr sasidharan sir for his presentation on uh, approach to respiratory distress and uh, respiratory support therapy in children over to you sir am i audible uh, balaji yeah yes yes your slides are clear and your audible yeah. can go ahead. yeah so uh, we have come to the fag end of today's session and it's a quite an interesting session thanks to uh, once again to tamil nadu state chapter of iap as well my mentor dr tangavelu sir for completely designing the program and uh, guiding us to uh, create uh, uh, this uh, pediatric emergency medicine um, <coughs> module 1 uh, as a starting lecture program starting as a cme program so uh, we will go directly into the presentation so we are going to discuss about approach to child with respiratory distress and respiratory support therapy i am going to have three parts to this presentation first is going to be the approach to yeah approach to child with respiratory distress so uh when uh, we are going to discuss about respiratory distress we discuss in many patterns so here um, uh, when uh, we are uh, concentrating on the emergency medicine approach so we will try to go by questions so uh, there are six questions which will help you to understand the respiratory distress in any given child so first question is what is the primary cause the primary cause as you know it can be a primary respiratory cause or a cardiac cause or a neurological cause if it is a respiratory cause then you have to ask your second question what is the primary fo pulmonary focus and uh, in that the answer can be airway or lung parenchyma or mix it then is it a progressive pulmonary disease or not and then is there any concomitant illness and then you try to grade the uh, degree of respiratory distress using an objective scale and then you use the adjunctive measures to decide about what is the next therapy to support so we go questions one by one what is the primary cause of respiratory distress the most important thing to understand is there are three types of causes one is respiratory cause another is cardiac cause another is neurological cause why we need to discuss the crux uh, reason behind this the support therapy for each is different and respiratory support is not the only therapy for any type of respiratory distress for example if you go through this uh, uh, respiratory cause you may need to optimize the respiratory support but you have to treat the infection therapy for inflammation protective care for other organs becomes equally important the same way if you go for cardiac cause uh, primary disease correction optimizing the preload optimizing the afterload or afterload reduction becomes quite important appropriate respiratory support therapy is an another part of the therapeutic regimen if you go to neurological airway maintenance and respiratory support are hugely important it is life saving nobody is going to refute it but the primary disease treatment is going to be important so uh, this is the uh, reason the pattern of approach is going to be different and therapeutic measures are going to be different that is why we have to try to answer mm -hmm. this first question so when we go to the next question the approach to progressive pulmonary disease if it is a pulmonary disease what is the primary focus of pulmonary involvement primary focus of pulmonary involvement can be an airway disease which have been extensively discussed by dr muthaya in his previous session on obstructive airway disease this can be a high resistance lung and the other possibility is a lung tissue disease which we call it as a predominant lung tissue disease or a low compliance lung so otherwise this can be a pneumonia ards spectrum but one thing which we need to understand is when a disease progression happens that can be a overlap and that can be a, a, a mixed lung disease pattern means a pediatric ards spectrum may evolve to have some amount of obstructive airway feature a child starting with a bronchiolitis develop multiple atelectasis and evolve to have a significant amount of parenchymal involvement so this is quite common this we should not miss to decide about what is the appropriate respiratory support so to understand this further i have just given a diagram saying that so you may start with alveolar disease you may start with airway disease you may start with an interstitial disease but when there is a stay of hospital or some amount of therapy 
because of the change in extravascular lung water or you call it as a incipient pulmonary edema uh, the child's uh, lung uh, condition may get to a mixed lung pattern and there may be more than one system one um, uh, component involvement may happen this we may call it as a mixed lung disease why it is important even in er so for example you may have a fresh patient coming to er as a first um, uh, contact and they may be having a primary lung disease and you may be giving the therapy the other possibility is in a tertiary care er you may be receiving a patient who have already been treated or even ventilated sometimes back from the other hospital so in those cases you may need to have an idea about the mixed lung disease to decide about what is the appropriate therapy for that index index patient this is very important so uh, the fourth question which is a very important question after understanding whether it is a mixed lung disease or a primary airway disease or a primary parenchymal disease is, is there any coexisting or pre-existing disease most of the time it need not be a single identifiable cause and there may be more than one cause so more than one cause may be considered as a coexisting cause for example a child with viral bronchiolitis may be having a myocarditis typical is an rsv infection a child with left to run shunt lesion with vsd may be presenting with a pneumonia a child with encephalopathy may be having an aspiration pneumonia a child with uh, community acquired pneumonia may be having a baseline neurometabolic disease and child with pneumonia can evolve into sepsis and septic encephalopathy and may be having all kind of organ involvement so these things are quite common so these are all very important to understand because based on that our respiratory support therapy will evolve and uh, how to assess the severity now we come to the very important question after understanding whether the child is having respiratory distress and uh, whether it is a primary pulmonary or cardiac or uh, mm -hmm. neurological and then answering whether it is a progressive or a static disease and then understanding whether it is a mixed pattern or not now you have to answer what is the severity of disease to understand what is the support is really needed so uh, this uh, table is just to emphasize that there is a huge overlap of clinical signs and symptoms between the mild and moderate respiratory distress why we say that so because of which we need to understand that the uh, in view of a huge clinical signs overlap we may need to have an objective criteria rather than classifying any patients based on um, uh, subjective uh, symptoms alone. So with this background, we will go uh, and identify one applicable objective criteria. So this is maybe oversimplified table. I may really say that it is an oversimplified table, but this oversimplified table may be extremely useful in emergency room. So this is a table which mm -hmm. gives a, um, a respiratory rate uh, band so the respiratory red, red band is color coded this is a green band which is a normal for 0 to 3 months 3 to 6 months 6 to 12 months 1 to 3 years 6 year and 10 year and uh, uh, on left side we have a bradypnea spectrum on right side we have a uh, tachypnea spectrum in the tachypnea spectrum this yellow and red may be considered as mild to moderate respiratory distress and this can be considered as severe or impending or respiratory failure and this bradypnea spectrum uh, this bradypnea spectrum may be associated with some neurological conditions if you progress on this direction this also <laughs> indicates a respiratory failure maybe because of a primary neurological cause um, so here if there is a mild to moderate respiratory distress we will start with oxygen support so the oxygen support usually if it persists to be a saturation less than 92 percentage we may uh, we uh, we are trying to say that despite the oxygen standard simple flow or face mask support the patient is not improving what we may end up in doing is we may in, end up in escalating the support to the next level that may be a high flow cpap or niv as we have discussed in the previous slides so uh, is it so simple just by uh, looking at this table anybody can classify and start respiratory support therapy that may not always be right that's why i classically told that it is a oversimplified uh, flow chart so we have to have these other components into mind to uh, make a, a reasonable decision so uh, the all the supplementary measures or we can call it as a supplementary measures the supplementary measures are uh, either, uh, the whether the disease is uh, acute or chronic based on the disease duration and other symptomatology work of breathing how much bad and how much good and response to therapy whether the initial oxygen response is good or not initial nebulization response is good or not and past episodes of similar illness, whether the child is having a repeated admissions or ER visits due to um, uh, kind of a VC chest. 
or hemodynamics and other organ function whether it is an isolated lung disease or having any other concomitant organ dysfunction and what is your uh, blood says like uh, arterial blood gas and microcirculatory assessment what does it say about the current status of the child so this is a very important component so these six questions if we try to answer we would be able to plot the primary pathway of disease in index child and we would be able to uh, grade the severity of the disease and at the same time we would be able to decide what is the respiratory support therapy needed so now we go to the second part of the discussion what is respiratory support therapy so the respiratory support therapy this is a very simple uh, uh, thing to introduce you to what is the kind of respiratory support therapy available every one of you would be familiar with this so oxygen administration non invasive ventilation invasive conventional modes of ventilation advanced modes of ventilation or extra corporeal therapy this is how the escalation of respiratory support therapy is going to happen in any kind of patient admitted in er or in icu so this one oxygen and non invasive ventilation currently we classify that as non invasive respiratory support therapy so when you go uh, a little bit in depth to understand when to start what this diagram will help you to understand when to start what so this is a basic physiology uh, again a simplified kind of a diagram what is the normal breathing status early respiratory failure and late respiratory failure we are taking into account the trajectories of only two parameters one is paco2 one another is pao2 pao2 remains normal paco2 remains normal that is 40 and uh, close to 90 so this is a, a kind of normal breathing pattern when there is an early respiratory failure what happens is the paco2 is maintained okay but the pao2 drops to an extent so the compensatory mechanisms will get activated means the child breathes fast so because of the fast breathing the co2 goes down but i uh, uh, in the expense of co2 going down your pao2 is maintained uh, in a plateau level uh, there is a cliff point uh, like uh, what uh, tangavelu sir uh, has uh, shown in a diagram of hypotension in shock this is the cliff point for hypoxia beyond which the trajectories of co2 and pao2 becomes completely unpredictable so why we need to understand that so before this unpredictable uh, cliff so this is the scope for non invasive respiratory support therapy if uh, the unpredictable cliff has already touched by the uh, index child then that is not a right uh, scope for non invasive respiratory support these patients to be intubated and ventilated and on the fag end they may require the uh, extra corporeal support if they are presenting very late with a very uh, progressive lung disease pattern and predominantly parenchymal so with this we want to understand what is available to us in the toolbox in emergency room so whatever be the hospital whether it is a primary setup or it is a district level hospital uh, or it is a er of the tertiary care hospital so now the toolbox is relatively simplified though there are many things available we try to use only few things so it is better to know those a few things in depth so first oxygen support therapy um, you know, the list starts with the low flow devices that is a standard flow nasal cannula standard flow nasal cannula is a simple nasal cannula where if you give one or two liters of flow uh, two liters of flow delivers around close to 0.28 or 28 percentage of fao2 so by increasing the flow rate you may not achieve much in fao2 increase and that is not a right way to treat as well so in simple nasal flow Uh, because it being a low flow device we try to restrict the flow to this extent one one way so there is a, another important device a simple face mask which is right and left used and based on the flow rate the fio2 delivery has been tabulated so 4 liter will be the minimum flow rate to start with usually we start 4 to 5 liters so 0.36 to 0.4 is the routine fio2 delivery and if you increase it further you may reach up to 0.6 that is 60% fio2 up to you may reach with a simple face mask if you increase the flow rate up to 8 liter per minute so the very very important which has been uh, multiple time emphasized by the previous presenters especially in shock and recognition of sick child that is a non rebreathing mask non rebreathing mask biggest advantage is you achieve uh, fao2 something close to 100 percentage it is not always 100 percentage though the mechanism says that uh, uh, this is 100 percent so it is close to 80 to 90 percentage Uh, most of the time so this is another very very important uh, support to measure usually when a child is presenting with uh, more than one organ involvement especially the child is having a perfusion abnormalities this is the first step uh, respiratory support or oxygen support method we start in the emergency room 
uh, purposefully i discussed uh, i didn't discuss about venture mask and i'm not going to discuss about cpap because these two things are currently replaced predominantly by this device called high flow humidified uh, nasal cannula oxygen therapy a heated high flow humidified nasal cannula oxygen therapy so uh, this is uh, just a diagram which is representing how the uh, interface looks like how the original machine looks like uh, when a patient is attached with this how the patient looks like so uh, this is the machine which is currently predominantly used and it has an oxygen input and this is called ervo2 system it has a temperature and flow control and there is a delivered fao2 display and there is a interface uh, this is kind of a niv interface like this is a non invasive respiratory support interface which delivers a smooth oxygen therapy with a high flow to the index patient so this is a very important dial uh, there uh, you can see three parameters one is the temperature which can be set by us and uh, which is this is the flow rate what we say as hfnc flow rate this can be set by us and this is the fao2 this is a display parameter this is not a set parameter what happens is there is a oxygen input inlet uh, to which we will just uh, using the flow meter increase or titrate the oxygen flow to get uh, whatever um, aimed uh, oxygen flow is here so for our fao2 here for example if you want to 40% fao2 you have to start increasing the flow rate to an extent the display shows 40 percentage so there is no a dial uh, uh, or a switch which can uh, uh, help you to fix the fao2 this is only by oxygen titration oxygen flow titration we are going to fix the uh, fao2 in this equipment so the next most important uh, in this equipment is this color coded interface this is very important um, uh, this is a basically a high comfort high flow therapy so the high comfort is a very very important uh, uh, component uh, reason uh, and major reason for the huge success of this therapy so this uh, high success rate and acceptance by the index patient is based on uh, the comfort of the nasal cannula fit that is uh, uh, pro directly proportional to um, what is the correct size you choose so there is a, a weight based color coding uh, which you can uh, take it as a guide to select the appropriate size of interface for your index patient so you know, this is a very very important device after going through the available devices in toolbox we will directly go to the algorithmic approach so, so uh, there are only two things left uh, now to discuss one is the algorithmic approach and i will tell in a clinical application how we are approaching uh, applying this algorithm so a child with the hypoxemia and respiratory distress we i already told we can simply use the canadian triage assessment uh, level so this is the same table which i have shown before uh, there is a normal band which is a green band and the right side which is a tachypnea spectrum left side which is a bradypnea spectrum so based on this you identify the tachypnea and saturation can be measured and the work of breathing has to be uh, 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 estimated that is like an adjunctive measure which will help you to decide the respiratory support and you see whether there is a signs of poor perfusion if the signs of poor, poor perfusion exist then you have to see whether the non invasive isolated oxygen support alone is going to help the patient or not if you find that there are any of these not maintainable or they not improving perfusion or a hypotensive shock primary disease becomes a contraindication to niv initially you can start a high flow oxygen uh, using a non rebreathing mask but uh, soon enough you may need to decide intubate and invasive ventilation so if the patient is not following into abnormal perfusion pathway then you can start a oxygen therapy with a simple face mask and then you can uh, give a nebulization trial if needed in a patient it is completely based on the need and other apc stabilization measures as per the conventional approach so based on the improvement you can decide about the support escalation so the support escalation sometime may be immediate advanced airway or uh, something like a non invasive support of hfnc so if you decide to give high flow nasal cannula oxygen support this is a simple algorithm which we use currently so it has evolved over last 7 years quite a lot so uh, what we do now is uh, based on the indication checklist we decide whether hfnc is acceptable for that patient and then we start hfnc using uh, almost a 60 to 70 percentage of fao2 or lesser than that um, as per the patient's need and we can use the weight band banded flow rate this weight banded flow rate is currently reasonably well uh, well established previously there were multiple algorithms where you give 2 liters per kg and beyond 10.5 liter per kg and many things now this is a very very easy 
tabulated uh, uh, flow rate which can be uh, comfortably followed so once you initiate this you have to see the response response is you should be able to improve uh, reduce the fao2 maybe within 6 hours something less than 60 percentage if persistently the fao2 requirement is more than 65 or 70 percentage there is a probability you are just delaying the intubation need you are just not avoiding the intubation need in such cases there are recent reports saying that just by delaying the intubation by substituting the hfnc you may be um, ending up with a more adverse outcomes and mortality so you have to be very careful about reducing the fao2 within 6 hours so otherwise beyond uh, that based on the natural history and the disease response we will be doing the hfnc weaning so if the if you find at any point of time there is no response then you may end up in support escalation this is another important point the support escalation many units as per their protocol they keep other niv method beyond hfnc or they remove other niv methods beyond hfnc so that is completely based on your unit protocol and as well it is based on the disease also for example if it is a primary um, uh, severe acute asthma we may consider bifab preferable to the hfnc because hfnc is not a greatest modality there at the same time a bronchiolitis child already on hfnc the child is trying uh, almost to failing uh, they are trying a, a cpap or something else you know, maybe just a delaying rather better to intubate such children so with this we go to uh, the next two slides which is about clinical application i discuss about only one case so this yes is a two month old male child a uh, child had cough for two days respiratory distress for one day reduced activity and refusal to feed for one day received a syrup cefexim uh, two days on opd basis birth and antenatal history is normal so this is a very <laughs> familiar, uh, currently very familiar to most of you this is assessment pentagon so airway is maintainable and uh, uh, breathing is a uh, uh, high respiratory rate the child is tachypneic the child has wheeze head bobbing intermittent grunt auscultation bilateral air entry is okay saturation is 86% in room air the child is having uh, uh, tachycardia but other parameters are okay maintaining and exposure is okay the child is not febrile at present and gcs the child is quite irritable and uh, the final physiological categorization is respiratory distress hemodynamically stable but the, the rest of the child is having tachycardia emergency measures the child has been started on simple flow nasal cannula at 2 liters per minute nebulization with epinephrine and salbutamol in er and then uh, the child has been started on iv fluids and the first blood uh, blood reports have come this is showing a lactate of 3.25 tlc of 8620 crp is negative so with this uh, we, uh, we go to uh, further approach of this child uh, uh, through the protocol or algorithm what we have uh, shown you so uh, if we plot this child into the algorithm child is having a tachypnea the child is having uh, the th two months old child having Uh, around the 70 74 heart rate uh, respiratory rate so saturation is less than 94% as you, as it has been sold in the pentagon it was 88% the child is having increased workup breathing signs of poor perfusion that is tachycardia but not hypotensive cft is also maintained so in this case we are going to start with a simple uh, support either uh, face mask or uh, uh, preferably face mask because we have to try nebulization therapy in this child based on the primary disease of uh, bronchiolitis suspicion so the trial nebulization of adrenaline has been given and uh, other measures and the intravenous cannulation everything started so uh, in this uh, so uh, we are uh, over the time we are observing the child and if the child uh, um, improves then we can continue only the simple flow support otherwise we will be proceed to high flow or cpap as per the expertise what we have done in this child we'll go to this slide this child is show, uh, showing a hyperinflated uh, uh, chest x ray a bilateral lung fields are hyperinflated and some atelectatic areas as well the child had a, a significant respiratory distress i am not going into the um, video now so we'll go to the next slide uh, so <clears throat> what happens over time to this child is the child has been started on iv antibiotic uh, respiratory distress was persistent child has been started on high flow nasal cannula oxygen as we have shown in the band this child is a 5 kg child started on 10 liters per minute and 45% fao2 um now this child was quite irritable so we have used some dexmedetomidin uh, sedation and over the time the child's respiratory distress didn't improve greatly for initial 72 hours so uh, in between the child has required some max self doses as well so 
in, in this case, um, so far, the, how we decided the high flow is. So uh, yeah, if you look at uh, this uh, FIO2, we started at 50, uh, 50 percentage and then we came down to 45 percentage. And the bandwidth, as I have already told, the same um, uh, 5 kg, uh, 10 liters per minute as per the table we have used. And uh, I, as you all know very well, high flow is an excellent support therapy in bronchiolitis. So there are many mechanisms to it. And uh, what happened to this child is over the time, uh, this child has improved, but the child has improved very slowly. So the child uh, required at least uh, five to six days of uh, high flow support. And there was a respiratory distress uh, for initial five days, quite significant. And then the respiratory distress started settling and the episodes of bronchospasm have been reduced. And uh, because of the longer duration, more than five days of HFNC requirement, we switched to a, a simple flow support and waited for 48 hours. And then we have weaned off the child to room yet. So uh, this is the way the child improved. And uh, uh, this is my last slide. So I just complete with uh, this take home message. So this is a quite important uh, uh, thing to understand. Um, uh, the identifying the primary cause of respiratory distress is very, very important. Many times in ER, uh, the major miss happens is we may not be able to classify whether it's a primary respiratory cause, cardiac cause, um, uh, especially in case of smaller infants. So that has to be avoided. Uh, that can be avoided if you use a systematic approach. Identify what is the primary pulmonary focus. This is also equally important. And understand the concept of mixed lung disease and evolving lung disease and dynamicity of lung disease. At the beginning, it can be a small airway disease, but over the time, because of multiple atelectasis, bronchiolitis may become a lung parenchymal disease. Continuously assess and reassess the disease dynamics and uh, because the disease dynamics can be very progressive. Okay, at some point of time, some respiratory support may be extremely appropriate and your decision was always right. But after some time that may not be adequate and you may need to escalate the support. If any concomitant illness, try to address that in, uh, also simultaneously. Use an objective scale, whichever you are comfortable, either the emergency triage assessment scale or CETA scale, which I have shown, or whatever scale view people are comfortable at your unit. So use some objective scale uh, to trigger the respiratory support in ER. This is a kind of uh, improving the uniformity of practice. Always decide best respiratory support for the index child based on the expertise and available equipments. Never delay the intubation by using NIV. This is very, very important point. Never uh, delay intubation by using NIV. The, uh, the importance of NIV is avoiding intubation. It is not to delaying the intubation. Delaying intubation means your post-intubation outcome is going to be worse. Follow a systematic approach to decide appropriate respiratory support. Continuous monitoring is always the key for success. Thank you. Thank you, Sushi, sir, for that uh, elaborate presentation on non-invasive respiratory support therapy, especially focused on that and, uh, of course, assessment of uh, respiratory distress in various pathologies. That was a very lucid and elaborate uh, uh, talk. Uh, talk. Uh, now, probably Dr. Tangabelu, sir, uh, I think we come to the end of this module one. So, Dr. Tangabelu, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, see, one last question. <clears throat> Your all the slides were very wonderful and very interesting. And slide on classifying respiratory failure into two phases, early phase and late phase, um, using PAO2 and PCO2. Instead, in a lower cell setting, can we use SPO2 and uh, level of consciousness? Because level of consciousness to some extent reflects PCO2. Yeah. And yes, SPO2 sir. can replace PAO2. Yes, sir. That means yes, a sir. child with all the level of consciousness yes. definitely may end up in intubation rather than in AV. Yeah, so uh, that, uh, that is very true, sir. Actually, I, I completely agree. So uh, level of consciousness, SPO2, SPO2, respiratory rate. So uh, respiratory rate, uh, reducing or normalizing side. So uh, level of consciousness, uh, respiratory uh, distress, which is reducing or normalizing side uh, with uh, lowering SPO2 may uh, indicate that this is a late phase of respiratory. Late. So that can be very useful. Very useful.
finally we have come to an interesting session finally we have interesting one suggestion to rajendran probably we could have classified as two day program i think la saturday sunday would have been very good because all these lectures need very good attention every lecture the viewer has to concentrate we were attentive you and i was attentive at this probably Even at this stage, I was attentive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. I, I think I'll uh, definitely. Yeah, we have done five hours. Five hours, you know. And uh, it was. It was in a set of points, sir. Uh, I mean, sir is uh, attending this stage you now. Uh, I think definitely uh, everybody should have concentration. <laughs> yeah, because I am retired and I am no, I am not treating anybody. If I am interested, I am sure people are treating will be more interested and they will be listening much more intently. Yeah, yeah. And all the talks were very good. Excellent uh, selection of speakers and very good. Thank you for the comment. Ah, uh, so so so. Like any uh, comments, sir? From uh, comments, sir? From uh, okay. Uh, thank you. And uh, I uh, invite uh, Dr. Kanta uh, Sasidharan uh, as a convener. I want to. Do some comments, final comments. Um, sir, uh, actually, uh, we we were very happy that we were able to have, uh, comfortably conduct the program successfully. First of all, um, all for the platform, um, for the platform, uh, uh, as well for simultaneously uh, sharing the session in YouTube. Because uh, initially there were more than hundred attendees, so um, there were few messages that we were not able to log in, and it was initially addressed immediately. So we are very much thankful to Tamil Nadu State Chapter IAP. And ah, um, uh, Sasi, then actually, so many viewers in the YouTube also. It's not yeah. only hundred, only accommodate in the uh, yeah. Zoom. Zoom link. Yes, yeah. sir. So, uh, I, and uh, I, it was an uh, uh, basically the idea was conceived by user, the Rajendran sir. and as well the tamil nadu state chapter and um, it was completely guided and uh, at a, a almost like every place it was um, uh, designed by uh, thangavelu sir so big thanks to thangavelu sir for guiding us to deliver this uh, successful uh, uh, pediatric emergency module number 1 um, and uh, we uh, assure to tnsc chapter that we will work further on this uh, lectures and and we will create this as a um, very uh, clear cut ex, uh, module and we will um, uh, we will surely um, submit this for um, uh, iap central chapter to uh, take it further as a pediatric emergency module uh, thank you very much sir thank you uh, dr mullai balaji as a convener i want to uh, some input from you uh, sir thank thanks a lot uh, mainly to dr rajendran sir dr uh, Uh, chendul sir ismail sir tirumurugan sir uh, for guiding us and supporting us of course big thanks to Thang thangavelu sir my mentor and teacher and of course uh, dr uh, sasidharan sir for uh, putting the uh, program in place like including the selection of topics because the main idea was as uh, already said by most seniors is to help the pediatricians and uh, help whatever is helpful in their office practice of course i do agree that certain advanced concepts or intensive care related topics would be touched inadvertently uh, those things could be fine tuned uh, thank you a lot for the uh, wonderful opportunity sir it was a pleasure to listen from seniors uh, different people with a different perspectives it was actually a great learning experience thank you so much thank you yeah thank you sir thank you sir was just raising his speaker sorry sir dr subramanian sir yeah uh, am i audible yeah sir yes, sorry sir, sir. first uh, let me congratulate uh, iap tamil nadu for organizing this uh, important uh, program my congratulation to all the speakers each and every topic is very important uh, practical only thing for almost 6 hours ideally is uh, to be divided into two halves then only everybody can concentrate particularly last topic half of the people are gone the very very important topic i think we have to repeat some more else so once again i thank congratulations particularly to everyone particularly to dr thangu hello and sachi thank you thank you sir yeah, uh, finally i, uh, sir, I have uh, one uh, comment yeah sir i have one comment as uh, professor thangu hello and professor ls have told i feel that if it is two day program 
uh, some of the speakers had to rush through so those things also were very interesting so i think in future if possible we can have two days also yeah but before seeing us and sir i just make my own comments the whole module is fresh because of the youth team the average age is around 35 only me and indumadi raised the dh so that is a big that reason a... for the freshness of the, the freshness of the presentation slides sir you you both have raised the quality also uh, entirely was uh, different thank you for that thank for including us so that we also learned along with you <laughs> thanks a lot thanks for the opportunity it is important for success of a film similarly directors are very important <laughs> thank you sir and uh, uh, actually i mainly want to thank um, four persons so nice uh, dr tangwel sir i think he is uh, so youth i can't take it so uh, yeah. older i think so <clears throat> i think he is having a uh, whatsapp group na he is uh, even each and everything he has uh, fine tuning i think uh, really hats up to you sir and uh, i think your your uh, teacher of teachers i think uh, really you are happy and i uh, this age group na i think he is uh, doing uh, very well i am really uh, appreciate from uh, aptnc uh, thank you sir and i thank uh, dr sasidharan uh, and uh, dr mulai balaji so they coordinated very well past one month and uh, i thank all the speakers uh, i uh, everybody has done that excellent uh, presentation all our uh, wonderful speakers and uh, even uh, international level they are uh, presenting and i next one is i thank uh, our um, tirumurugan uh, who has coordinated for the flyer as well as um, for um, uh, youtube as well as uh, and uh, zoom meeting and uh, i think as, um, as uh, say seniors uh, they suggested today's program but one thing is every month we are having uh, we are told months we are planning a toll program uh, every month only we are having that cme program every month only we are having we are going to upload it in the um, uh, tamil nadu tnc youtube whenever you necessary you can go and uh, have it that's you can uh, re review and you can watch it also and um, i think uh, we can have uh, we can reduce one or two topics for future i think we have to suppose go to by your clock and give more of a discussion part we can plan i think uh, dr i think at this point i wanted to uh, ask dr tangwel sir what's your opinion sir uh, still i because you are conducting once in a month yeah and these topics are going to be permanent topics okay okay so i think it is two days because any session lasting more than 3 hours except uh, professor sinivasan sir lsr with a very fresh minds okay and many of them may not be again we have to rush up the many many of the slides many of the in fact uh, vidhi williams has cut down his slides i think we Sassi have to... also has cut down some slides yeah. so we can make it as anything exceeding 4 5 hours you should be 3 2 3 days program giving enough time for the feedback and discussions Is, uh, as i said uh, i think we can keep it at two modules i think that's why yes, that, uh, aim is yeah. uh, module 1 we have uh, created and um, that means module 2 will be there like uh, cinema no uh, part 1 part 2 <laughs> 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 we are waiting bagubali 1 bagubali 2 <laughs> bagubali 2 mari i think we have given uh, module 1 that's why we have put a module 1 i think module 2 i think we will plan exactly what you have said sir i think um, i think we will um, uh, the feedback point is well taken sir i think um, i think future we will uh, take it uh, i think um, definitely we'll take to this um, national level sir this module yeah, we, we can definitely take yeah. it to we yeah. can discuss no, in the you're like joking i was not serious about uh, two days <laughs> just to your suggestion but i am just joking Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, thank, you, thank you all the uh, IAPTNC uh, office parents as well as um, all the speakers. I uh, individually I want to tell, but it's now uh, crossing nine part five. I think uh, so. I want to thank each and everybody. We will have part two. We will meet uh, shortly. <laughs> but that's uh, module two. We will meet. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Th